we've compiled here almost every letter or encyclical concerning secret societies issued by the popes, starting with Anum Ingressi in 1738 by Pope Clement XII. Um, this letter, which ascribes a penalty of excommunication on anyone who joins, supports, harbors, or even encourages members of secret societies. These excommunications can only be lifted by the Pope at the time, except at the hour of death. This may have been mitigated uh, to a lesser penalty at a later date. Then we continue through a number of documents that reaffirm the letter through Pius IX in the middle of the 19th century to the very last papal documents on the subject in the first years of the 20th century. The last six documents are written by Pope Leo XIII. You can navigate the documents that span more than eight hours with in-video navigation or timestamps in the description. I'd like to conjecture that the documents support the conclusion made in the last video that Heaven has been warning us for more than a hundred years that we need to cut ourselves off from media and association in the present times. And moreover, we need to um, remove from our lives all forms of communication from the broader culture, including TV, Internet, phone use, movies, politics, news, or any other secular um, sub-societies or associations which we belong to. We need to be very judicious in the way that we navigate the technological and social landscape in this current generation. In Eminenti, Papal Bull Dealing with the Condemnation of Freemasonry Pope Clement XII, 1738 Clement, Bishop, Servant of the Servants of God to all the faithful, salutation, and apostolic benediction. Since the divine clemency has placed us, whose merits are not equal to the task, in the high watchtower of the apostolate with the duty of pastoral care confided to us, we have turned our attention, as far as it has been granted us from on high, with unceasing care to those things through which the integrity of orthodox religion is kept from errors and vices by preventing their entry, and by which the dangers of disturbance in the most troubled times are repelled from the whole Catholic world. Now it has come to our ears, and common gossip has made clear that certain societies, companies, assemblies, meetings, congregations or conventicles called in the popular tongue libri muratori or franks masons or by other names according to the various languages, are spreading far and wide and daily growing in strength, and men of any religion or sect, satisfied with the appearance of natural probity, are joined together, according to their laws and the statutes laid down for them by a strict and unbreakable bond which obliges them, both by an oath upon the Holy Bible and by a host of grievous punishment, to an inviolable silence about all that they do in secret together. But it is in the nature of crime to betray itself and to show itself by its attendant clamor. Thus these aforesaid societies or conventicles have caused in the minds of the faithful the greatest suspicion, and all prudent. And upright men have passed the same judgment on them as being depraved and perverted. For if they were not doing evil, they would not have so great a hatred of the light. Indeed, this rumor has grown to such proportions that in several countries these societies have been forbidden by the civil authorities as being against the public security, and for some time past have appeared to be prudently eliminated. Therefore, Bearing in mind the great harm which is often caused by such societies or conventicles not only to the peace of the temporal state but also to the well-being of souls, and realizing that they do not hold by either civil or canonical sanctions. And since we are taught by the divine word that it is the part of faithful servant and of the master of the Lord's household to watch day and night lest such men as these break into the household like thieves and like foxes seek to destroy the vineyard, in fact, to prevent the hearts of the simple being perverted, and the innocent secretly wounded by their arrows, and to block that broad road which could be opened to the uncorrected commission of sin and for the other just and reasonable motives known to us. We therefore, having taken counsel of some of our venerable brothers among the cardinals of the Holy Roman Church, and also of our own, accord and with certain knowledge and mature deliberations, with the plenitude of the 
apostolic power do hereby determine and have decreed that these same societies, companies, assemblies, meetings, congregations, or conventicles of Liberi Muratori or Franks Masons, or whatever other name they may go by, are to be condemned and prohibited, and by our present constitution, valid forever, we do condemn and prohibit them. Wherefore we command most strictly and in virtue of holy obedience, all the faithful of whatever state, grade, condition, order, dignity or preeminence, whether clerical or lay, secular or regular, even those who are entitled to specific and individual mention, that none, under any pretext or for any reason, shall dare or presume to enter, propagate or support these aforesaid societies of Liberi Muratori or Franks Masons, or however else they are called, or to receive them in their houses or dwellings or to hide them, be enrolled among them, join to them, be present with them, give power or permission for them to meet elsewhere, to help them in any way, to give them in any way advice, encouragement or support either openly or in secret, directly or indirectly, on their own or through others, nor are they to urge others or tell them, incite or persuade them to be enrolled in such societies or to be counted among their number, or to be present or to assist them in any way, but they must stay completely clear of such societies, companies, assemblies, meetings, congregations or conventicles, under pain of excommunication for all the above-mentioned people, which is incurred by the very deed without any declaration being required, and from which no one can obtain the benefit of absolution, other than at the hour of death, except through ourselves or the Roman pontiff of the time. Moreover, we desire and command that both bishops and prelates, and other local ordinaries, as well as inquisitors for heresy, shall investigate and proceed against transgressors of whatever state, grade, condition, order dignity or preeminence they may be, and they are to pursue and punish them with condign penalties as being most suspect of heresy. To each and all of these we give and grant the free faculty of calling upon the aid of the secular arm, should the need arise, for investigating and proceeding against those same transgressors and for pursuing and punishing them with condign penalties. Given at Rome, at St. Mary Mayer, in the year 1738 of our Lord. On Freemasonry. Benedict the Fourteenth. We judge it necessary, with a new intervention of our authority, to support and confirm as just and serious reasons require it the provident laws and sanctions of the Roman pontiffs our predecessors, not only those laws and those sanctions whose force or for the process of time were due to the carelessness of men, we fear they could slow down or become extinct, but also those that have recently gained strength and full vigor. 1. In fact Clement XII, our predecessor of happy memory, with his own apostolic letter of 28th April of the year of the Incarnation of the Lord 1738, eighth year of his pontificate letter addressed to all the faithful and which begins in eminent condemnation for always and prohibits certain societies, unions, meetings, meetings, conventicles or aggregations commonly called Freemasons or de Franks Macons, or otherwise called, already widespread in certain countries and which are now increasingly increasing. He forbids all and individual Christians, under penalty of excommunication to be incurred ipso facto without any declaration, from which no one could be absolved by any one other than the Roman pontiff pro tempore, except at the point of death, from attempting or daring to enter into such societies, propagate them or lend them favor or shelter, hide them, subscribe to them, join or intervene in them, and more as is contained in the same letter more widely and more extensively. Here is the text. 2. Clement Bishop, Servant of the Servants of God. To all the faithful, greetings and apostolic blessing. Placed by the will of divine clemency, although unworthy, in the eminent seat of the apostolate, in order to fulfill the debt of pastoral providence entrusted to us, with assiduous diligence and concern, as much as is granted to us by heaven, we have turned our thoughts to those things to which having closed the door to errors and vices the integrity of the orthodox religion is mainly preserved. 
and in these very difficult times the dangers of disorder are removed from the entire Catholic world. Already due to the same public fame, it is known to us that some societies, unions, meetings, assemblies, conventicles or aggregations commonly called Freemasons or de Franks Macons, or with other names, extend in every direction, and are strengthened day by day. Called according to the variety of languages, in which with close and secret alliance, according to their laws and statutes, men of any religion and sect unite among themselves, content with a certain affected appearance of natural honesty. Such societies, with a strict oath taken on the holy scriptures, and with exaggeration of serious penalties, are obliged to maintain an inviolable silence regarding the things they carry out secretly. But since the nature of the crime is to manifest itself and generate the noise that denounces it, it follows that the aforementioned societies or conventicles have produced such suspicion in the minds of the faithful, according to which for honest and prudent men to enroll in those aggregations it is the same as being stained with the infamy of wickedness and perversion, if they did not act iniquitely. They would not hate the light so decidedly. This fame has grown so considerably that the said societies have already been proscribed by secular princes in many countries as enemies of the kingdoms, and have been providently eliminated. We therefore, meditating on the very serious damage that such societies or conventicles mostly cause not only to the tranquility of the temporal republic, but also to the spiritual health of souls, as they do not agree in any way with either the civil laws or the canonical laws taught by the divine words to be vigilant day and night, as a faithful and prudent servant in charge of the family of the Lord, so that this race of men does not plunder the house like thieves, nor ruin the vineyard like foxes, that is, so that it does not corrupt the hearts of the simple nor secretly wound the innocent, with the aim of closing the road which, if opened, could allow crimes with impunity, for other just and rational reasons known to us, with the advice of some of our Venerable brother cardinals of the Holy Roman Church, and again motu proprio, with certain knowledge, mature deliberation and with the fullness of our apostolic power, we decree that it is necessary to condemn and prohibit, as with the present our constitution, to be valid in perpetuity, we condemn and prohibit the aforementioned societies, unions, meetings, assemblies, aggregations or conventicles of Freemasons or de Franks Macons, or by any other name called. Therefore, sternly, and by virtue of holy obedience, we command all an individual faithful of any state, degree, condition, order, dignity or preeminence, whether lay or cleric, whether secular or regular, even if worthy of special and individual mention and summons, that no one dares or presumes under any pretext or appearance to establish, propagate or favor the aforementioned societies of Freemasons or de Franks Macons or otherwise denominated, to host and hide them in their homes or elsewhere, to register and join them, to provide them with the means, faculty or possibility of meeting in some place, to give them something or even to provide advice, help or favor in any way, openly or secretly, directly or indirectly, on their own behalf or on behalf of others, as well as to exhort, induce, provoke or persuade others to sign up or take part in similar company or in any way to benefit and favor the same. Indeed, everyone must absolutely abstain from the said societies, unions, meetings, assemblies, aggregations or conventicles, under penalty of excommunication for all offenders, as above, to be incurred ipso facto, and without any declaration, from which no one can be absolved, if not at the point of death, by others other than the Roman pontiff pro tempore. We also want and command that both the bishops, the superior prelates and the other ordinaries of the places, as well as the inquisitors of heretical wickedness appointed in any place, proceed and carry out inquisitions against transgressors of any status, degree, condition, order, dignity, or preeminence, and that they repress and punish the same with the same penalties with which they punish suspects of heresy. Therefore we grant and attribute free faculty to them, and to each of them, to proceed and inquire against the aforementioned transgressors, and to imprison them and punish them with due penalties, also invoking, if necessary, the help of the secular arm. We then want the copies of this letter, 
even if printed, signed by the hand of some public notary and bearing the seal of a person constituted in ecclesiastical dignity, to be given the same faith that would be given to the letter if it were exhibited or shown in the original. Therefore, absolutely no one is allowed to violate, or with reckless audacity contradict this page of our declaration, condemnation, commandment, prohibition and interdiction. If anyone dares so much, let him know that he will incur the wrath of Almighty God and the holy apostles Peter and Paul. 3. But since, as far as we have been told, some have had no difficulty in affirming and disseminating publicly that the said penalty of excommunication imposed by our predecessor is no longer effective because the relevant constitution has not then been confirmed by us, almost as if the explicit confirmation of the successor is necessary for the apostolic constitutions to maintain validity. 4. And having been suggested to us, by some pious and God-fearing people, that it would be very useful to eliminate all the subterfuges of the slanderers and declare the uniformity of our soul with the intention and will of the predecessor himself, adding to its constitution the new vote of our confirmation. 5. We certainly, until now, when we have kindly granted absolution from the incurred excommunication, often before and mainly in the past year of the Jubilee, to many faithful truly repentant and saddened by having transgressed the laws of the Constitution itself and who heartily assured to distance themselves completely from such societies and conventicles, and that in the future they would never return to them. Or when we granted the penitentiaries delegated by us the faculty of imparting absolution in our name and with our authority to those who had recourse to the penitentiaries themselves, and when with prompt vigilance we did not fail to ensure that the competent judges and tribunals proceeded in proportion to the crime committed against the violators of the Constitution itself, which was actually carried out several times. We have certainly provided arguments that are not only probable but completely evident and indubitable through which the dispositions of our soul and the firm and deliberate will consenting to the censorship imposed by the aforementioned Clement predecessor should have been Understood. If a contrary opinion were to spread around us, we could certainly despise it and submit our cause to the just judgment of Almighty God, pronouncing those words that were once recited during sacred functions. Grant, O Lord, we pray to you, that we do not care for the slanders of perverse souls, but having trampled on perversity itself, we beg that you do not allow us to be afflicted by unjust slander or entangled by cunning flattery, but rather that we love what you command. Thus reports an ancient missal attributed to St. Gelasius, our predecessor, and that the venerable servant of God Cardinal Giuseppe Maria Thomasi included it in the Mass entitled Against Slanderers. 6. However, so that it could not be said that we had imprudently omitted something, in order to easily eliminate the pretext for lying slander and shut their mouths, having first heard the advice of some of our venerable brother cardinals of the Holy Roman Church, we have decreed to confirm the same constitution of our predecessor, word for word, as reported above in specific form, which is considered as the most extensive and effective of all, we confirm, validate, renew and desire, and decree that it has perpetual force and effectiveness according to our certain knowledge, in the fullness of our apostolic authority, according to the tenor of the same constitution, in all respects, as if it had been promulgated with our motu proprio and with our authority, and was first published by us. 7. In truth, among the very serious reasons for the aforementioned prohibitions and condemnations set out in the above-mentioned constitution there is one, by virtue of which men of any religion and sect can join together in such societies and conventicles. It is clear what damage can be done to the purity of the Catholic religion. The second reason is the strict and impenetrable promise of secrecy, by virtue of which what is done in these meetings is hidden, to which the sentence that Cecilio Natale, near Minutius Felis, adduced in a very different case can rightly be applied. The honest things always love the public light. Wickedness is secret. The third reason is the oath with which they undertake to inviolably observe said secret, almost as if it is permissible for someone questioned by a legitimate power, with the excuse of some promise or oath to avoid the obligation to confess everything that is sought, to find out if anything is done in such conventicles contrary to the stability, 
and laws of religion and the republic. The fourth reason is that these societies oppose civil sanctions no less than canonical sanctions, taking into account, in fact, that under civil law all colleges and meetings formed without public authority are prohibited, as we read in the Pandex, Book 47, Tit. 22, De Collegis et Corporae Basilicitis. And in the famous letter, N. 97 of Book 10 of C. Pliny Cicilius, who reports that it was prohibited by his edict, according to the emperor's commandment, which the Edri were held, that is, that societies and meetings could exist and meet without the authorization of the prince. The fifth reason is that in many countries the aforementioned companies and aggregations have already been proscribed and banned by laws of the secular principles. Finally, the last reason is that among prudent and honest men the aforementioned societies and aggregations were blamed. In their opinion any one who joined them incurred the charge of depravity and perversion. 8. Finally, the same predecessor in the above-mentioned constitution exhorts the bishops, the superior prelates, and the other ordinaries of the places not to neglect to invoke the help of the secular arm if necessary for the execution of this provision. 9. All these things, even individually, are not only approved and confirmed by us, but also recommended and enjoined to ecclesiastical superiors, but we ourselves, out of debt of apostolic solicitude, with this present letter invoke and with deep affection seek the aid and help of the Catholic princes and the secular powers the same supreme princes and powers being elected by God as defenders of the faith and protectors of the church so that it is their responsibility to work in the most effective way so that the apostolic constitutions are given due respect and the most absolute obedience. The fathers of the Council of Trent brought this to their memory, Session 25, Chapter 20 and much earlier the Emperor Charlemagne had declared it admirably in his chapters, Title I, Chapter Two, in which, after having commanded all his subjects to observe the ecclesiastical sanctions, he added these words, In no way can we know how those who show themselves unfaithful to God and disobedient to his priests can be faithful to us. Consequently he imposed on all the presidents and ministers of his provinces that they oblige each and every individual to pay due obedience to the laws of the church. Furthermore, I impose very serious penalties against those who neglect to do this, adding among other things, those who in these matters, which does not happen, are found negligent and transgressors, should know that they will not retain the honors in our empire, even if they are ours. Children, nor will they have a place in the palace, nor with us nor with our faithful will they have society or community, but rather they will pay the penalty in anguish and hardship. 10. We then want the copies of this letter, even if printed, signed by the hand of some public notary and bearing the seal of a person constituted in ecclesiastical dignity, to be given the same faith that would be given to the letter if it were exhibited or shown in the original. 11. Therefore, absolutely no one is allowed to violate, or with reckless audacity contradict this page of our confirmation, innovation, approval, commandment, invocation, request, decree, and will. If anyone dares so much, he should know that he will incur the disdain of Almighty God and the holy apostles Peter and Paul. Given in Rome, at Santa Maria Maggiore, on March 18th of the year of the Incarnation of the Lord 1751, the eleventh year of our pontificate. Ecclesia a Jesu Christo Pope Pius VII, 1821 The Church founded by Jesus Christ our Savior upon a firm rock, and against which Christ himself has promised that the gates of hell will never prevail, has been so often assaulted, and by such dreadful enemies, that unless that divine and unchangeable promise had intervened, it might seem that it must be feared that the church itself, besieged be it by their power, their crafts, or their cunning, might entirely perish. But that which has happened in previous times, such also has been done and especially in this certainly sorrowful time of ours, which seems to be that end time foretold by the apostles so long ago, during which time, Jude v. 18. Mockers will come walking according to their own desires and ungodliness. 
For it is not concealed from anyone how great the multitude of wicked men will have joined together in these most difficult times against the Lord and against his anointed one, who are especially solicitous, once the faithful have been ensnared by philosophy and vain deceit, called to colonate, and torn away from the doctrine of the church, for weakening and overturning the same church, although by a useless effort. But in order to succeed more easily, the greater number of them have formed secret groups and clandestine sects, from which they were hoping that they might induce many into the fellowship of their conspiracy and crime. A long time ago this holy see, once these sects had been discovered, cried with a great and unbridled voice against them, and exposed their plans, which had been devised secretly by them against religion, indeed against civil society. Long ago it called forth the attentiveness of all, that they might beware lest it be allowed to these sects to attempt that which they were heinously contemplating. Indeed it must have grieved these endeavors of the Holy See not to have answered that destruction, which it was observing, and that wicked men had not desisted from their acknowledged plan, whence they at long last attained to those evils which we ourselves have perceived. Indeed, men whose arrogance has always mounted, have dared to begin new secret societies. Mention must be made in this place of a society, recently born and propagated far and wide in Italy and in other regions, which although it has been divided into several sects, and according to their variety it sometimes assumes names among themselves different and distinct, nevertheless because the entity is a communion of opinions and crimes, and because a certain pact has been entered into, is one, and is generally accustomed to go under the name of the Carbonari. Indeed, they simulate a singular respect and a certain extraordinary zeal toward the Catholic religion and toward the person and doctrine of Jesus Christ our Savior, whom at times they also impiously dare to call the rector and great teacher of this society. But these ways of speaking, which are seen to be more slippery than oil, are nothing other than darts employed by crafty men, who come in sheep's clothing but are ravenous wolves inside, for more securely wounding the too little cautious. Surely that most severe oath, by which, imitating for the most part the ancient Priscillianists, they promised that they at no time ever, or in no case, either are going to expose to men not enrolled in the society anything which regards the society, or are going to share with those who are in the lower degrees anything which pertains to the higher degrees. In addition, those clandestine and furthermore illegitimate assemblies, which they have, after the manner employed by many heretics, and the selection of men of whatever religion and sect into their society, even if other things were not available, sufficiently convinced that it is necessary to have no confidence in their related discourses. But it is not necessary by conjectures and indications that it be judged such concerning their sayings, as it was pointed out above. Books published by these very types in which the procedure is described, which is accustomed to be used in the meetings, especially of the higher degrees, their catechisms, statutes, and other authentic and credible documents, and in fact the testimony of those who, when they had abandoned that society to which they had previously adhered, revealed its errors and frauds to legitimate judges, have declared openly, that the Carbonari particularly incline in such a way that they give to each, one great license for devising by his own genius and from his own ideas for himself a religion which he may practice. Once indifference to religion has been introduced, than which hardly anything more destructive can be contrived, such that they profane and defile the passion of Jesus. Christ by certain of their impious ceremonies, that they despise the sacraments of the church for, which they seem to substitute other new things invented by themselves through their supreme wickedness, and despise the very mysteries of the Catholic religion, and that they overthrow this apostolic see against which, because on it the sovereignty of the apostolic chair has always flourished, s. August. Epist 43. They are roused by a certain unparalleled hate, and they devise every dangerous destructive plot. And the precepts concerning morals, which the society of the Carbonari hand on, are not, as it is certain from their monuments, less wicked, although it boasts confidently that it demands from its own followers, that they cultivate and exercise charity and every kind of virtue, and abstain from every vice. Therefore, 
it promotes sensual pleasure most shamelessly it teaches that it is licit to kill those who have not kept the trust offered concerning the secret which was mentioned above and although peter the prince of the apostles decrees that christians first peter 2 verse 13 be subject to every human creature on account of god whether to the king as preeminent whether to the magistrates as ambassadors to them etc and although paul the apostle titus 3 verse 1 commands that every soul be subject to higher powers nevertheless that society teaches that it is allowed once revolts have been provoked to deprive of their power kings and other rulers whom most unjustly it dares indiscriminately to call tyrants these and other dogmas and precepts of this society are the ones from which those crimes newly committed by the carbonari have emerged which have brought such intense grief to honest and pious men we therefore who have been constituted as the guardian of the house of israel which is holy church and who in accord with our pastoral office ought to beware lest the lord's flock divinely entrusted to us suffer any harm consider in a case so serious that we cannot abstain from repressing the filthy undertakings of men we are also moved by the example of clement the twelfth and benedict the fourteenth our predecessors of happy memory of whom the one on the twenty-eighth day of April of the year 1738 by the Constitution in Eminenti, the other on the eighteenth day of March 1751 by the Constitution Providas, have condemned and proscribed the society's delibri muratori, or Franksmakens, or called by whatever other name according to the variety of regions and idioms, of which societies the society of the Carbonari must be considered. Perhaps the offspring or certainly the imitation. And although we have already gravely prohibited this society with two edicts published through our Secretary of State, nevertheless, following our above-mentioned predecessors, we think that severe penalties must be decreed with a formality indeed more solemnly against this society, especially since the Carbonari indiscriminately maintain that they are not included in those two constitutions of Clement the Twelfth and Benedict the Fourteenth, and that they are not subject to the judgments and penalties proposed in them. Therefore, now that the select congregation of our venerable brothers of the cardinals of the Holy Roman Church has been heard, indeed from its counsel, and also by our own motion and from our certain knowledge and mature deliberation, indeed from the fullness of our apostolic power, we have decreed and ordained that the society of the Carbonari mentioned above, or called by any other name whatever, its assemblies, meetings, gatherings, fellowships, or associations must be condemned and prohibited accordingly as we condemn and proscribe by our present constitution forever valid. Wherefore we order strictly and in virtue of holy obedience each and every faithful of Christ of whatever state, grade, condition, order, dignity and preeminence, be they the laity or clerics, both seculars and regulars and even those worthy of specific and individual mention, that any one under whatever pretext or special condition not dare or presume to join or propagate, to foster the society of the Carbonari mentioned above, or otherwise named, and to admit and hide in their dwellings, or their homes, or any other place, to be enrolled in, to adhere to or to take part in it, indeed whatever degree of it, or to give opportunity or convenience that it may be convened in any place, to furnish it with anything, or otherwise to offer counsel, aid or goodwill, openly or in secret, directly or indirectly, per se or through others in any way whatever. Likewise no one may dare or presume to exhort, induce, provoke, or persuade others to be inscribed in, be reckoned as part of or be among a society of this kind, or any degree of it, nor are they to help and thus support it in any way whatever. On the contrary they must absolutely abstain themselves from the same society and its assemblies, meetings, fellowships, or associations under pain of excommunication needing to be incurred ipso facto without any declaration by all those offending as above, from which no one is able to obtain the favor of absolution through any one except us, or the Roman pontiff reigning at that time, save one determined to be at the point of death. Furthermore we order all under the same pain of excommunication reserved to us and our successors, the Roman pontiffs, that they are held to declare to the bishops, or to others whom it pertains all those whom they know to have joined in this society, or to have defiled themselves by any one of the crimes mentioned above. 
Finally, that every danger of error may efficaciously be prevented, we condemn and we proscribe that all, as they call them, catechisms and books of the Carbonari, and we forbid, under the same pain of major excommunication reserved in the same way, every one of the faithful to read or to possess the books mentioned above, and we command that they hand over those materials, either to the ordinaries, or to others, to whom the right of receiving them pertains. We will, however, that absolutely the same faith which would be applied to the original letter, if they would be produced or shown, is to be applied to duplicates, likewise printed copies, of the present letter signed by the hand of some public notary, and secured by the seal of a person constituted in ecclesiastical dignity. It is allowed to no man to falsify this letter of our declaration, condemnation, mandate, prohibition and interdict, or to oppose it by a rash boldness. But if any one presumes to attempt this, let him know that he will incur the wrath of Almighty God and of his blessed apostles Peter and Paul. Given at Rome in St. Mary Major, in the 1821st year of the Incarnation of the Lord, on the 13th day of September, in the 22nd year of our pontificate. Quo Graviora On Secret Societies Pope Leo XII, 1826 For the Perpetual Remembrance of the Matter 1. Bless Peter, Prince of Apostles, and his successors have been given the power and care of feeding and ruling the flock of Christ, our God and Savior. Hence, the more grave the evils threatening the flock, the greater the solicitude the Roman pontiffs ought to employ in preventing them. For those who have been placed in the topmost watch tower of the church can discern from afar the artifices which the enemies of the Christian family undertake to destroy the church of Christ, which they will never achieve. They can point them out and expose them to the faithful, who may then guard against them. They can drive away and remove them by their authority. Our predecessors, the Roman pontiffs, understanding this most grievous duty imposed upon them, have unceasingly kept the watches of a good shepherd, and by exhortations, doctrines, decrees, and by their very life given for their sheep, have been solicitous about restraining and utterly abolishing the sex threatening the complete ruin of the church. Neither is the memory of this pontifical solicitude able to be drawn only from the age of ecclesiastical annals. What things have been carried out in our time and in the age of our fathers by the Roman pontiffs, how they oppose themselves to secret factions of men contriving maliciously against Christ, clearly demonstrate such. For when Clement XII, our predecessor, saw that the sect de libri muratori or de Franks Macons, or otherwise named, was increasing every day and that they were acquiring new strength, which he knew with certainty from many proofs to be not only suspect but even altogether inimical to the Catholic Church, condemned it with his magnificent constitution, beginning with an eminenti. Published on the 28th of April, 1738, the text of which is supplied. Bishop Clement, Servant of the Servants of God Health and Apostolic Benediction to All Christ's Faithful. 2. Stationed on the prominent watch tower, although with inferior merits, in the disposition of divine mercy, in accord with the duty of pastoral providence entrusted to us we direct with a continual zeal for solicitude, in so far as it is granted from on high, our attention to those things through which, once the access to errors and vices has been shut off, the integrity of orthodox religion may be principally preserved, and the dangers of disturbances may be driven off from the whole Catholic world in these most difficult times. To be sure, even as the very voice of the public testifies, it has become known to us that spreading far and wide and each day gaining strength are some societies, assemblies, meetings, gatherings, fellowships, or associations commonly called the Libri Muratori or Franks, Macons, or identified by whatever other designation according to the variety of idioms in which men of any religion and sect whatsoever, satisfied by a certain feigned appearance of natural honesty, are mutually united by a strict as well as impenetrable covenant according to the laws and statutes established by them, and which at the same time they both secretly dedicate themselves to by a strict oath administered on the sacred Bible, 
and which under the accumulation of severe penalties they are bound to conceal by an inviolable silence. But since such is the nature of a crime, that it betrays its very self, and emits a cry as a herald of itself, on this account the societies or associations mentioned above have impressed upon the minds of the faithful a powerful suspicion to such an extent that to enroll in these same fellowships is, before prudent and likewise approved men, absolutely the same as incurring the mark of depravity and perversion. For if they were not acting wickedly, they would never have such great hate for the light. Which voice has continually become more frequent, that in many regions the above-mentioned societies have appeared for a long time to be outlawed by the secular authorities as being in adverse to the security of the realms and providentially banned. Consequently, we, reflecting upon the most serious damages, which generally are inflicted not only on the tranquility of the temporal state, but also on the spiritual health of souls from societies and associations of this kind, and for this reason, at least, in order to be in harmony with both civil and canonical sanctions, we, as commander of the family of the Lord after the manner of the faithful and prudent servant, ought to teach with divine eloquence by day and night that a vigil must be kept lest the class of men of this type as thieves break into the house, and lest, in truth, like foxes strive to destroy the vineyard, they corrupt the hearts of the simple ones, and shoot the innocent ones with arrows in hidden ways in order to obstruct the broadest path which could possibly be open to accomplish with impunity their wickedness, and from other just and reasonable causes known to us, we have established and decreed that from the counsel of several of our brother cardinals of the Holy Roman Church, and especially by our own motion and from the fullness of apostolic power, those same societies, assemblies, meetings, gatherings, fellowships, or associations commonly called the Libri Muratori or Franks, Macons, or called by any other name whatever, must be condemned and prohibited, as by our present constitution, perpetually valid, we condemn and prohibit them. Wherefore, we admonish severely and in virtue of holy obedience each and every faithful of Jesus Christ, of any state, grade, condition, order, dignity, and preeminence whatever, be it laity or clerics, both secular and regular, likewise those worthy of specific and individual mention and expression, that any one under whatever pretext or special condition may not dare or presume to enter or to propagate, or foster, and thus to receive and hide them in their dwellings or homes or anywhere else, the aforementioned societies the Libri Muratori or Franks, Macons, or otherwise named, to be enrolled in, to adhere to, or to take part in them, or to give opportunity or convenience that may allow them to convene in any place, to furnish them with anything, or otherwise offer counsel, aid or goodwill, openly or secretly, directly or indirectly, per se or through others in any way whatever. Likewise no one may dare or presume to exhort, induce, provoke, or persuade others to be inscribed in, to be reckoned as part of or be among these societies of whatever kind or to help and support them in any way whatever. On the contrary, they are by all means obliged to abstain totally from those very societies, assembles, meetings, gatherings, fellowships, or associations under pain of excommunication to be incurred ipso facto without any declaration by all those offending as above, from which no one is able to obtain the favor of absolution except through us, or the Roman pontiff reigning at the particular time save one who has been determined to be at the point of death. Moreover, we ordain and mandate that as well the bishops and prelates, superiors and other ordinaries of places, as the inquisitors deputed for the places of heretical perversity wherever, proceed and search for grounds of accusation against transgressors, of whatever grade, state, condition, order, dignity, or preeminence they may be, and punish with fitting penalties and confine those strongly suspected of heresy. For we grant and impart to them, in general, and to each of them, unrestricted faculty of going out and searching for grounds against, and of restraining and punishing with suitable punishments, those same transgressors, once the aid of the secular arm also has been called upon for this purpose, if there should be need. On the other hand, we ordain, that absolutely the same faith which would be applied to the original letter, if they would be produced or shown, be applied to duplicates, 
likewise to printed copies, of the present letter signed by the hand of some public notary, and secured by the seal of a person constituted in ecclesiastical dignity. It is allowed to no man to falsify this letter of our declaration, condemnation, mandate, prohibition, and interdict, or to oppose it by a rash boldness. But if any one presumes to attempt this, let him know that he will incur the wrath of Almighty God and of his blessed apostles Peter and Paul. Given at Rome at St. Mary Major in the 1738th year of the Incarnation of the Lord on the 28th day of April, in the 8th year of our pontificate. 3. Nevertheless, these things were not enough for Benedict XIV, our predecessor of celebrated memory. For it had become spread abroad by the discussions of so many that the penalty of excommunication demanded in the letter of Clement, having died a short while ago, had already lost its strength, because Benedict had not clearly confirmed that letter. It was truly absurd to maintain that the laws of previous pontiffs become obsolete, if they are not confirmed expressly by one's successors, and furthermore, it was manifestly evident that the constitution of Clement had been considered as valid by Benedict. Nevertheless, Benedict has judged that this sophistry had to be torn away from the hands of sectarians by a new constitution which was published, the beginning of which was providus, on the 18th of March in the year 1751, by which Benedict confirmed the constitution with just as many words given to Informa Specifica, which is held as the strongest and most effective of all. In fact, the constitution of Benedict is as follows. Bishop Benedict, servant of the servants of God. 4. We reckon that the providential laws and sanctions of the Roman pontiffs, our predecessors, not only those whose force we fear can be weakened or extinguished either by a failing of the times or by the neglect of men, but also those which maintain their initial force and full strength, must be strengthened and confirmed by a new buttressing of our authority when just and weighty reasons demand it. Reasonably, our predecessor of happy memory, Pope Clement XII, by his apostolic letter in the 1738th year of the Incarnation of the Lord, on the 28th day of April, given in the 8th year of his pontificate, and written to all of Christ's faithful, the beginning of which is in eminenti, has forever condemned and prohibited several societies, assemblies, meetings, gatherings, fellowships, or associations commonly called the Liberi Muratori or Franks Macons or identified by whatever other designation, having been dispersed widely then in certain regions, and each day becoming more powerful, admonishing each and every one of Chris's faithful, under pain of excommunication ipso facto without any declaration needing to be incurred, from which no one would be able to be absolved by any other than the Roman pontiff then reigning, unless on the point of death, so that any one might nor dare or presume to enter or propagate, or to foster, receive, conceal societies of this kind, to be inscribed in. Attached to or be among them, or otherwise involved according as it is contained more broadly and richly in the same letter, the text of which is above. Since, however, as we have learned, there have been some who have not hesitated to declare and to boast openly that the stated penalty of excommunication imposed by our predecessor, as is shown above, no longer carries any force because of the fact that the very constitution before introduced has not been confirmed by us, as if in fact express confirmation of a pontifical successor were required for the continuation of apostolic constitutions published by a predecessor. And since it has also been recommended to us by some pious and God-fearing men that it would be exceedingly expedient for destroying all the deceptions of the calumniators, and for making public the uniformity of our disposition with the mind and will of the same predecessor, to add the fresh voice of our confirmation to the constitution of the above-mentioned predecessor. Although, while we have hitherto willingly granted, not only on numerous occasions formerly, but also especially within the year of Jubilee having now passed, to many of Christ's faithful truly repenting and lamenting for having violated the laws of the same constitution and willingly professing that they will withdraw entirely from the condemned societies or associations of this kind and that they are in the future never going to return to those societies and those associations, or 
while we have communicated to the penitentiaries appointed by us the faculty of being capable of imparting, in our name and by our authority, to those types of penitents, who have recourse to them, the same absolution, also. While we have not neglected with a restless zeal for vigilance to insist earnestly that action be taken by competent judges and tribunals against the violators of that very constitution according to the measure of the crime, which action in fact was often taken, we have given indeed not merely probable arguments, but clearly evident and certain arguments, from which our disposition and steadfast and deliberate will in regard to the force and continuance of the censures imposed by Clement, our said predecessor, as is shown above, ought clearly enough to be concluded. But if any contrary opinion was passed around on our account, we would be able to disregard it in all security, and to abandon our cause to the just judgment of the omnipotent God, using those words, which it is certain had at one time been recited in the sacred liturgy. Grant, we beseech thee, O Lord, that we do not trouble ourselves about the contradiction of spurious minds. But once that very wickedness has been spurned, let us pray that you suffer us neither to be frightened by the unjust criticisms, nor to be attracted to the insidious flatteries, but rather to love that which thou dost command, as is found in the ancient missal, which is attributed to St. Gelasius, and was published by the Venerable Servant of God, Joseph Maria Cardinal Thomasius, in the Mass, which is entitled Contra Obloquentis. Nevertheless, so that it might not be able to be said that something, by which we could easily be able to take away kindling and shut the mouth of false accusations, had been unguardedly neglected by us, once that the counsel of several of our venerable brothers, cardinals of the Holy Roman Church had earlier been heard. We decided to confirm with this present letter, in forma specifica, that same constitution of our predecessor inserted above word for word, which is considered the strongest and most effective, accordingly. From certain knowledge and the fullness of our apostolic authority, we confirm, strengthen, renew, that constitution by the text of this present letter in all things and on account of all things just as if it had been published firstly by our own motion, by our authority, and in our name, and we will and decree that it have perpetual force and efficacy. Furthermore, among the gravest causes of the aforementioned prohibition and condemnation reported in the Constitution inserted above, the first is that in societies and associations of this type men of any religion and sect whatever are united with each other, from which matter it is evident enough how great a destruction is able to be brought to the purity of the Catholic religion. The next is the strict and impenetrable pledge of a secret by which those things which are done in associations of such like are hidden, to which, therefore, that sentence is able fittingly to be applied which Cecilius Natalie cited before Munitius Felix in an indisputably diverse case. Honest things always rejoice in the public, crimes are secret. The third is the oath by which they bind themselves for preserving inviolably this type of secret, as if it were allowed to someone to protect himself under cover of a promise or swearing, having been questioned by legitimate power without being held to confess all things, whatsoever things are sought after for discerning whether something is done in meetings of this kind, which is contrary to the welfare and laws of the state and religion. The fourth is, that societies of this kind are known to be against canonical not less than civil sanctions, since, namely, all colleges and sodalities united contrary to public authority are forbidden as is to be seen in Book XLVI of the Pandex, Tit. 22 de Collegius A.C. Corpori Basilicitis, and in the renowned letter of C. Plinius Cecilius Secundus, which is ex CVI lib X, in which he says that by his own edict in accord with the decrees of the emperor it has been forbidden that there be heretical sects, that is, that societies and assemblies are not able to be entered or established without the authority of the prince. The fifth is, that already in many regions the previously mentioned societies and fellowships have been proscribed by the laws of secular princes, and eliminated. The last, finally, that before prudent and approved men the same societies and fellowships were being perceived in an evil light and by their judgment. Whoever would enroll in the same would incur the mark of depravity and perversion. 
Finally, the same predecessor in the Constitution inserted above rouses the bishops and superior prelates, and other ordinaries of places, that they do not neglect to invoke the help of the secular branches, if there be need, for the execution of it. Which things, each and every, are not only approved and confirmed by us and are commended and enjoined to the same ecclesiastical superiors respectively, but also we ourselves, in accord with the duty of the apostolic vigilance, invoke with this letter the strength and aid of the Catholic princes and of all the secular powers as to the accomplishment of the matters presented above, and we demand with earnest desire, since the same supreme princes and powers have been chosen by God as the defenders of the faith and protectors of the church, and therefore it is their duty to accomplish by every suitable means that obedience due to the apostolic constitutions and consideration of every kind be rendered which for them the fathers of the Council of Trent says. 25 Cap. 20 And much before, the Emperor Charles the Great had made exceedingly clear in tit. I Cap. 2 of his capitularies, where after the observance of ecclesiastical sanctions committed to all those. Subject to him, he added, for in no way are we able to understand how they can be faithful to. Us who have shown themselves unfaithful to God and disobedient to their priests. Wherefore, enjoining all the rulers and ministers of his domains, that they should by all means constrain each and every one to offer the obedience due to the laws of the church, and also impose the gravest penalties against those who neglect to render this, supplying among other things. But whoever will have been found in these things, that it be absent, at least neglecting and disobeying them. Let them know that neither do they retain any honors in our empire, although they will have even been our sons, nor a place in our palace, either do they have either any association or communication with us, but rather let them undergo penalties in difficulty and dryness. We will, however, that absolutely the same faith which would be applied to the original letters, if it would be produced or shown, be applied to duplicates, likewise to printed copies, of the present letter signed by the hand of some public notary, and secured by the seal of a person constituted in ecclesiastical dignity. It is allowed to no man to falsify this letter of our confirmation, renewal, approbation, commission, invocation, the demand of our decree and will, or to oppose it by a rash boldness. But if anyone presumes to attempt this, let him know that he will incur the wrath of Almighty God, and of his blessed apostles Peter and Paul. Given at Rome and St. Mary Major, in the 1751st year of the Incarnation of the Lord, on the 18th day of March, in the 11th year of our pontificate. 5. Would that those who were in charge of matters then had assumed these decrees to be of such value as the salvation of both the Church and the State was demanding. Would that they had convinced themselves that they ought to respect in the Roman pontiffs, successors of blessed Peter not only the universal pastors and teachers of the church, but also the vigorous defenders of their dignity, and the most diligent heralds of the dangers which threaten, would that they had used that power of theirs for dismembering the sects whose pernicious devices had been exposed to them by the apostolic see. Already from that time they had plainly put into effect their cause. And because they judged that this cause was needing to be treated with indifference, or at least treated very trivially, whether by the deceit of the sectarians cunningly hiding their affairs, whether by the imprudent counsels of some. From those old Masonic sects which have never languished, very many others have arisen. Much more dangerous and more audacious than the former. The sect of the Carbonari, which was considered the leader of all the others in Italy and in some other regions, was considered to embrace as if in its bosom all these, and having divided into, as it were, Various branches diverse in name only, undertook to fight most vehemently against the Catholic religion and every topmost legitimate civil power, which being a disaster, so that he might free Italy and other regions, indeed even the very pontifical domain, into which, because the pontifical government had been obstructed for so long a time, the sect had insinuated itself, Pius the Seventh of happy memory, in whose place we have been chosen, condemned with the gravest penalties the sect of the Carbonari, or with the passage of time by whatever other name it might be called according to the diversity of places, of idioms and of men, by a constitution published. 
on the 13th of September in the year 1821 whose beginning is Ecclesium a Jesu Christo. We deem that the original of this must also be inserted in our letter. Bishop Pius, servant of the servants of God for the perpetual remembrance of the matter. 6. The church founded by Jesus Christ our Savior upon a firm rock, and against which Christ himself has promised that the gates of hell will never prevail, has been so often assaulted, and by such dreadful enemies, that unless that divine and unchangeable promise had intervened, it might seem that it must be feared that the church itself, besieged be it by their power, their crafts, or their cunning, might entirely perish. But that which has happened in previous times, such also has been done and especially in this certainly sorrowful time of ours, which seems to be that end time foretold by the apostles so long ago, during which time, Jude v. 18. Mockers will come walking according to their own desires and ungodliness. For it is not concealed from anyone how great the multitude of wicked men will have joined together in these most difficult times against the Lord and against his anointed one, who are especially solicitous, once the faithful have been ensnared by philosophy and vain deceit call. 2 colon 8. And torn away from the doctrine of the church, for weakening and overturning the same church, although by a useless effort. But in order to succeed more easily, the greater number of them have formed secret groups and clandestine sects, from which they were hoping that they might induce many into the fellowship of their conspiracy and crime. A long time ago this holy see, once these sects had been discovered, cried with a great and unbridled voice against them, and exposed their plans, which had been devised secretly by them against religion, indeed against civil society. Long ago it called forth the attentiveness of all, that they might beware lest it be allowed to these sects to attempt that which they were heinously contemplating. Indeed it must have grieved these endeavors of the Holy See not to have answered that destruction, which it was observing, and that wicked men had not desisted from their acknowledged plan, whence they at long last attained to those evils which we ourselves have perceived. Indeed, men whose arrogance has always mounted have dared to begin new secret societies. Mention must be made in this place of a society, recently born and propagated far and wide in Italy and in other regions, which although it has been divided into several sects, and according to their variety it sometimes assumes names among themselves different and distinct, nevertheless because the entity is a communion of opinions and crimes, and because a certain pact has been entered into, is one, and is generally accustomed to go under the name of the Carbonari. Indeed, they simulate a singular respect and a certain extraordinary zeal toward the Catholic religion and toward the person and doctrine of Jesus Christ our Savior, whom at times they also impiously dare to call the rector and great teacher of this society. But these ways of speaking, which are seen to be more slippery than oil, are nothing other than darts employed by crafty men, who come in sheep's clothing but are ravenous wolves inside, for more securely wounding the too little cautious. Surely that most severe oath, by which, imitating for the most part the ancient Priscillianists they promised that they at no time ever, or in no case, either are going to expose to men not enrolled in the society anything which regards the society, or are going to share with those who are in the lower degrees anything which pertains to the higher degrees. In addition, those clandestine and furthermore illegitimate assemblies, which they have, after the manner employed by many heretics, and the selection of men of whatever religion and sect into their society, even if other things were not available, sufficiently convinced that it is necessary to have no confidence in their related discourses. But it is not necessary by conjectures and indications that it be judged such concerning their sayings, as it was pointed out above. Books published by these very types in which the procedure is described, which is accustomed to be used in the meetings, especially of the higher degrees, their catechisms, statutes, and other authentic and credible documents, and in fact the testimony of those who, when they had abandoned that society to which they had previously adhered, revealed its errors and frauds to legitimate judges, have declared openly that the Carbonari particularly incline in such a way that they give to each one great license for devising by his own genius and from his own ideas for himself a religion which he may practice. Once indifference to religion has been introduced, then which hardly anything more destructive can be contrived, 
such that they profane and defile the passion of Jesus. Christ by certain of their impious ceremonies, that they despise the sacraments of the church, for which they seem to substitute other new things invented by themselves through their supreme wickedness, and despise the very mysteries of the Catholic religion, and that they overthrow this apostolic see against which, because on it the sovereignty of the apostolic. Chair has always flourished, s. August. Epist 43. They are roused by a certain unparalleled hate, and they devise every dangerous destructive plot. And the precepts concerning morals, which the society of the Carbonari hand on, are not, as it is certain from their monuments, less wicked, although it boasts confidently that it demands from its own followers, that they cultivate and exercise charity and every kind of virtue, and abstain from every vice. Therefore, it promotes sensual pleasure most shamelessly. It teaches that it is licit to kill those who have not kept the trust offered concerning the secret, which was mentioned above. And although Peter, the prince of the apostles, decrees that Christians, 1 Pet 2 13, be subject to every human creature on account of God, whether to the king as preeminent, whether to the magistrates as ambassadors to them, etc. And although Paul the apostle, Titus 3 verse 1, commands that every soul be subject to higher powers. Nevertheless, that society teaches that it is allowed, once revolts have been provoked, to deprive of their power. Kings and other rulers, whom most unjustly it dares indiscriminately to call tyrants. These and other dogmas and precepts of this society are the ones from which those crimes newly committed by the Carbonari have emerged, which have brought such intense grief to honest and pious men. We, therefore, who have been constituted as the guardian of the house of Israel, which is holy church, and who in accord with our pastoral office ought to beware lest the Lord's flock divinely entrusted to us suffer any harm, consider in a case so serious that we cannot abstain from repressing the filthy undertakings of men. We are also moved by the example of Clement the Twelfth and Benedict the Fourteenth, our predecessors of happy memory of whom the one on the twenty-eighth day of April of the year 1738 by the Constitution in Eminenti, the other on the eighteenth day of March 1751 by the Constitution Providas, have condemned and proscribed the society's delibri muratori, or Frank's Macons, or called by whatever other. Name according to the variety of regions and idioms, of which society is the society of the Carbonari, must be considered perhaps the offspring or certainly the imitation. And although we have already gravely prohibited this society with two edicts published through our Secretary of State, nevertheless, following our above-mentioned predecessors, we think that severe penalties must be decreed with a formality indeed more solemnly against this society. Especially since the Carbonari indiscriminately maintain that they are not included in those two constitutions of Clement XII and Benedict XIV and that they are not subject to the judgments and penalties proposed in them. Therefore, now that the select congregation of our venerable brothers of the cardinals of the Holy Roman Church has been heard, indeed from its counsel, and also by our own motion and from our certain knowledge and mature deliberation, indeed from the fullness of our apostolic power, we have decreed and ordained that the society of the Carbonari mentioned above, or called by any other name whatever, its assemblies, meetings, gatherings, fellowships, or associations must be condemned and prohibited, accordingly as we condemn and proscribe by our present constitution forever valid. Wherefore we order strictly and in virtue of holy obedience each and every faithful of Christ of whatever state, grade, condition, order, dignity and preeminence, be they the laity or clerics, both seculars and regulars and even those worthy of specific and individual mention, that any one under whatever pretext or special condition not dare or presume to join or propagate, to foster, the society of the Carbonari mentioned above, or otherwise named, and to admit and hide in their dwellings, or their homes, or any other place, to be enrolled in, to adhere to or to take part in it, indeed whatever degree of it, or to give opportunity or convenience that it may be convened in any place, to furnish it with anything, or otherwise to offer counsel, aid or goodwill, openly or in secret, directly or indirectly, per se or through. Others in any way whatever. Likewise no one may dare or presume to exhort, 
induce, provoke, or persuade others to be inscribed in, be reckoned as part of or be among a society of this kind, or any degree of it, nor are they to help and thus support it in any way whatever. On the contrary, they must absolutely abstain themselves from the same society and its assemblies, meetings, fellowships, or associations under pain of excommunication needing to be incurred ipso facto without any declaration by all those offending as above, from which no one is able to obtain the favor of absolution through any one except us, or the Roman pontiff reigning at that time, save one determined to be at the point of death. Furthermore, we order all under the same pain of excommunication reserved to us and our successors, the Roman pontiffs, that they are held to declare to the bishops, or to others whom it pertains all those whom they know to have joined in this society, or to have defiled themselves by any one of the crimes mentioned above. Finally, that every danger of error may efficaciously be prevented, we condemn and we proscribe that all, as they call them, catechisms and books of the Carbonari, and we forbid, under the same pain of major excommunication reserved in the same way, every one of the faithful to read or to possess the books mentioned above, and we command that they hand over those materials, either to the ordinaries, or to others, to whom the right of receiving them pertains. We will, however, that absolutely the same faith which would be applied to the original letter, if they would be produced or shown, is to be applied to duplicates, likewise printed copies, of the present letter signed by the hand of some public notary, and secured by the seal of a person constituted in ecclesiastical dignity. It is allowed to no man to falsify this letter of our declaration, condemnation, mandate, prohibition and interdict, or to oppose it by a rash boldness. But if anyone presumes to attempt this, let him know that he will incur the wrath of Almighty God and of his blessed apostles Peter and Paul. Given at Rome in St. Mary Major, in the 1821st year of the Incarnation of the Lord, on the 13th day of September, in the 22nd year of our pontificate. 7. Not long after the Constitution published by Pius VII, we were elevated to the topmost chair of Blessed Peter by no merits of ours, and immediately we turned our attention to exposing what the state of clandestine sects was, what their number was, what their poser was. Inquiring about these things we easily understood that their arrogance had grown principally on account of the multitude of them, increased by the new sections. From which sects that one must especially be mentioned which is called universitaria, because it has a seat and domicile in many universities of learning, in which the young are informed, initiated to, and fashioned for every crime by some teachers, who are zealous not to teach them but to pervert them by the mysteries of the same sect which ought to be called most truly the mysteries of iniquity. From this it indeed appears that even after so long a time since the flames of revolution were enkindled and spread abroad, indeed after the remarkable victories reported by the powerful princes of Europe, by which those flames were expected to be extinguished, their wicked undertakings still have not known an end. For in these very regions in which the early storms seem to have quieted, what fear there is of new disturbances and seditions, which those sects continually devise. Such dread of the impious daggers, which they secretly fix in the bodies of those whom they assign to death. How many and how grave the things, even. Against their will, are they who rule with power over the same ones not rarely forced to decree for safeguarding public peace? From this the most painful calamities come forth by which the church is everywhere fiercely plagued and which we are not able to relate without pain, without deep sorrow. Its holy dogmas and precepts are fought against most shamelessly. Its dignity is diminished, and that peace and happiness which it ought to enjoy by a certain right of its own was not only being disturbed, but is totally destroyed. Nor must it be thought that all these evils, and others which have been omitted by us are attributed to these clandestine sects surely through calumny. Books which they do not hesitate to write about religion and the state have been published in their name, with which they scorn dominion, blaspheme majesty. Moreover, they declare repeatedly that Christ is either a scandal or foolish, indeed, not rarely, that there is no God, and they teach that the soul of man dies together with the body, the codes and statues. 
by which they explain their goals and ordinances openly declare that all the things which we have already mentioned, and which pertain to the overthrowing of legitimate rulers and totally destroying the church come forth from them. And this has been ascertained and must be considered as certain, that these sects, although in name different, nevertheless have been joined among themselves by an impious bond of filthy goals. Since matters are in such a state, we judge it to be the character of our office to condemn these clandestine sects again, and in such a manner indeed that no one of them can boast that they are not encompassed by our apostolic pronouncement, and under this pretext lead careless and less sagacious men into error. Therefore, from the counsel of our venerable brethren, the cardinals of the Holy Roman Church, and also by our own motion indeed with our certain knowledge and mature consideration, we forbid forever under the same penalties which are contained in the letters of our predecessors already reported in this our Constitution, which letters we expressly confirm, that all secret societies, those which now are and those which perhaps will afterwards sprout out, and which propose to themselves, against the Church and against the highest civil powers those things which we have mentioned above, by whatever name they may finally be called. Wherefore we order strictly and in virtue of holy obedience each and every faithful of Christ of whatever state, grade, condition, order, dignity and preeminence, be they the laity or clerics, both seculars and regulars and even those worthy of specific and individual mention, that any one, under whatever pretext or special condition, may not dare or presume to join or propagate, or to foster, the societies mentioned above, or by whatever name they may be called, and to admit and hide, in their dwellings, or their homes, or any place, to be enrolled in, to adhere to or to take part in them, indeed to whatever degree of the same, or to give opportunity or convenience that they may be assembled in any place, to furnish the same with anything, or otherwise to offer counsel, aid or goodwill, openly or in secret, directly or indirectly, per se or through others in any way whatever. Likewise no one may dare or presume to exhort, induce, provoke or persuade others to be inscribed in, be reckoned as part of or be among societies of this kind, or any degree of the same, nor are they to help and thus support them in any way whatever. On the contrary, they must absolutely abstain from the same societies and their assemblies, meetings, fellowships, or associations under pain of excommunication to be incurred ipso facto without any declaration by all those offending as above, from which no one is able to obtain the favor of absolution through any one except us, or the Roman pontiff reigning at that time, save one determined to be at the point of death. Furthermore we order all under the same pain of excommunication reserved to us and our successors, the Roman pontiffs, that they are held to declare to the bishops, or to others whom it concerns, all those whom they know to have joined this society, or to have defiled themselves by any one of the crimes just mentioned above. In fact, we explicitly condemn and declare invalid particularly that clearly impious and accursed oath, by which they bind those who are received into these sects that they will reveal to none those things which pertain to those sects, and that they will strike with death all those members who expose those things to their superiors, either ecclesiastics or laity. For what reason? Is not an oath, which must be sworn in justice, in order to establish, as it were, a contract by which someone obliges himself to an unjust murder, and in order to despise the authority of those, who, when they regulate either the church or legitimate civil society, have the right of discerning those things in which the salvation of those societies consists, contrary to divine law? Isn't it the most unjust and the greatest indignity to call God as a witness and surety of crimes? Most recently the fathers of the Lateran Council three have said, can three, four. They must not be called oaths, but rather perjuries, which are taken against ecclesiastical utility and the ordinances of the Most Holy Fathers. And the shamelessness and madness of the ones among these men who when they say not just in their heart, but also openly and in their public writings, there is not a God, dare nevertheless demand an oath from all those whom they select for their sections. These things have been established for suppressing and condemning all these ravening and criminal sections. But now we not only request but demand your service, venerable brothers, the Catholic patriarchs, primates, 
archbishops, and bishops. Be attentive for yourselves and for the universal flock over which the Holy Ghost has placed you as bishops to rule the Church of God. Devouring wolves indeed will seize upon you not sparing the flock, but do not fear, not consider your life more precious than yourselves. Maintain that sacred truth that the constancy of the men entrusted to you in religion depends for the most part on you and on things done rightly. For although we may live in those days which are evil, and in that time in which many do not maintain sound doctrine, nevertheless the obedience of very many faithful to their pastors endures, whom they receive with reason as ministers of Christ and dispensers of his mysteries. Use, therefore, this authority for the advantage of your sheep, which you maintain over their souls by an imperishable honor of God. Make known through yourselves the deceits of the sex, and with how much diligence they must guard against them and their social intercourse. Let them dread their perverse doctrine which mocks the most holy mysteries of our religion and the most pure precepts of Christ, and which attacks every legitimate power, while you act as their models and teachers. And finally let us exhort you with the words of our predecessor, Clement XII, in his encyclical letter to all the patriarchs, primates, archbishops, bishops of the Catholic Church of the fourteenth day of September of the year 1758. Let us be filled, I pray, with the power of the Spirit of the Lord, with discernment and with virtue, lest just as dumb dogs not having the power to bark, we suffer our flocks to be as pillage and our sheep forage for the beasts of the field. And let not anything detain us from giving ourselves up to all battles for the glory of God and the salvation of souls. Let us consider him, who underwent such great contradiction against himself by sinners. But if we fear the boldness of those wicked ones, it has been from the force of the episcopate, and from the sublime and divine power of governing the church. But neither are we able to remain much longer or be any longer Christians, if it has come to this point that we are terrified at the threats or the artifices of the destroyers. We demand also with great zeal your assistance, dearest sons in Christ, our Catholic princes, whom we love with a singular and truly paternal love. Furthermore we call into memory the words which Leo the Great, whose successors in dignity and heirs we are, although unworthy of the name, used writing to the Emperor Leo. You ought unhesitatingly to recognize that the royal power has been conferred to you not only for the rule of the world, but especially for the defense of the church, so that by suppressing the heinous undertakings you may defend those statutes which are good and restore true peace to those things which have been disordered. Although there is such an interval, the reality remains in this time, so that those sects must be restrained by you not only for defending the Catholic religion, but also for protecting your safety and that of the people subject to your rule. In fact, the cause of religion, especially in this time, has been so united with the health of society, that certainly in no way can one be separated from the other. For they who follow those sects are not less enemies of religion than of your power. They assault each one, they devise to overthrow completely each one. But they would not however be allowed, if it were possible, to suppress either religion or any royal power. And so great is the cunning of the most calculating men that when they are seen especially to be favorable to the increasing of your power, then they are looking chiefly for the overturning of it. Those men indeed teach very many things such that they advocate that our power and that of the bishops must be diminished and weakened by those who have possession of power, and that many rights must be transferred to them, both from those which are possessions of this apostolic see and principal church, and from those which pertain to the bishops, who have been called for a sharing of our solicitude. But these things those men teach, not only from a most offensive hate by which they are inflamed against religion, but also according to a plan whereby they hope that people who are subject to your rule on observing that the limits, which Christ and the Church instituted by him have established, concerning sacred matters, are overturned, may be easily aroused by this example to change and destroy even the form of civil government. Likewise we look with solicitude, by our special prayer and encouragements, upon you all, O beloved sons, who profess the Catholic religion. Avoid entirely men who consider light darkness, and darkness light. For what utility worthy of the name can arise from agreement with men who think that no consideration for God, 
no consideration for the more sublime powers, is needing to be had, who through intrigues and secret assemblies try to declare war on those things, and who are such that they cry even in public and everywhere that they are the greatest lovers of the public gook, of the church, and of society. Nevertheless they have already declared by all their deeds that they wish to throw all things into disorder and to overturn all things. These are indeed similar to those men to whom John commands in his second epistle, the 10, that neither hospitality must be given, no, God speed, be said, and whom our fathers do not hesitate to call the firstborn of the devil. Beware therefore of their flatteries and of their discourses sweetened with honey, by which they will seduce you to enroll in those sects to which they have been admitted. Have it for certain that no one can be a member of those sects without being guilty of the most serious disgraceful act and drive away from your ears the words of those who vigorously declare that you may assent to your election to the lower degrees of their sex, that nothing is admitted in those degrees which is opposed to reason, nothing which is opposed to religion, indeed that there is nothing proclaimed, nothing performed which is not holy, which is not right, which is not undefiled. Truly that abominable oath, which has already been mentioned, and which must be sworn even in that lower echelon, is sufficient for you to understand that it is contrary to divine law to be enlisted in those lower degrees, and to remain in them. In the next place, although they are not accustomed to commit those things which are more serious and more criminal to those who have not attained to the higher degrees, nevertheless it is plainly evident that the force and boldness of those most pernicious societies grow on account of the unanimity and the multitude of all who enroll in them. Therefore, even those who have not passed beyond the inferior degrees must be considered sharers of their crimes. And that passage of the Apostle to the Romans, ch1, applies to them. They who do such things, but also those who consent to those doing them. Finally, we call very lovingly to ourselves those who had once been enlightened, and had tasted the heavenly gift and had been made partakers, nevertheless, then erred most miserably and follow those sects whether they are engaged in their inferior or abide in their superior degrees. For the one standing in the place of him who has professed that he has not come to call the just but sinners, and who has likened himself to a shepherd, who, when he has left the remaining flock behind, carefully seeks the sheep he has lost, we exhort and implore them to turn back to Christ. For although they have defiled themselves exceedingly with crime, they ought not despair of mercy and clemency from God and Jesus Christ who has suffered for them also, who will not despise in any way their repentance, but certainly like a most loving father, who a long time ago was waiting for his prodigal sons, will very gladly receive it. But we, in order that we may rouse them, inasmuch as it is in our power, and pave an easier road for them to penance, suspend for the entire interval of a year, once this apostolic letter of ours has been published in the region in which they live, both the obligation of denouncing their associates in those sects, and also the reservation of censures, into which they, enrolling in those sects, have fallen, and we declare that, even if their associates have not been denounced, they are able to be absolved from those censures by any confessor whatever, provided that he is from the number of those who have been approved by the ordinaries of the places in which they live which indulgence also we authorize to be applied to those who perhaps live at Rome. But if any one of them whom we address is so unyielding, because God the Father of mercies turns away, that he acts such that that interval of time, which we have designated, passes without abandoning those sects, and being truly repentant, by that lapse of time immediately both the obligation of denouncing his associates and the reservation of censures revives for him, nor is he able to obtain absolution thereafter unless once his associates have been denounced before, or at least, once an oath has been sworn with respect to denouncing them as soon as possible. Nor is he able to be loose from those censures by any other than us, or by our successors, or by those who will have obtained the faculty of absolving from the same by the Holy See. We will, however, that absolutely the same faith which would be applied to the original letter, if they would be produced or shown, is to be applied to duplicates, likewise printed copies, of the present letter signed by the hand of some public notary, 
and secured by the seal of a person constituted in ecclesiastical dignity. It is allowed to no man to falsify this letter of our declaration, condemnations, renewal, ordered prohibition, invocation, examination, decree and will, or to oppose it by a rash boldness. But if any one presumes to attempt this, let him know that he will incur the wrath of Almighty God and of his blessed apostles Peter and Paul. Given at Rome in St. Peter, in the 1826th year of the Incarnation of the Lord, on the thirteenth day of March, in the second year of our pontificate. Traditae Humilitati on his program for his pontificate Pope Pius VIII, 1829. On his program for the pontificate to our venerable brothers, patriarchs, primates, archbishops, and bishops. Venerable brothers, greetings and apostolic benediction. According to the custom of our ancestors, we are about to assume our pontificate in the Church of the Lateran. This office has been granted to us, even though we are humble and unworthy. We open our heart with joy to you, venerable brothers, whom God has given to us as helpers in the conduct of so great an administration. We are pleased to let you know the intimate sentiments of our will. We also think it helpful to communicate those things from which the Christian cause may benefit. For the duty of our office is not only to feed, rule, and direct the lambs, namely the Christian people, but also the sheep, that is the clergy. 2. We rejoice and praise Christ, who raised up shepherds for the safekeeping of his flock. These shepherds vigilantly lead their flocks so as not to lose even one of those they have received from the Father. For we know well, venerable brothers, your unshakable faith, your zeal for religion, your sanctity of life, and your singular prudence. Co-workers such as you make us happy and confident. This pleasant situation encourages us when we fear because of the great responsibility of our office and it refreshes and strengthens us when we feel overwhelmed by so many serious concerns. We shall not detain you with a long sermon to remind you what things are required to perform sacred duties well, what the canons prescribe lest anyone depart from vigilance over his flock, and what attention ought to be given in preparing and accepting ministers. Rather we call upon God the Savior that he may protect. You with his omnipresent divinity and bless your activities and endeavors with happy success. 3. Although God may console us with you, we are nonetheless sad. This is due to the numberless errors and the teachings of perverse doctrines which, no longer secretly and clandestinely but openly and vigorously, attack the Catholic faith. You know how evil men have raised the standard of revolt against religion through philosophy, of which they proclaim themselves doctors, and through empty fallacies devised according to natural reason. In the first place, the Roman see is assailed and the bonds of unity are, every day, being severed. The authority of the church is weakened and the protectors of things sacred are snatched away and held in contempt. The holy precepts are despised, the celebration of divine offices is ridiculed, and the worship of God is cursed by the sinner. 1. All things which concern religion are relegated to the fables of old women and the superstitions of priests. Truly lions have roared in Israel, too, with tears we say. Truly they have conspired against the Lord and against his Christ. Truly the impious have said, Raise it, raise it down to its foundations. 3. 4. Among these heresies belongs that foul contrivance of the sophists of this age who do not admit any difference among the different professions of faith and who think that the portal of eternal salvation opens for all from any religion. They, therefore, label with the stigma of levity and stupidity those who, having abandoned the religion which they learned, embrace another of any kind, even Catholicism. This is certainly a monstrous impiety which assigns the same praise and the mark of the just and upright man to truth and to error, to virtue and to vice, to goodness and to turpitude. 
Indeed, this deadly idea concerning the lack of difference among religions is refuted even by the light of natural reason. We are assured of this because the various religions do not often agree among themselves. If one is true, the other must be false. There can be no society of darkness with light. Against these experienced sophists the people must be taught that the profession of the Catholic faith is uniquely true, as the Apostle proclaims, One Lord, one faith, one baptism. For, Jerome used to say it this way, He who eats the lamb outside this house will perish as did those during the flood who were not with Noah in the ark. 5. Indeed, no other name than the name of Jesus is given to men, by which they may be saved. 6. He who believes shall be saved. He who does not believe shall be condemned. 7. 5. We must also be wary of those who publish the Bible with new interpretations contrary to the Church's laws. They skillfully distort the meaning by their own interpretation. They print the Bibles in the vernacular, and, absorbing an incredible expense, offer them free even to the uneducated. Furthermore, the Bibles are rarely without perverse little inserts to ensure that the reader imbibes their lethal poison instead of the saving water of salvation. Long ago the Apostolic See warned about this serious hazard to the faith, and drew up a list of the authors of these pernicious notions. The rules of this index were published by the Council of Trent Wink with the Frown 8. The ordinance required that translations of the Bible into the vernacular not be permitted without the approval of the Apostolic See and further required that they be published with commentaries from the Fathers. The Sacred Synod of Trent had decreed, 9, in order to Restrain impudent characters that no one, relying on his own prudence in matters of faith and of conduct which concerns Christian doctrine, might twist the sacred scriptures to his own opinion, or to an opinion contrary to that of the Church or the Popes. Though such machinations against the Catholic faith had been assailed long ago by these canonical proscriptions, our recent predecessors made a special effort to check these spreading evils. 10. With these arms may you too strive to fight the battles of the Lord which endanger the sacred teachings, lest this deadly virus spread in your flock. 6. When this corruption has been abolished, then eradicate those secret societies of factious men who, completely opposed to God and to princes, are wholly dedicated to bringing about the fall of the church, the destruction of kingdoms, and disorder in the whole world. Having cast off the restraints of true religion, they prepare the way for shameful crimes. Indeed, because they concealed their societies, they aroused suspicion of their evil intent. Afterwards this evil intention broke forth, about to assail the sacred and the civil orders. Hence the supreme pontiffs, our predecessors, Clement XII, Benedict XIV, Pius VII, Leo XII, XI, repeatedly condemned with anathema that kind of secret society. Our predecessors condemned them in apostolic letters. We confirm those commands in order that they be observed exactly. In this matter we shall be diligent lest the church and the state suffer harm. From the machinations of such sections. With your help we strenuously take up the mission of destroying the strongholds which the putrid impiety of evil men sets up. 7. We want you to know of another secret society organized not so long ago for the corruption of young people who are taught in the gymnasia and the lycia. Its cunning purpose is to engage evil teachers to lead the students along the paths of Baal by teaching them unchristian doctrines. The perpetrators know well that the students' minds and morals are molded by the precepts of the teachers. Its influence is already so persuasive that all fear of religion has been lost, all discipline of morals has been abandoned the sanctity of pure doctrine has been contested, and the rights of the sacred and of the civil powers have been trampled upon. Nor are they ashamed of any disgraceful crime or error. We can truly say with Leo the Great that for them, law is prevarication, religion the devil, sacrifice disgrace. 12. Drive these evils from your diocese. Strive to assign not only learned, but also good men to train our youth. 8. Also watch the seminaries more diligently. The fathers of Trent made you responsible for their administration. 13. From them must come forth men well instructed both in Christian and ecclesiastical discipline and in the principles of sound doctrine. 
such men may then distinguish themselves for their piety and their teaching. Thus, their ministry will be a witness, even to those outside the church, and they will be able to refute those who have strayed from the path of justice. Be very careful in choosing the seminarians since the salvation of the people principally depends on good pastors. Nothing contributes more to the ruin of souls than impious, weak, or uninformed clerics. 9. The heretics have disseminated pestilential books everywhere, by which the teachings of the impious spread, much as a cancer. 14. To counteract this most deadly pest, spare no labor. Be admonished by the words of Pius VII. May they consider only that kind of food to be healthy to which the voice and authority of Peter has sent them. May they choose such food and nourish themselves with it. May they judge that food from which Peter's voice calls them away to be entirely harmful and pestiferous. May they quickly shrink away from it and never permit themselves to be caught by its appearance and perverted by its allurements. 15. 10. We also want you to imbue your flock with reverence for the sanctity of marriage so that they may never do anything to detract from the dignity of this sacrament. They should do nothing that might be unbecoming to this spotless union, nor anything that might cause doubt about the perpetuity of the bond of matrimony. This goal will be accomplished if the Christian people are accurately taught that the sacrament of matrimony ought to be governed not so much by human law as by divine law and that it ought to be counted among sacred, not earthly, concerns. Thus, it is wholly subject to the Church. Formerly marriage had no other purpose than that of bringing children into the world. But now it has been raised to the dignity of a sacrament by Christ the Lord and enriched with heavenly gifts. Now its purpose is not so much to generate offspring as to educate children for God and for religion. This increases the number of worshippers of the true divinity. It is agreed that the union of marriage signifies the perpetual and sublime union of Christ with his church. As a result, the close union of husband and wife is a sacrament, that is, a sacred sign of the immortal love of Christ for his spouse. Therefore, teach the people what is sanctioned and what is condemned by the rules of the church and the decrees of the councils. 16. Also explain those things which pertain to the essence of the sacrament. Then they will be able to accomplish those things and will not dare to attempt what the church detests. We ask this earnestly of you because of your love of religion. 11. You know now what causes our present grief. There are also other things, no less serious, which it would take too long to recount here, but which you know well. Shall we hold back our voice when the Christian cause is in such great need? Shall we be restrained by human arguments? Shall we suffer in silence the rending of the seamless robe of Christ the Savior? which even the soldiers who crucified him did not dare to rend. Let it never happen that we be found lacking in zealous pastoral care for our flock, beset as it is by serious dangers. We know you will do even more than we ask, and that you will cherish, augment, and defend the faith by means of teachings, counsel, work, and zeal. 12. With many ardent prayers we ask that, with God restoring the penitence of Israel, holy religion may flourish everywhere. We also ask that the true happiness of the people may continue undisturbed, and that God may always protect the pastor of his earthly flock and nourish him. May the powerful princes of the nations, with their generous spirits, favor our cares and endeavors. With God's help, may they continue vigorously to promote the prosperity and safety of the church, which is afflicted by so many evils. 13. Let us ask these things humbly of Mary, the Holy Mother of God. We confess that she alone has overcome all heresies and we salute her with gratitude on this day, the anniversary of our predecessor, Pius V.I.'s, restoration to the city of Rome after he had suffered many adversities. Let us ask these things of Peter, the Prince of the Apostles, and of his co-apostle Paul. With Christ's consent, may these two apostles grant that we, firmly established on the rock of the Church's confession, suffer no disturbing circumstances. From Christ himself we humbly ask the gifts of grace, peace, and joy for you and for the flock entrusted to you. As a pledge of our affection we lovingly impart the apostolic benediction. Given in Rome, at St. Peter's, May 24, 1829, the first year of our pontificate.
Mirari Vas. On Liberalism and Religious Indifferentism Pope Gregory XVI, 1832. On Liberalism and Religious Indifferentism to All Patriarchs, Primates, Archbishops, and Bishops of the Catholic World. Venerable Brothers, Greetings and Apostolic Benediction. 1. We think that you wonder why, from the time of our assuming the pontificate, we have not yet sent a letter to you as is customary and as our benevolence for you demanded. We wanted very much to address you by that voice by which we have been commanded, in the person of blessed Peter, to strengthen the brethren. 1. You know what storms of evil and toil, at the beginning of our pontificate, drove us suddenly into the depths of the sea. If the right hand of God had not given us strength, we would have drowned as the result of the terrible conspiracy of impious men. The mind recoils from renewing this by enumerating so many dangers. Instead we bless the Father of Consolation who, having overthrown all enemies, snatched us from the present danger. When he had calmed this violent storm, he gave us relief from fear. At once we decided to advise you on healing the wounds of Israel. But the mountain of concerns we needed to address in order to restore public order delayed us. 2. In the meantime we were again delayed because of the insolent and factious men who endeavored to raise the standard of treason. Eventually, we had to use our God-given authority to restrain the great obstinacy of these men with the rod. 2. Before we did, their unbridled rage seemed to grow from continued impunity and our considerable indulgence. For these reasons our duties have been heavy. 3. But when we had assumed our pontificate according to the custom and institution of our predecessors, and when all delays had been laid aside, we hastened to you. So we now present the letter and testimony of our goodwill toward you on this happy day, the Feast of the Assumption of the Virgin. Since she has been our patron and savior amid so many great calamities, we ask her assistance in writing to you and her counsels for the flock of Christ. 4. We come to you grieving and sorrowful because we know that you are concerned for the faith in these difficult times. Now is truly the time in which the powers of darkness winnow the elect like wheat. 3. The earth mourns and fades away, and the earth is infected by the inhabitants thereof, because they have transgressed the laws, they have changed the ordinances, they have broken the everlasting covenant. 4. 5. We speak of the things which you see with your own eyes which we both bemoan. Depravity exults, science is impudent, liberty dissolute. The holiness of the sacred is despised. The majesty of divine worship is not only disapproved by evil men, but defiled and held up to ridicule. Hence sound doctrine is perverted and errors of all kinds spread boldly. The laws of the sacred, the rites, institutions, and discipline, none are safe from the audacity of those speaking evil. Our Roman sea is harassed violently, and the bonds of unity are daily loosened and severed. The divine authority of the church is opposed, and her rights shorn off. She is subjected to human reason and with the greatest injustice exposed to the hatred of the people and reduced to vile servitude. The obedience to bishops is denied and their rights are trampled underfoot. Furthermore, academies and schools resound with new, monstrous opinions which openly attack the Catholic faith, this horrible and nefarious war is openly and even publicly waged. Thus, by institutions and by the example of teachers, the minds of the youth are corrupted and a tremendous blow is dealt to religion and the perversion of morals is spread. So the restraints of religion are thrown off, by which alone kingdoms stand. We see the destruction of public order, the fall of principalities, and the overturning of all legitimate power approaching. Indeed this great mass of calamities had its inception in the heretical societies and sects in which all that is sacrilegious, infamous, and blasphemous has gathered as bilge water in a ship's hold, a congealed mass of all filth. 6. These and many other serious things, which at present would take too long to list, but which you know well, cause our intense grief. It is not enough for us to deplore these innumerable evils unless we strive to uproot them. We take refuge in your faith and call upon your concern for the salvation of the Catholic flock. Your singular prudence and diligent spirit give us courage and console us, afflicted as we are with so many trials. 
We must raise our voice and attempt all things lest a wild boar from the woods should destroy the vineyard or wolves kill the flock. It is our duty to lead the flock only to the food which is healthful. In these evil and dangerous times, the shepherds must never neglect their duty. They must never be so overcome by fear that they abandon the sheep. Let them never neglect the flock and become sluggish from idleness and apathy. Therefore, united in spirit, let us promote our common cause, or more truly the cause of God. Let our vigilance be one and our effort united against the common enemies. 7. Indeed you will accomplish this perfectly if, as the duty of your office demands, you attend to yourselves and to doctrine and meditate on these words. The universal church is affected by any and every novelty. 5. And the admonition of Pope Agatho. Nothing of the things appointed ought to be diminished, nothing changed, nothing added, but they must be preserved both as regards expression and meaning. 6. Therefore may the unity which is built upon the sea of Peter as on a sure foundation stand firm. May it be for all a wall and a security, a safe port, and a treasury of countless blessings. 7. To check the audacity of those who attempt to infringe upon the rights of this holy see or to sever the union of the churches with the see of Peter, instill in your people a zealous confidence in the papacy and sincere veneration for it. As St. Cyprian wrote, He who abandons the see of Peter on which the church was founded, falsely believes himself to be a part of the church. 8. 8. In this you must labor and diligently take care that the faith may be preserved amidst this great conspiracy of impious men who attempt to tear it down and destroy it. May all remember the judgment concerning sound doctrine with which the people are to be instructed. Remember also that the government and administration of the whole church rests with the Roman pontiff to whom, in the words of the fathers of the Council of Florence, the full power of nourishing, ruling, and governing the universal church was given by Christ the Lord. 9. It is the duty of individual bishops to cling to the see of Peter faithfully, to guard the faith piously and religiously, and to feed their flock. It behooves priests to be subject to the bishops, whom they are to look upon as the parents of their souls, as Jerome admonishes. 10. Nor may the priests ever forget that they are forbidden by ancient canons to undertake ministry and to assume the tasks of teaching and preaching without the permission of their bishop to whom the people have been entrusted, and accounting for the souls of the people will be demanded from the bishop. 11. Finally let them understand that all those who struggle against this established order disturb the position of the church. 9. Furthermore, the discipline sanctioned by the church must never be rejected or be branded as contrary to certain principles of natural law. It must never be called crippled or imperfect or subject to civil authority. In this discipline the administration of sacred rights, standards of morality, and the reckoning of the rights of the church and her ministers are embraced. 10. To use the words of the fathers of Trent, it is certain that the church was instructed by Jesus Christ and his apostles and that all truth was daily taught it by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. 12. Therefore, it is obviously absurd and injurious to propose a certain restoration and regeneration for her as though necessary for her safety and growth, as if she could be considered subject to defect or obscuration or other misfortune. Indeed these authors of novelties consider that a foundation may be laid of a new human institution, and what Cyprian detested may come to pass, that what was a divine thing may become a human church. 13. Let those who devise such plans be aware that, according to the testimony of St. Leo, the right to grant dispensation from the canons is given only to the Roman pontiff. He alone, and no private person, can decide anything about the rules of the Church Fathers. As St. Gelasius writes, it is the papal responsibility to keep the canonical decrees in their place and to evaluate the precepts of previous popes so that when the times demand relaxation in order to rejuvenate the churches, they may be adjusted after diligent consideration. 14. 11. Now, however, we want you to rally to combat the abominable conspiracy against clerical celibacy. 
This conspiracy spreads daily and is promoted by profligate philosophers, some even from the clerical order. They have forgotten their person in office, and have been carried away by the enticements of pleasure. They have even dared to make repeated public demands to the princes for the abolition of that most holy discipline. But it is disgusting to dwell on these evil attempts at length. Rather, we ask that you strive with all your might to justify and to defend the law of clerical celibacy as prescribed by the sacred canons, against which the arrows of the lascivious are directed from every side. 12. Now the honorable marriage of Christians, which Paul calls a great sacrament in Christ and the Church. 15. Demands our shared concern lest anything contrary to its sanctity and indissolubility is proposed. Our predecessor Pius VIII would recommend to you his own letters on the subject. However, troublesome efforts against this sacrament still continue to be made. The people therefore must be zealously taught that a marriage rightly entered upon cannot be dissolved. For those joined in matrimony God has ordained a perpetual companionship for life and a knot of necessity which cannot be loosed except by death. Recalling that matrimony is a sacrament, and therefore subject to the church, let them consider and observe the laws of the church concerning it. Let them take care less for any reason they permit that which is an obstruction to the teachings of the canons and the decrees of the councils. They should be aware that those marriages will have an unhappy and which are entered upon contrary to the discipline of the church or without God's favor or because of concupiscence alone, with no thought of the sacrament and of the mysteries signified by it. 13. Now we consider another abundant source of the evils with which the church is afflicted at present, indifferentism. This perverse opinion is spread on all sides by the fraud of the wicked who claim that it is possible to obtain the eternal salvation of the soul by the profession of any kind of religion, as long as morality is maintained. Surely, in so clear a matter, you will drive this deadly error far from the people committed to your care. With the admonition of the apostle that there is one God, one faith, one baptism. 16. May those fear who contrive the notion that the safe harbor of salvation is open to persons of any religion whatever. They should consider the testimony of Christ himself that those who are not with Christ are against him. 17. And that they disperse unhappily who do not gather with him. Therefore, without a doubt, they will perish forever, unless they hold the Catholic faith whole and inviolate. 18. Let them hear Jerome who while the church was torn into three parts by schism, tells us that whenever someone tried to persuade him to join his group, he always exclaimed, He who is for the sea of Peter is for me. 19. A schismatic flatters himself falsely if he asserts that he, too, has been washed in the waters of regeneration. Indeed, Augustine would reply to such a man, The branch has the same form when it has been cut off from the vine, but of what profit for it is the form, if it does not live from the root? 20. 14. This shameful font of indifferentism gives rise to that absurd and erroneous proposition which claims that liberty of conscience must be maintained for everyone. It spreads ruin in sacred and civil affairs, though some repeat over and over again with the greatest impudence that some advantage accrues to religion from it. But the death of the soul is worse than freedom of error. As Augustine was wont to say, 21. When all restraints are removed by which men are kept on the narrow path of truth, their nature, which is already inclined to evil, propels them to ruin. Then truly, the bottomless pit, 22, is open from which John saw smoke ascending which obscured the sun, and out of which locusts flew forth to devastate the earth. Thence comes transformation of minds, corruption of youths, contempt of sacred things and holy laws, in other words, a pestilence more deadly to the state than any other. Experience Shows, even from earliest times, that cities renowned for wealth, dominion, and glory perished. As a result of this single evil, namely a moderate freedom of opinion, license of free speech, and desire for novelty. 15. Here we must include that harmful and never sufficiently denounce freedom to publish any writings whatever and disseminate them to the people, which some dare to demand and promote with so great a clamor. We are horrified to see what monstrous doctrines and prodigious errors are disseminated far and wide in countless books, pamphlets, 
and other writings which, though small in weight, are very great in malice. We are in tears at the abuse which proceeds from them over the face of the earth. Some are so carried away that they contentiously assert that the flock of errors arising from them is sufficiently compensated by the publication of some book which defends religion and truth. Every law condemns deliberately doing evil simply because there is some hope that good may result. Is there any sane man who would say poison ought to be distributed, sold publicly, stored, and even drunk because some antidote is available and those who use it may be snatched from? Death again and again? 16. The Church has always taken action to destroy the plague of bad books. This was true even in apostolic times for we read that the apostles themselves burned a large number of books. 23. It may be enough to consult the laws of the Fifth Council of the Lateran on this matter and the Constitution which Leo X published afterwards lest. That which has been discovered advantageous for the increase of the faith and the spread of useful arts be converted to the contrary use and work harm for the salvation of the faithful. 24. This also was of great concern to the fathers of Trent who applied a remedy against this great evil by publishing that wholesome decree concerning the index of books which contained false doctrine. 25. We must fight valiantly. Clement the Thirteenth says in an encyclical letter about the banning of bad books. As much as the matter itself demands and must exterminate the deadly poison of so many books, for never will the material for error be withdrawn, unless the Criminal sources of depravity perish in flames. 26. Thus it is evident that this holy see has always striven, throughout the ages, to condemn and to remove suspect and harmful books. The teaching of those who reject the censure of books as too heavy and onerous a burden causes immense harm to the Catholic people and to this see. They are even so depraved as to affirm that it is contrary to the principles of law and they deny the church the right to decree and to maintain it. 17. We have learned that certain teachings are being spread among the common people in writings which attack the trust and submission due to princes. The torches of treason are being lit everywhere. Care must be taken lest the people, being deceived, are led away from the straight path. May all recall, according to the admonition of the apostle, that there is no authority except from God. What authority there is has been appointed by God. Therefore he who resists authority resists the ordinances of God, and those who resist bring on themselves condemnation. 27. Therefore both divine and human laws cry out against those who strive by treason and sedition to drive the people from confidence in their princes and force them from their government. 18. And it is for this reason that the early Christians— lest they should be stained by such great infamy deserved well of the emperors and of the safety of the state even while persecution raged. This they proved splendidly by their fidelity in performing perfectly and promptly whatever they were commanded which was not opposed to their religion, and even more by their constancy and the shedding of their blood in battle. Christian soldiers, says St. Augustine, served an infidel emperor. When the issue of Christ was raised, they acknowledge no one but the one who is in heaven. They distinguished the eternal Lord from the temporal Lord, but were also subject to the temporal Lord for the sake of the eternal Lord. 28. St. Mauritius, the unconquered martyr and leader of the Theban legion, had this in mind when, as St. Eucarius reports, he answered the emperor in these words, We are your soldiers, emperor, but also servants of God, and this we confess freely, and now this final. Necessity of life has not driven us into rebellion. I see, we are armed and we do not resist, because we wish rather to die than to be killed. 29. Indeed the faith of the early Christians shines more brightly, if with Tertullian we consider that since the Christians were not lacking in numbers and in troops, they could have acted as foreign enemies. We are but of yesterday. He says, Yet we have filled all your cities, islands, fortresses, municipalities, assembly places, the camps themselves, the tribes, the divisions, the palace, the senate, the forum. For what war should we not have been fit and ready even if unequal in forces? We who are so glad to be cut to pieces, were it not, of course, that in our doctrine we would have been permitted more to be killed rather than to kill? If so great a multitude of people should have deserted to some remote spot on earth, 
it would surely have covered your domination with shame. Because of the loss of so many citizens, and it would even have punished you by this very desertion. Without a doubt you would have been terrified at your solitude. You would have sought whom you might rule. More enemies than citizens would have remained for you. Now however you have fewer enemies because of the multitude of Christians. 30. 19. These beautiful examples of the unchanging subjection to the princes necessarily proceeded from the most holy precepts of the Christian religion. They condemned the detestable insolence and improbity of those who, consumed with the unbridled lust for freedom, are entirely devoted to impairing and destroying all rights of dominion while bringing servitude to the people under the slogan of liberty. Here surely belong the infamous and wild plans of the Waldensians, the Beghards, the Wycliffites, and other such sons of Belial, who were the sores and disgrace of the human race. They often received a richly deserved anathema from the Holy See. For no other reason do experienced deceivers devote their efforts, except so that they, along with Luther, might joyfully deem themselves free of all. To attain this end more easily and quickly, they undertake with audacity any infamous plan whatever. 20. Nor can we predict happier times for religion and government from the plans of those who desire vehemently to separate the church from the state and to break the mutual concord between temporal authority and the priesthood. It is certain that that concord which always was favorable and beneficial for the sacred and the civil order is feared by the shameless lovers of liberty. 21. But for the other painful causes we are concerned about, you should recall that certain societies and assemblages seem to draw up a battle line together with the followers of every false religion and cult. They feign piety for religion, but they are driven by a passion for promoting novelties and sedition everywhere. They preach liberty of every sort. They stir up disturbances in sacred and civil affairs, and pluck authority to pieces. 22. We write these things to you with grieving mind but trusting in him who commands the winds and makes them still. Take up the shield of faith and fight the battles of the Lord vigorously. You especially must stand as a wall against every height which raises itself against the knowledge of God. Unsheath the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, and may those who hunger after justice receive bread from you. Having been called so that you might be diligent cultivators in the vineyard of the Lord, do this one thing, and labor in it together, so that every root of bitterness may be removed from your field, all seeds of vice destroyed, and a happy crop of virtues may take root and grow. The first to be embraced with paternal affection are those who apply themselves to the sacred sciences and to philosophical studies. For them may you be exhorter and supporter less trusting only in their own talents and strength, they may imprudently wander away from the path of truth onto the road of the impious. Let them remember that God is the guide to wisdom and the director of the wise. 31. It is impossible to know God without God who teaches men to know himself by his word. 32. It is the proud, or rather foolish, Men who examine the mysteries of faith which surpass all understanding with the faculties of the human mind, and rely on human reason which by the condition of man's nature is weak and infirm. 23. May our dear sons in Christ, the princes, support these our desires for the welfare of church and state with their resources and authority. May they understand that they receive their authority not only for the government of the world, but especially for the defense of the church. They should diligently consider that whatever work they do for the welfare of the church accrues to their rule and peace. Indeed, let them persuade themselves that they owe more to the cause of the faith than to their kingdom. Let them consider it something very great for themselves as we say with Pope St. Leo. If in addition to their royal diadem the crown of faith may be added, placed as if they were parents and teachers of the people, they will bring them true peace and tranquility if they take special care that religion and piety remain safe. God, after all, calls himself King of Kings and Lord of Lords. 24. That all of this may come to pass prosperously and happily, let us raise our eyes and hands to the Most Holy Virgin Mary, who alone crushes all heresies, and is our greatest reliance and the whole reason for our hope. 33. May she implore by her patronage a successful outcome for our plans and actions.
let us humbly ask of the Prince of the Apostles, Peter and his co-apostle Paul, that all of you may stand as a wall lest a foundation be laid other than that which has already been laid. Relying on this happy hope, we trust that the author and crown of our faith Jesus Christ will console us in all these our tribulations. We lovingly impart the apostolic benediction to you, venerable brothers, and to the sheep committed to your care as a sign of heavenly aid. Given in Rome at St. Mary Major, on August 15th, the Feast of the Assumption of the Virgin, in the year of our Lord 1832, the second year of our pontificate. Caploribus On Faith and Religion Pope B.I. Pius IX, 1846 To all patriarchs, primates, archbishops, and bishops. Venerable brothers, we greet you and give you our apostolic blessing. For many years past we strove with you, venerable brothers, to devote our best powers to our episcopal office, an office full of labor and worry. We strove to feed those committed to our care on the mountains of Israel, at its streams and in its richest pastures. Our illustrious predecessor, Gregory XVI, whose famous actions are recorded in the annals of the Church in letters of gold, will surely be remembered and admired by future generations. Now though, upon his death, by the mysterious plan of divine providence, we have been raised to the supreme pontificate. We did not purpose this nor expect it. Indeed our reaction is great disquietude and anxiety. For if the burden of the apostolic ministry is rightly considered to be at all times exceedingly heavy and beset with dangers, it is to be dreaded most particularly in these times which are so critical for the Christian commonwealth. 2. We are well aware of our weakness. So when we reflect on the most serious duties of the supreme apostolate especially in a period of great instability, we would simply have fallen into great sadness, did we not place all our hope in God who is our Savior. For He never abandons those who hope in Him. Time and again, so as to demonstrate what His power can accomplish, He employs weak instruments to rule His church. In this way, all men may increasingly realize that it is God Himself who governs and protects the church with His wonderful providence. We are also greatly supported by the comforting consideration that we have you, venerable brothers, as our helpers and companions in the work of saving souls. For since you have been called to share a portion of our care, you strive to fulfill your ministry with attentiveness and zeal, and to fight the good fight. 3. For this reason, as soon as we were placed, despite our unworthiness, on this high sea of the Prince of the Apostles as the representative of the blessed Peter, and received from the eternal prince of pastors himself the most serious divinely given office of feeding and ruling not only the lambs, that is, the whole Christian people, but also the sheep, that is, the bishops. We surely had no greater wish than to address you all with a deep feeling of love. Therefore, since we have now assumed the supreme pontificate in our Lateran Basilica, we are sending this letter to you without delay, in accordance with the established practice of our predecessors. Its purpose is to urge that you keep the night watches over the flock entrusted to your care with the greatest possible eagerness, wakefulness, and effort, and that you raise a protecting wall before the house of Israel. Do these as you battle with episcopal strength and steadfastness like good soldiers of Christ Jesus against the hateful enemy of the human race. 4. Each of you has noticed, venerable brothers, that a very bitter and fearsome war against the whole Catholic commonwealth is being stirred up by men bound together in a lawless alliance. These men do not preserve sound doctrine, but turn their hearing from the truth. They eagerly attempt to produce from their darkness all sorts of prodigious beliefs, and then to magnify them with all their strength, and to publish them and spread them among ordinary people. We shudder indeed and suffer bitter pain when we reflect on all their outlandish errors and their many harmful methods plots and contrivances. These men use these means to spread their hatred for truth and light. They are experienced and skillful in deceit, which they use to set in motion their plans to quench people's zeal for piety, justice and virtue, to corrupt morals, to cast all divine and human laws into confusion, and to weaken and even possibly overthrow the Catholic religion and civil society. For you know, 
venerable brothers, that these bitter enemies of the Christian name are carried wretchedly along by some blind momentum of their mad impiety. They go so far in their rash imagining as to teach without blushing, openly and publicly, daring and unheard of doctrines, thereby uttering blasphemies against God. 1. They teach that the most holy mysteries of our religion are fictions of human invention, and that the teaching of the Catholic Church is opposed to the good and the prerogatives of human society. They are not even afraid to deny Christ himself and God. 5. In order to easily mislead the people into making errors, deceiving particularly the imprudent and the inexperienced, they pretend that they alone know the ways to prosperity. They claim for themselves without hesitation the name of philosophers. They feel as if philosophy, which is wholly concerned with the search for truth in nature, ought to reject those truths which God himself, the supreme and merciful creator of nature, has deigned to make plain to men as a special gift. With these truths, mankind can gain true happiness and salvation. So, by means of an obviously ridiculous and extremely specious kind of argumentation, these enemies never stop invoking the power and excellence of human reason. They raise it up against the most holy faith of Christ, and they blather with great foolhardiness that this faith is opposed to human reason. 6. Without doubt, nothing more insane than such a doctrine, nothing more impious or more opposed to reason itself could be devised. For although faith is above reason, no real disagreement or opposition can ever be found between them. This is because both of them come from the same greatest source of unchanging and eternal truth, God. They give such reciprocal help to each other that true reason shows, maintains and protects the truth of the faith, while faith frees reason from all errors and wondrously enlightens, strengthens and perfects reason with the knowledge of divine matters. 7. It is with no less deceit, venerable brothers, that other enemies of divine revelation, with reckless and sacrilegious effrontery, want to import the doctrine of human progress into the Catholic religion. They extol it with the highest praise, as if religion itself were not of God but the work of men, or a philosophical discovery which can be perfected by human means. The charge which Tertullian justly made against the philosophers of his own time, who brought forward a Stoic and a Platonic and a dialectical Christianity. 2 can very aptly apply to those men who rave so pitiably. Our holy religion was not invented by human reason, but was most mercifully revealed by God. Therefore, one can quite easily understand that religion itself acquires all its power from the authority of God who made the revelation, and that it can never be arrived at or perfected by human reason. In order not to be deceived and go astray in a matter of such great importance, Human reason should indeed carefully investigate the fact of divine revelation. Having done this, one would be definitely convinced that God has spoken and therefore would show him rational obedience, as the Apostle very wisely teaches. 3. For who can possibly not know that all faith should be given to the words of God and that it is in the fullest agreement with reason itself to accept and strongly support doctrines which it has determined to have been revealed by God? who can neither deceive nor be deceived? 8. But how many wonderful and shining proofs are ready at hand to convince the human reason in the clearest way that the religion of Christ is divine and that the whole principle of our doctrines has taken root from the Lord of the heavens above. Wink with the frown for, therefore nothing exists more definite, more settled or more holy than our faith, which rests on the strongest. Foundations. This faith, which teaches for life and points towards salvation, which casts out all vices and is the fruitful mother and nurse of the virtues, has been established by the birth, life, death, resurrection, wisdom, wonders and prophecies of Christ Jesus, its divine author and perfecter, shining forth in all directions with the light of teaching from on high and enriched with the treasures of heavenly wealth. This faith grew famed and notable by the foretellings of so many prophets, the luster of so many miracles, the steadfastness of so many martyrs, and the glory of so many saints. It made known the saving laws of Christ and gaining in strength daily even when it was most cruelly persecuted. It made its way over the whole world by land and sea, from the sun's rising to its setting, under the single standard of the cross. The deceit of idols was cast down, and the mist of errors was scattered. 
by the defeat of all kinds of enemies, this faith enlightened with divine knowledge all peoples, races, and nations, no matter how barbarous and savage, or how different in character, morals, laws, and ways of life. It brought them under the sweet yoke of Christ himself by proclaiming peace and good tidings to all men. 9. Now, surely all these events shine with such divine wisdom and power that anyone who considers them will easily understand that the Christian faith is the work of God. Human reason knows clearly from these striking and certain proofs that God is the author of this faith. Therefore it is unable to advance further but should offer all obedience to this faith casting aside completely every problem and hesitation. Human reason is convinced that it is God who has given everything the faith proposes to men for belief and behavior. 10. This consideration too clarifies the great error of those others as well who boldly venture to explain and interpret the words of God by their own judgment, misusing their reason and holding the opinion that these words are like a human work. God himself has set up a living authority to establish and teach the true and legitimate meaning of his heavenly revelation. This authority judges infallibly all disputes which concern matters of faith and morals, lest the faithful be swirled around by every wind of doctrine which springs from the evilness of men in encompassing error. And this living infallible authority is active only in that church which was built by Christ the Lord upon Peter, the head of the entire church, leader and shepherd, whose faith he promised would never fail. This church has had an unbroken line of succession from Peter himself. These legitimate pontiffs are the heirs and defenders of the same teaching, rank, office, and power. And the church is where Peter is, five, and Peter speaks. In the Roman pontiff, six, living at all times in his successors and making judgment, seven, providing the truth of the faith to those who seek it, 8. The divine words therefore mean what this Roman see of the most blessed Peter holds and has held. 11. For this mother and teacher, 9. Of all the churches has always preserved entire and unharmed the faith entrusted to it by Christ the Lord. Furthermore, it has taught it to the faithful, showing all men truth and the path of salvation. Since all priesthood originates in this church, 10. The entire substance of the Christian religion resides there also. 11. The leadership of the apostolic see has always been active. 12. And therefore because of its preeminent authority, the whole church must agree with it. The faithful who live in every place constitute the whole church. 13. Whoever does not gather with this church scatters. 14. 12. We, therefore, placed inscrutably by God upon this chair of truth, eagerly call forth in the Lord your outstanding piety, venerable brothers. We urge you to strive carefully and zealously to continually warn and exhort the faithful entrusted to your care to hold to these first principles. Urge them never to allow themselves to be deceived and led into error by men who have become abominable in their pursuits. These men attempt to destroy faith on the pretext of human progress, subjecting it in an impious manner to reason and changing the meaning of the words of God. Such men do not shrink from the greatest insults to God himself who cares for the good and the salvation of men by means of his heavenly religion. 13. You already know well, venerable brothers, the other portentous errors and deceits by which the sons of this world try most bitterly to attack the Catholic religion and the divine authority of the Church and its laws. They would even trample underfoot the rights both of the sacred and of the civil power. For this is the goal of the lawless activities against this Roman see in which Christ placed the impregnable foundation of his church. This is the goal of those secret sects who have come forth from the darkness to destroy and desolate both the sacred and the civil commonwealth. These have been condemned with repeated anathema in the apostolic letters of the Roman pontiffs who preceded us. 15. We now confirm these with the fullness of our apostolic power and command that they be most carefully observed. 14. This is the goal too of the crafty Bible societies which renew the old skill of the heretics and ceaselessly force on people of all kinds, even the uneducated, gifts of the Bible. They issue these in large numbers and at great cost, in vernacular translations, which infringe the holy rules of the church. The commentaries which are included often contain perverse explanations. So, 
having rejected divine tradition, the doctrine of the fathers and the authority of the Catholic Church, they all interpret the words of the Lord by their own private judgment, thereby perverting their meaning. As a result, they fall into the greatest errors. Gregory the Sixteenth of happy memory, our superior predecessor, followed the lead of his own predecessors in rejecting these societies in his apostolic letters. 16. It is our will to condemn them likewise. 15. Also perverse is the shocking theory that it makes no difference to which religion one belongs, a theory which is greatly at variance even with reason. By means of this theory, those crafty men remove all distinction between virtue and vice, truth and error, honorable and vile action. They pretend that men can gain eternal salvation by the practice of any religion, as if there could ever be any sharing between justice and iniquity, any collaboration between light and darkness, or any agreement between Christ and Belial. 16. The sacred celibacy of clerics has also been the victim of conspiracy. Indeed, some churchmen have wretchedly forgotten their own rank and let themselves be converted by the charms and snares of pleasure. This is the aim too of the prevalent but wrong method of teaching, especially in the philosophical disciplines, a method which deceives and corrupts incautious youth in a wretched manner and gives it as drink the poison of the serpent in the goblet of Babylon. To this goal also tends the unspeakable doctrine of communism, as it is called, a doctrine most opposed to the very natural law. For if this doctrine were accepted, the complete destruction of everyone's laws, government, property, and even of human society itself would follow. 17. To this end also tend the most dark designs of men in the clothing of sheep, while inwardly ravening wolves. They humbly recommend themselves by means of a feigned and deceitful appearance of a purer piety, a stricter virtue and discipline. After taking their captives gently, they mildly bind them, and then kill them in secret. They make men fly in terror from all practice of religion, and they cut down and dismember the sheep of the Lord. To this end, finally, to omit other dangers which are too well known to you, tends the widespread disgusting infection from books and pamphlets which teach the lessons of sinning. These works, well written and filled with deceit and cunning, are scattered at immense cost through every region for the destruction of the Christian people. They spread pestilential doctrines everywhere and deprave the minds especially of the imprudent, occasioning great losses for religion. 18. As a result of this filthy medley of errors which creeps in from every side, and as the result of the unbridled license to think, speak and write, we see the following, morals deteriorated, Christ's most holy religion despised, the majesty of divine worship rejected, the power of this apostolic see plundered, the authority of the church attacked and reduced to base slavery, the rights of bishops trampled on, the sanctity of marriage infringed, the rule of every government violently, shaken and many other losses for both the Christian and the civil commonwealth. Venerable brothers, we are compelled to weep and share in your lament that this is the case. 19. Therefore, in this great crisis for religion, because we are greatly concerned for the salvation of all the Lord's flock and in fulfillment of the duty of our apostolic ministry, we shall certainly leave no measure untried in our vigorous effort to secure the good of the whole Christian family. Indeed, we especially call forth in the Lord your own illustrious piety, virtue and prudence, venerable brothers. With these and relying on heavenly aid, you may fearlessly defend the cause of God and His holy church as befits your station and the office for which you are marked. You must fight energetically, since you know very well what great wounds the undefiled spouse of Christ Jesus has suffered and how vigorous is the destructive attack of her enemies. You must also care for and defend the Catholic faith with episcopal strength, and see that the flock entrusted to you stands to the end firm and unmoved in the faith. For unless one preserves the faith entire and uninjured, he will without doubt perish forever. 17. 20. So, in accordance with your pastoral care, Work assiduously to protect and preserve this faith. Never cease to instruct all men in it, to encourage the wavering, to convince dissenters, to strengthen the weak in faith by never tolerating and letting pass anything which could in the slightest degree defile the purity of this faith. With the same great strength of mind, 
foster in all men their unity with the Catholic Church, outside of which there is no salvation, also foster their obedience towards the See of Peter on which rests the entire structure of our most holy religion. See to it with similar firmness that the most holy laws of the Church are observed, for it is by these laws that virtue, religion, and piety particularly thrive and flourish. 21. It is an act of great piety to expose the concealments of the impious and to defeat there the devil himself, whose slaves they are. 18. Therefore we entreat you to use every means of revealing to your faithful people the many kinds of plot, pretense, error, deceit, and contrivance which our enemies use. This will turn them carefully away from infectious books. Also exhort them unceasingly to flee from the sects and societies of the impious as from the presence of a serpent earnestly avoiding everything which is at variance with the wholeness of faith, religion, and morality. Therefore, never stop preaching the gospel, so that the Christian people may grow in the knowledge of God by being daily better versed in the most holy precepts of the Christian law. As a result, they may turn from evil, do good, and walk in the ways of the Lord. You know that you are acting as deputies for Christ, who is meek and humble, and who came not to call the just but sinners. This is the example that we should follow. When you find someone disregarding the commandments and wandering from the path of truth and justice, rebuke them in the spirit of mildness and meekness with paternal warnings. Accuse, entreat, and reprove them with all kindness, patience, and doctrine. Often benevolence towards those who are to be corrected achieves more than severity, exhortation more than threats, and love more than power. 19. 22. Strive to instruct the faithful to follow after love and search for peace, diligently pursuing the works of love and peace so that they may love one another with reciprocal charity. They should abolish all disagreements, enmities, rivalries, and animosities, thus achieving compatibility. Take pains to impress on the Christian people a due obedience and subjection to rulers and governments. Do this by teaching, in accordance with the warning of the Apostle, 20. That all authority comes from God. Whoever resists authority resists the ordering made by God himself, consequently achieving his own condemnation. Disobeying authority is always sinful except when an order is given which is opposed to the laws of God and the church. 23. However, priests are the best examples of piety and God's worship. 21. And people tend generally to be of the same quality as their priests. Therefore devote the greatest care and zeal to making the clergy resplendent for the earnestness of their morals, the integrity, holiness, and wisdom of their lives. Let the ecclesiastical training be zealously preserved in compliance with the sacred canons, and whenever it has been neglected, let it be restored to its former splendor. Therefore, as you are well aware, you must take the utmost care, as the Apostle commands, not to impose hands on anyone in haste. Consecrate with holy orders and promote to the performance of the sacred mysteries only those who have been carefully examined and who are virtuous and wise. They can consequently benefit and ornament your diocese. 24. These are men who avoid everything which is forbidden to clerics, devoting their time instead to reading, exhorting and teaching. An example to the faithful in word, manner of life, in charity, in faith, in chastity. 22. They win the highest respect from all men, and fashion, summon forth and inspire the people with the Christian way of life. For it would certainly be better. As Benedict the Fourteenth, our predecessor of undying memory very wisely advises, to have fewer ministers if they be upright, suitable and useful, than many who are likely to accomplish nothing at all for the building up of the body of Christ, which is the Church. 23. You must examine with greater diligence the morals and the knowledge of men who are entrusted with the care and guidance of souls, that they may be eager to continuously feed and assist the people entrusted to them by the administration of the sacraments, the preaching of God's word and the example of good works. They should be zealous in molding them to the whole plan and pattern of a religious way of life, and in leading them on to the path of salvation. 25. When ministers are ignorant or neglectful of their duty, then the morals of the people also immediately decline, Christian discipline grows slack, the practice of religion is dislodged and cast aside, 
and every vice and corruption is easily introduced into the church. The word of God, which was uttered for the salvation of souls, is living, efficacious and more piercing than a two-edged sword. 24. So that it may not prove to be unfruitful through the fault of its ministers, never cease, venerable brothers, from encouraging the preachers of this divine word to carry out most religiously the ministry of the gospel. This should not be carried out by the persuasive words of human wisdom, nor by the profane seductive guise of empty and ambitious eloquence, but rather as a demonstration of the spirit and power. 26. Consequently, by presenting the word of truth properly and by preaching not themselves but Christ crucified, they should clearly proclaim in their preaching the tenets and precepts of our most holy religion in accordance with the teaching of the Catholic Church and the Fathers. They should explain precisely the particular duties of individuals, frighten them from vice, and inspire them with a love of piety. In this way the faithful will avoid all vices and pursue virtues, and so will be able to escape eternal punishment and gain heavenly glory. 27. In your pastoral care, continuously urge all ecclesiastics to think seriously of their holy ministry. Urge them to carefully fulfill their duties to greatly love the beauty of God's house, to urgently pray and entreat with deep piety, and to say the canonical hours of the breviary as the church commands. By these means they will be able both to pray efficaciously for God's help in fulfilling the heavy demands of their duty, and to graciously reconcile God and the Christian people. 28. You know that suitable ministers can only come from clergy who are very well trained, and that the proper training greatly influences the whole future life of clerics. Therefore, continually strive to ensure that young clerics are properly molded even from their earliest years. They should be molded not only in piety and real virtue, but also in literature and the stricter disciplines, especially the sacred ones. So your greatest desire should be, in obedience to the prescript of the fathers at Trent, 25, to set up skillfully and energetically, seminaries if they do not yet exist. If necessary, expand those already established, supplying them with the best directors and teachers. Watch continuously and zealously that the young clerics in them are educated in a holy and religious manner, in the fear of the Lord and in ecclesiastical discipline. See that they are carefully and thoroughly improved, especially by the sacred. Sciences, according to Catholic doctrine, far from all danger of any error they should also be improved by the traditions of the Church and the writings of the Holy Fathers, as well as by sacred ceremonies and rites. Thus you will have energetic, industrious workers endowed with an ecclesiastical spirit, properly prepared by their studies, who in time will be able to tend the Lord's field carefully and fight strenuously in the Lord's battles. 29. Furthermore, you realize that spiritual exercises contribute greatly to the preservation of the dignity and holiness of ecclesiastical orders. Therefore do not neglect to promote this work of salvation and to advise and exhort all clergy to often retreat to a suitable place for making these exercises. Laying aside external cares and being free to meditate zealously on eternal divine matters, they will be able to wipe away stains caused by the dust of the world and renew their ecclesiastical spirit and stripping off the old man and his deeds, they will put on the new man who was created in justice and holiness. 30. Do not regret that we have spoken at length on the education and training of the clergy. For you are very well aware many men are weary of the difference, instability, and changing nature of their errors, and therefore want to profess our most holy religion. These men, with God's good help, will more easily embrace and practice the teaching precepts and way of life of this religion if they see that the clergy surpass all others in their piety, integrity and wisdom, and in the noble example they give of all the virtues. 31. We recognize your many worthy attributes, your burning charity towards God and men, your exalted love of the church, your almost angelic virtues, your episcopal bravery, and your prudence. Being inspired to do His holy will, you are all followers in the footsteps of the apostles. As bishops, you are the deputies, and thus the imitators of Christ. In your harmonious pursuits you have become a sincere model for your flock, and you enlighten your clergy and faithful people with the splendor of your sanctity. 
In your compassionate mercy you seek out and overtake with your love the straying and perishing sheep, as the shepherd in the gospel did. You place them paternally on your shoulders and lead them back to the fold. At no time do you spare either cares or plans or toils in religiously fulfilling your pastoral duties and defending all our beloved sheep who, redeemed by Christ, have been entrusted to your care. From the rage, assault, and snares of ravening wolves, you keep them away from poisonous. Pasture land and drive them on to safe ground, and in all possible ways you lead them by deed, word, and example to the harbor of eternal salvation. 32. Therefore, to assure the greater glory of God and the Church, venerable brothers, join together with all eagerness, care and wakefulness to repulse error and to root out vice. When this is accomplished, faith, religion, piety and virtue will increase daily. Then all the faithful, as sons of light, casting aside the works of darkness, may walk worthily, pleasing God in all things and being fruitful in every good work. And in the very great straits, difficulties and dangers which must beset your serious ministry as bishops, especially in these times, do not ever be terrified. Rather, be comforted by the strength of the Lord, who looks down on us who carry out his work, approves those who are willing, aids those who do battle, and crowns those who conquer. 26. 33. Nothing is more pleasing to us than to assist you, whom we love, with affection advice, and exertion. We devote ourselves wholeheartedly together with you to protect and spread the glory of God and the Catholic faith. We also endeavor to save souls for whom we are ready to sacrifice life itself, should it be necessary. Come to us as often as you feel the need of the aid, help and protection of our authority, and that of this see. 34. We hope that our political leaders will keep in mind, in accordance with their piety and religion, that The kingly power has been conferred on them not only for ruling the world but especially for the protection of the church. 27. Sometimes we act both for the sake of their rule and safety that they may possess their provinces by peaceful right. 28. We hope that with their aid and authority they will support the objects, plans, and pursuits which we have in common, and that they will also defend the liberty and safety of the church, so that the right hand of Christ may also defend their rule. 29. 35. We hope that all these matters may turn out well and happily. Let us together entreat God in urgent and unceasing prayers, to make up for our weakness by an abundance of every heavenly grace, to overwhelm with his all-powerful strength those who attack us, and to increase everywhere faith, piety, devotion, and peace. Then when all enemies and errors have been overcome, his holy church may enjoy the tranquility it so greatly desires. Then too there may be one fold and one shepherd. 36. That the Lord may more readily respond to us, let us call as intercessor her who is always with him, the Most Holy Virgin Mary, Immaculate Mother of God. She is the most sweet mother of us all. She is our mediatrix, advocate, firmest hope, and greatest source of confidence. Furthermore, her patronage with God is strongest and most efficacious. Let us invoke to the Prince of the Apostles to whom Christ himself gave the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whom he made the rock of his church, against which the gates of hell will never prevail. Let us also invoke his fellow Apostle Paul, and all the heavenly saints who are already crowned and hold the palm of victory. We ask that they implore for all Christians the abundance of divine favor which they desire. 37. Finally, as an augury of all the heavenly gifts and as witness of our great charity towards you, receive the apostolic blessing which from deep in our heart we most lovingly impart to yourselves, venerable brothers, and to all clerics and the faithful laity who are entrusted to your care. Given in Rome at St. Mary Majors on the 9th of November 1846 in the first year of our pontificate. The Syllabus of Errors Pope B.I. Pius IX, 1864 I. Pantheism, Naturalism and Absolute Rationalism 1. There exists no supreme, all-wise, all-provident divine being, distinct from the universe, 
and God is identical with the nature of things, and is, therefore, subject to changes. In effect, God is produced in man and in the world, and all things are God and have the very substance of God, and God is one and the same thing with the world, and therefore, spirit with matter, necessity with liberty, good with evil, justice with injustice. Allocution. Maxima Cadem. June 9, 1862. 2. All action of God upon man and the world is to be denied. Ibid. 3. Human reason, without any reference whatsoever to God, is the sole arbiter of truth and falsehood, and of good and evil. It is law to itself, and suffices, by its natural force, to secure the welfare of men and of nations. Ibid. 4. All the truths of religion proceed from the innate strength of human reason. Hence reason is the ultimate standard by which man can and ought to arrive at the knowledge of all truths of every kind. Ibid, an encyclical. Capluribus. November 9, 1846, etc. 5. Divine revelation is imperfect, and therefore subject to a continual and indefinite progress, corresponding with the advancement of human reason. Ibid. 6. The faith of Christ is in opposition to human reason and divine revelation not only is not useful, but is even hurtful to the perfection of man. Ibid. 7. The prophecies and miracles set forth and recorded in the sacred scriptures are the fiction of poets, and the mysteries of the Christian faith the result of philosophical investigations. In the books of the Old and the New Testament there are contained mythical inventions, and Jesus Christ is himself a myth. 2. Moderate Rationalism 8. As human reason is placed on a level with religion itself, so theological must be treated in the same manner as philosophical sciences. Allocution. Singulari Quad Am. December 9, 1854. 9. All the dogmas of the Christian religion are indiscriminately the object of natural science or philosophy, and human reason, enlightened solely in an historical way, is able, by its own natural strength and principles, to attain to the true science of even the most abstruse dogmas, provided only that such dogmas be proposed to reason itself as its object. Letters to the Archbishop of Munich Brevissimus Inter December 11, 1862 and Tuas Lebenter December 21, 1863 10. As the philosopher is one thing, and philosophy another, so it is the right and duty of the philosopher to subject himself to the authority which he shall have proved to be true, but philosophy either can nor ought to submit to any such authority. Ibid. December 11, 1862 11. The Church not only ought never to pass judgment on philosophy, but ought to tolerate the errors of philosophy, leaving it to correct itself. Ibid. December 21, 1863 12. The decrees of the Apostolic See and of the Roman congregations impede the true progress of science. Ibid. 13. The method and principles by which the old scholastic doctors cultivated theology are no longer suitable to the demands of our times and to the progress of the sciences. Ibid. 14. Philosophy is to be treated without taking any account of supernatural revelation. Ibid. 3. Indifferentism, Latitudinarianism. 15. Every man is free to embrace and profess that religion which, guided by the light of reason, he shall consider true. Allocution. Maxima Cadem. June 9, 1862. Dam Maschio. Multiplices Inter. June 10, 1851. 16. Man may, in the observance of any religion whatever, find the way of eternal salvation and arrive at eternal salvation. Encyclical. Capluribus. November 9, 1846. 17. Good hope at least is to be entertained of the eternal salvation of all those who are not at all in the true Church of Christ. Encyclical. Quanto Confishimer. August 10, 1863, etc. 18. Protestantism is nothing more than another form of the same true Christian religion 
in which form it is given to please God equally as in the Catholic Church. Encyclical. Nausitis. December 8, 1849. 4. Socialism, Communism, Secret Societies, Biblical Societies, Clerico-Liberal Societies. Pests of this kind are frequently reprobated in the severest terms in the encyclical. Caploribus. November 9, 1846, Allocution. Cabus Quantiste. April 20, 1849, Encyclical. Nasidus et Nobiscum. December 8, 1849, Allocution. Singulari Quad Am. December 9, 1854, Encyclical. Quanto Confishimer. August 10, 1863. V. Errors Concerning the Church and Her Rights. 19. The Church is not a true and perfect society, entirely free nor is she endowed with proper and perpetual rights of her own, conferred upon her by her divine founder, but it appertains to the civil power to define what are the rights of the Church, and the limits within which she may exercise those rights. Allocution. Singulari quadam, end quote, December 9, 1854, etc. 20. The ecclesiastical power ought not to exercise its authority without the permission and assent of the civil government. Allocution. Memonet unesquisque. September 30, 1861. 21. The Church has not the power of defining dogmatically that the religion of the Catholic Church is the only true religion. Damascio. Multiplices in Tur. June 10, 1851. 22. The obligation by which Catholic teachers and authors are strictly bound is confined to those things only which are proposed to universal belief as dogmas of faith by the infallible judgment of the Church. Letter to the Archbishop of Munich. To his Lebenter. December 21, 1863. 23. Roman pontiffs and ecumenical councils have wandered outside the limits of their powers, have usurped the rights of princes and have even erred in defining matters of faith and morals. Damascio. Multiplices in Tur. June 10, 1851. 24. The Church has not the power of using force, nor has she any temporal power, direct or indirect. Apostolic Letter. Ad Apostolic E. August 22, 1851. 25. Besides the power inherent in the episcopate, other temporal power has been attributed to it by the civil authority granted either explicitly or tacitly, which on that account is revocable by the civil authority whenever it thinks fit. Ibid. 26. The Church has no innate and legitimate right of acquiring and possessing property. Allocution. Numquam 4. December 15, 1856. Encyclical. Incredibly. September 7, 1863. 27. The sacred ministers of the Church and the Roman Pontiff are to be absolutely excluded from every charge and dominion over temporal affairs. Allocution. Maxima Cadem. June 9, 1862. 28. It is not lawful for bishops to publish even letters apostolic without the permission of government. Allocution. Numquam 4. December 15, 1856. 29. Favors granted by the Roman pontiff ought to be considered null, unless they have been sought for through the civil government. Ibid. 30. The immunity of the church and of ecclesiastical persons derived its origin from civil law. Damascio. Multiplices in Tur. June 10, 1851. 31. The ecclesiastical forum or tribunal for the temporal causes, whether civil or criminal, of clerics, ought by all means to be abolished, even without consulting and against the protest of the Holy See. Allocution. Numquam 4. December 15, 1856. Allocution. Acerbissimum. September. 27, 1852. 32. The personal immunity by which clerics are exonerated from military conscription and service in the army may be abolished without violation either of natural right or equity. Its abolition is called for by civil progress, especially in a society framed on the model of a liberal government. 
Letter to the Bishop of Monreal. Singularis Nobisque. September 29, 1864. 33. It does not appertain exclusively to the power of ecclesiastical jurisdiction by right, proper and innate, to direct the teaching of theological questions. Letter to the Archbishop of Munich. Tuas Lebenter. December 21, 1863. 34. The teaching of those who compare the sovereign pontiff to a prince, free and acting in the universal church, is a doctrine which prevailed in the Middle Ages. Apostolic Letter. Ad Apostolic E. August 22, 1851. 35. There is nothing to prevent the decree of a general council, or the act of all peoples, from transferring the supreme pontificate from the bishop and city of Rome to another bishop and another city. Ibid. 36. The definition of a national council does not admit of any subsequent discussion, and the civil authority car assumed this principle as the basis of its acts. Ibid. 37. National churches, withdrawn from the authority of the Roman pontiff and altogether separated, can be established. Allocution. Multiscravabusque. December 17, 1860. 38. The Roman pontiffs have, by their too arbitrary conduct, contributed to the division of the church into eastern and western. Apostolic Letter. Ad Apostolic E. August 22, 1851. 6. Errors about civil society, considered both in itself and in its relation to the church. 39. The state, as being the origin and source of all rights, is endowed with a certain right not circumscribed by any limits. Allocution. Maxima Cadem. June 9, 1862. 40. The teaching of the Catholic Church is hostile to the well-being and interests of society. Encyclical. Capluribus. November 9, 1846. Allocution. Cabus Quantisque. April 20, 1849. 41. The civil government, even when in the hands of an infidel sovereign, has a right to an indirect negative power over religious affairs. It therefore possesses not only the right called that of exequator, but also that of appeal called appellatio of abusu, apostolic letter, ad apostolic e, August 22, 1851. 42. In the case of conflicting laws enacted by the two powers, the civil law prevails. Ibid. 43. The secular dower has authority to rescind, declare and render null, solemn conventions, commonly called concordats, entered into with the apostolic see, regarding the use of rights appertaining to ecclesiastical immunity, without the consent of the apostolic see, and even in spite of its protest. Allocution. Multiscravabusque. December 17, 1860. Allocution. Inconsistoriali. November 1, 1850. 44. The civil authority may interfere in matters relating to religion, morality, and spiritual government. Hence, it can pass judgment on the instructions issued for the guidance of consciences, conformably with their mission, by the pastors of the church. Further, it has the right to make enactments regarding the administration of the divine sacraments, and the dispositions necessary for receiving them. Allocutions. In Consistoriali, November 1, 1850, and Maxima Cadem, June 9, 1862. 45. The entire government of public schools in which the youth of a Christian state is educated, except, to a certain extent, in the case of episcopal seminaries, may and ought to appertain to the civil power and belong to it so far that no other authority whatsoever shall be recognized as having any right to interfere in the discipline of the schools, the arrangement of the studies, the conferring of degrees, in the choice or approval of the teachers. Allocutions. Cabus Luxuosissimus. September 5, 1851, and In Consistoriali. November 1, 1850. 46. Moreover, even in ecclesiastical seminaries, the method of studies to be adopted is subject to the civil authority. Allocution. Numquam 4. December 15, 1856. 
47. The best theory of civil society requires that popular schools open to children of every class of the people, and generally, all public institutes intended for instruction in letters and philosophical sciences and for carrying on the education of youth, should be freed from all ecclesiastical authority, control and interference, and should be fully subjected to the civil and political power at the pleasure of the rulers, and according to the standard of the prevalent opinions of the age. Epistle to the Archbishop of Freiburg. Come non sign. July 14, 1864. 48. Catholics may approve of the system of educating youth unconnected with Catholic faith and the power of the Church, and which regards the knowledge of merely natural things, and only, or at least primarily, the ends of earthly social life. Ibid. 49. The civil power may prevent the prelates of the Church and the faithful from communicating freely and mutually with the Roman Pontiff. Allocution. Maxima Cadem. June 9, 1862. 50. Lay authority possesses of itself the right of presenting bishops, and may require of them to undertake the administration of the diocese before they receive canonical institution and the letters apostolic from the Holy See. Allocution. Numquam 4. December 15, 1856. 51. And further, the lay government has the right of deposing bishops from their pastoral functions, and is not bound to obey the Roman pontiff and those things which relate to the institution of bishoprics and the appointment of bishops. Allocution. Acerbissimum. September. 27, 1852. Damnatio. Multiplices in Tur. June 10, 1851. 52. Government can, by its own right, alter the age prescribed by the Church for the religious profession of women and men, and may require of all religious orders to admit no person to take solemn vows without its permission. Allocution. Numquam 4. December 15, 1856. 53. The laws enacted for the protection of religious orders and regarding their rights and duties ought to be abolished. Nay, more, civil government may lend its assistance to all who desire to renounce the obligation which they have undertaken of a religious life, and to break their vows. Government may also suppress the said religious orders, as likewise collegiate churches and simple benefices, even those of advowson, and subject their property and revenues to the administration and pleasure of the civil power. Allocutions. Acerbissimum. September 27, 1852. Probe Memenoritis. January 22, 1855. Come Seep. July 26, 1855. 54. Kings and princes are not only exempt from the jurisdiction of the Church, but are superior to the Church in deciding questions of jurisdiction. Damnatio. Multiplices in Tur. June 10, 1851. 55. The Church ought to be separated from the dot state and the state from the church. Allocution. Acerbissimum. September 27, 1852. 7. Errors Concerning Natural and Christian Ethics. 56. Moral laws do not stand in need of the divine sanction, and it is not at all necessary that human laws should be made conformable to the laws of nature and receive their power of binding from God. Allocution. Maxima Cadem. June 9, 1862. 57. The science of philosophical things and morals and also civil laws may and ought to keep aloof from divine and ecclesiastical authority. Ibid. 58. No other forces are to be recognized except those which reside in matter, and all the rectitude and excellence of morality ought to be placed in the accumulation and increase of riches by every possible means, and the gratification of pleasure. Ibid. Encyclical. Quanto Confishimer. August 10, 1863. 59. Right consists in the material fact. All human duties are an empty word, and all human facts have the force of right. Allocution. Maxima Cadem. June 9, 1862. 60. Authority is nothing else but numbers and the sum total of material forces. Ibid. 61. 
The injustice of an act when successful inflicts no injury on the sanctity of right. Allocution. Jamdudum Cernimus. March 18, 1861. 62. The principle of non-intervention, as it is called, ought to be proclaimed and observed. Allocution. Novo Zetiandi. September 28, 1860. 63. It is lawful to refuse obedience to legitimate princes, and even to rebel against them. Encyclical. Caploribus. November 9, 1864. Allocution. Quibusque Vestrum. October 4, 1847. Nasidus et Nobiscum. December 8, 1849. Apostolic Letter. Cum Catholica. 64. The violation of any solemn oath, as well as any wicked and flagitious action repugnant to the eternal law, is not only not blamable but is altogether lawful and worthy of the highest praise when done through love of country. Allocution. Cabus Quantisque. April 20, 1849. 8. Errors concerning Christian marriage. 65. The doctrine that Christ has raised marriage to the dignity of a sacrament cannot be at all tolerated. Apostolic Letter. Ad Apostolic E. August 22, 1851. 66. The sacrament of marriage is only a something accessory to the contract and separate from it, and the sacrament itself consists in the nuptial benediction alone. Ibid. 67. By the law of nature, the marriage tie is not indissoluble, and in many cases divorce properly so called may be decreed by the civil authority. Ibid. Allocution. Acerbissimum. September 27, 1852. 68. The Church has not the power of establishing dormant impediments of marriage, but such a power belongs to the civil authority by which existing impediments are to be removed. Damnatio. Multiplices in Tur. June 10, 1851. 69. In the Dark Ages the Church began to establish dormant impediments, not by her own right, but by using a power borrowed from the state. Apostolic Letter. Ad Apostolic E. August. 22, 1851. 70. The canons of the Council of Trent, which anathematize those who dare to deny to the Church the right of establishing dormant impediments, either are not dogmatic or must be understood as referring to such borrowed power. Ibid. 71. The form of solemnizing marriage prescribed by the Council of Trent, under pain of nullity does not bind in cases where the civil law lays down another form, and declares that when this new form is used the marriage shall be valid. 72. Boniface VIII was the first who declared that the vow of chastity taken at ordination renders marriage void. Ibid. 73. In force of a merely civil contract there may exist between Christians a real marriage and it is false to say either that the marriage contract between Christians is always a sacrament, or that there is no contract if the sacrament be excluded. Ibid. Letter to the King of Sardinia, September 9, 1852. Allocutions. Acerbissimum. September 27, 1852. Multis Gravibusque. December 17, 1860. 74. Matrimonial causes and espousals belong by their nature to civil tribunals. Encyclical. Capluribus. November 9, 1846. Dam Maschio. Multiplices Inter. June 10, 1851. Ad Apostolic E. August 22, 1851. Allocution. Acerbissimum. September 27, 1852. 9. Errors Regarding the Civil Power of the Sovereign Pontiff 75. The children of the Christian and Catholic Church are divided amongst themselves about the compatibility of the temporal with the spiritual power. Ad Apostolic E. August 22, 1851 76. The abolition of the temporal power of which the Apostolic See is possessed would contribute in the greatest degree to the liberty and prosperity of the Church. Allocutions. Cabus Quantisque. April 20, 1849. Si Semper Antia. 
May 20, 1850. X. Errors having reference to modern liberalism. 77. In the present day it is no longer expedient that the Catholic religion should be held as the only religion of the state, to the exclusion of all other forms of worship. Allocution. Nemo Vestrum. July 26, 1855. 78. Hence it has been wisely decided by law, in some Catholic countries, that persons coming to reside therein shall enjoy the public exercise of their own peculiar worship. Allocution. Acerbissimum. September 27, 1852. 79. Moreover, it is false that the civil liberty of every form of worship, and the full power, given to all, of overtly and publicly manifesting any opinions whatsoever in thoughts, conduce more easily to corrupt the morals and minds of the people, and to propagate the pest of indifferentism. Allocution. Numquam 4. December 15, 1856. 80. The Roman pontiff can, and ought to, reconcile himself, and come to terms with progress, liberalism and modern civilization. Allocution. Jam Dudum Cernimus. March 18, 1861. The faith teaches us and human reason demonstrates that a double order of things exists, and that we must therefore distinguish between the two earthly powers, the one of natural origin which provides for secular affairs and the tranquility of human society, the other of supernatural origin, which presides over the city of God, that is to say the Church of Christ which has been divinely instituted for the sake of souls and of eternal salvation. The duties of this twofold power are most wisely ordered in such a way that to God is given what is God's, Matt. 2221, and because of God to Caesar what is Caesar's, who is great because he is smaller than heaven. Certainly the church has never disobeyed this divine command, the church which always and everywhere instructs the faithful to show the respect which they should inviolably have for the supreme authority and its secular rites. Venerable brethren, you see clearly enough how sad and full of perils is the condition of Catholics in the regions of Europe which we have mentioned. Nor are things any better or circumstances calmer in America, where some regions are so hostile to Catholics that their governments seem to deny by their actions the Catholic faith they claim to profess. In fact there, for the last few years, a ferocious war on the Church, its institutions and the rights of the apostolic see has been raging. Venerable brothers, it is surprising that in our time such a great war is being waged against the Catholic Church. But anyone who knows the nature, desires and intentions of the sects, whether they be called Masonic or bear another name, and compares them with the nature of the systems and the vastness of the obstacles by which the Church has been assailed almost everywhere, cannot doubt that the present misfortune must mainly be imputed to the frauds and machinations of these sections. It is from them that the synagogue of Satan, which gathers its troops against the Church of Christ, takes its strength. In the past our predecessors, vigilant even from the beginning in Israel, had already denounced them to the kings and the nations, and had condemned them time and time again, and even we have not failed in this duty. If those who would have been able to avert such a deadly scourge had only had more faith in the supreme pastors of the church. But this scourge, winding through sinuous caverns, deceiving many with astute frauds, finally has arrived at the point where it comes forth impetuously from its hiding places and triumphs as a powerful master. Since the throng of its propagandists has grown enormously, these wicked groups think that they have already become masters of the world and that they have almost reached their pre established goal having sometimes obtained what they desired, and that is power, in several countries, they boldly turn the help of powers and authorities which they have secured to trying to submit the church of God to the most cruel servitude, to undermine the foundations on which it rests, to contaminate its splendid qualities, and moreover, to strike it with frequent blows, to shake it, to overthrow it, and if possible, to make it disappear completely from the earth. Things being thus, venerable brothers, make every effort to defend the faithful which are entrusted to you against the insidious contagion of these sects and to save from perdition those who unfortunately have inscribed themselves in such sections. Make known and attack those who, whether suffering from or planning deception 
are not afraid to affirm that these shady congregations aim only at the profit of society, at progress and mutual benefit. Explain to them often and impress deeply on their souls the papal constitutions on this subject and teach them that the Masonic associations are anathematized by them not. Only in Europe but also in America and wherever they may be in the whole world. To the archbishops and bishops of Prussia concerning the situation of the Catholic Church faced with persecution by that government. But although they, the bishops resisting persecution, should be praised rather than pitted, the scorn of episcopal dignity, the violation of the liberty and the rights of the Church, the ill treatment which does not only oppress those dioceses, but also the others of the kingdom of Prussia, demand that we, owing to the apostolic office with which God has entrusted us in spite of our insufficient merit, protest against laws which have produced such great evils and make one fear even greater ones, and as far as we are able to do so with the sacred authority of divine law, we vindicate for the church the freedom which has been trodden underfoot with sacrilegious violence. That is why by this letter we intend to do our duty by announcing openly to all those whom this matter concerns and to the whole Catholic world that these laws are null and void because they are absolutely contrary to the divine constitution of the Church. In fact, with respect to matters which concern the holy ministry, our Lord did not put the mighty of this century in charge, but St. Peter, whom he entrusted not only with feeding his sheep, but also the goats. Therefore no power in the world, however great it may be, can deprive of the pastoral office those whom the Holy Ghost has made bishops in order to feed the Church of God. Quanta Cura Condemning Current Errors Pope B.I. Pius IX, 1864 To our venerable brethren, all patriarchs, primates, archbishops, and bishops having favor and communion of the Holy See. Venerable brethren, health and apostolic benediction. With how great care and pastoral vigilance the Roman pontiffs, our predecessors, fulfilling the duty and office committed to them by the Lord Christ himself in the person of most blessed Peter, Prince of the Apostles, of feeding the lambs and the sheep, have never ceased sedulously to nourish the Lord's whole flock with words of faith and with salutary doctrine, and to guard it from poisoned pastures, is thoroughly known to all, and especially to you, venerable brethren. And truly the same, our predecessors, asserters of justice, being especially anxious for the salvation of souls, had nothing ever more at heart than by their most wise letters and constitutions to unveil and condemn all those heresies and errors which, being adverse to our divine faith, to the doctrine of the Catholic Church, to purity of morals, and to the eternal salvation of men, have frequently excited violent tempests, and have miserably afflicted both church and state, for which cause the same hour. Predecessors have with apostolic fortitude, constantly resisted the nefarious enterprises of wicked men, who, like raging waves of the sea foaming out their own confusion, and promising liberty whereas they are the slaves of corruption, have striven by their deceptive opinions and most pernicious writings to raise the foundations of the Catholic religion and of civil society, to remove from among men all virtue and justice, to deprave persons, and especially inexperienced youth, to lead it into the snares of error and at length to tear it from the bosom of the Catholic Church. 2. But now, as is well known to you, venerable brethren, already, scarcely had we been elevated to this chair of Peter, by the hidden counsel of divine providence, certainly by no merit of our own, when, seeing with the greatest grief of our soul a truly awful storm excited by so many evil opinions, and seeing also, the most grievous calamities never sufficiently to be deplored which overspread the Christian people from so many errors, according to the duty of our apostolic ministry. And following the illustrious example of our predecessors, we raised our voice, and in many published encyclical letters and allocutions delivered in consistory, and other apostolic letters, we condemned the chief errors of this most unhappy age, and we excited your admirable episcopal vigilance 
and we again and again admonished and exhorted all sons of the Catholic Church, to us most dear, that they should altogether abhor and flee from the contagion of so dire a pestilence, and especially in our first encyclical. Letter written to you on November 9, 1846, and in two allocutions delivered by us in consistory, the one on December 9, 1854, and the other on June 9, 1862, we condemn the monstrous portents of opinion which prevail especially in this age, bringing with them the greatest loss of souls and detriment of civil society itself, which are grievously opposed also, not only to the Catholic Church and her salutary doctrine and venerable rites but also to the eternal natural law engraven by God in all men's hearts, and to right reason, and from which almost all other errors have their origin. 3. But although we have not omitted often to proscribe and reprobate the chief errors of this kind, yet the cause of the Catholic Church, and the salvation of souls entrusted to us by God, and the welfare of human society itself, altogether demand that we again stir up your pastoral solicitude to exterminate other evil opinions, which spring forth from the said errors as from a fountain, which false and perverse opinions are on that ground the more to be detested, because they chiefly tend to this, that that salutary influence be impeded and even removed, which the Catholic Church, according to the institution and command of her divine author, should freely exercise even to the end of the world, not only over private individuals, but over nations, peoples, and their sovereign princes, and tend also to take away that mutual fellowship and concord of councils between church and state which has ever proved itself propitious and salutary, both for religious and civil interests. Point one. For you well know, venerable brethren, that at this time men are found not a few who, applying to civil society the impious and absurd principle of naturalism, as they call it, dare to teach that. The best constitution of public society and also civil progress altogether require that human society be conducted and governed without regard being had to religion any more than if it did not exist, or, at least, without any distinction being made between the true religion and false ones, and against the doctrine of Scripture, of the Church, and of the Holy Fathers, they do not hesitate to assert that. That is the best condition of civil society in which no duty is recognized, as attached to the civil power, of restraining by enacted penalties, offenders against the Catholic religion, except so far as public peace may require. From which totally false idea of social government they do not fear to foster that erroneous opinion. Most fatal in its effects on the Catholic Church and the salvation of souls, called by our predecessor, Gregory XVI, and insanity. Two viz. that liberty of conscience and worship is each man's personal right, which ought to be legally proclaimed and asserted in every rightly constituted society, and that a right resides in the citizens to an absolute liberty, which should be restrained by no authority whether ecclesiastical or civil, whereby they may be able openly and publicly to manifest and declare any of their ideas whatever, either by word of mouth, by the press, or in any other way. But while they rashly affirm this, they do not think and consider that they are preaching. Liberty of perdition. 3. In that. If human arguments are always allowed free room for discussion, there will never be wanting men who will dare to resist truth and to trust in the flowing speech of human wisdom. Whereas we know, from the very teaching of our Lord Jesus Christ, how carefully Christian faith and wisdom should avoid this most injurious babbling. 4. 4. And since where religion has been removed from civil society, and the doctrine and authority of divine revelation repudiated, the genuine notion itself of justice and human right is darkened and lost, and the place of true justice and legitimate right is supplied by material force, thence it appears why it is that some, utterly neglecting and disregarding the surest principles of sound reason, dare to proclaim that. The people's will, manifested by what is called public opinion or in some other way, constitutes a supreme law, free from all divine and human control, and that in the political order accomplished facts, from the very circumstance that they are accomplished, have the force of right. But who does not see and clearly perceive that human society, when set loose from the bonds of religion and true justice, 
can have, in truth, no other end than the purpose of obtaining and amassing wealth, and that society under such circumstances follows no other law in its actions except the unchastened desire of ministering to its own pleasure and interests. For this reason, men of the kind pursue with bitter hatred the religious orders, although these have deserved extremely well of Christendom, civilization and literature, and cry out that the same have no legitimate reason for being permitted to exist, and thus, these evil men, applaud the calumnies of heretics. For, as Pius VI, our predecessor, taught most wisely, the abolition of regulars is injurious to that state in which the evangelical councils are openly professed. It is injurious to a method of life praised in the church as agreeable to apostolic doctrine. It is injurious to the illustrious founders themselves, whom we venerate on our altars, who did not establish these societies but by God's inspiration. Five and these wretches also impiously declare that permission should be refused to citizens and to the church, whereby they may openly give alms for the sake of Christian charity, and that the law should be abrogated, whereby on certain fixed days servile works are prohibited because of God's worship and on the most deceptive pretext, that the said permission and law are opposed to the principles of the best public economy. Moreover, not content with removing religion from public society, they wish to banish it also from private families. For teaching and professing the most fatal error of communism and socialism, they assert that domestic society or the family derives the whole principle of its existence from the civil law alone, and consequently, that on civil law. Alone depend all rights of parents over their children, and especially that of providing for education, by which impious opinions and machinations these most deceitful men chiefly aim at this result, viz., that the salutary teaching and influence of the Catholic Church may be entirely banished from the instruction and education of youth and that the tender and flexible minds of young men may be infected and depraved by every most pernicious error and vice. For all who have endeavored to throw into confusion things both sacred and secular, and to subvert the right order of society, and to abolish all rights, human and divine, have always, as we above hinted, devoted all their nefarious schemes, devices and efforts, to deceiving and depraving incautious youth and have placed all their hope in its corruption for which reason they never cease by every wicked method to assail the clergy, both secular and regular, from whom, as the surest monuments of history conspicuously attest, so many great advantages have abundantly flowed to Christianity, civilization and literature, and to proclaim that the clergy, as being hostile to the true and beneficial advance of science and civilization, should be removed from the whole charge and duty of instructing and educating youth. 5. Others, meanwhile, reviving the wicked and so often condemned inventions of innovators, dare with signal impudence to subject to the will of the civil authority the supreme authority of the Church and of this apostolic see given to her by Christ himself, and to deny all those rights of the same Church and see which concern matters of the external order. For they are not ashamed of affirming that the Church's laws do not bind in conscience unless when they are promulgated by the civil power, that acts and decrees of the Roman pontiffs, referring to religion and the church, need the civil power's sanction and approbation, or at least its consent, that the apostolic constitutions, six whereby secret societies are condemned, whether an oath of secrecy be or be not required in such societies, and whereby their frequenters and favorers are smitten with anathema, have no force in those regions of the world wherein associations of the kind are tolerated by the civil government, that the excommunication pronounced by the Council of Trent and by Roman pontiffs against those who assail and usurp the Church's rights and possessions, rests on a confusion between the spiritual and temporal orders, and is directed, to the pursuit of a purely secular good, that the Church can decree nothing which binds the conscience of the faithful in regard to their use of temporal things, that the Church has no right of restraining by temporal punishments those who violate her laws, that it is conformable to the principles of sacred theology and public law to assert and claim for the civil government a right of property in those goods which are possessed by the church, by the religious orders, and by other pious establishments. 
nor do they blush openly and publicly to profess the maxim and principle of heretics from which arise so many perverse opinions and errors. For they repeat that the ecclesiastical power is not by divine right distinct from and independent of the civil power, and that such distinction and independence cannot be preserved without the civil power's essential rights being assailed and usurped by the church. Nor can we pass over in silence the audacity of those who, not enduring sound doctrine, contend that, without sin and without any sacrifice of the Catholic profession assent and obedience may be refused to those judgments and decrees of the apostolic see, whose object is declared to concern the church's general good and her rights and discipline, so only it does not touch the dogmata of faith and morals. But no one can be found not clearly and distinctly to see and understand how grievously this is opposed to the Catholic dogma of the full power given from God by Christ our Lord himself to the Roman pontiff of feeding, ruling and guiding the universal church. 6. Amidst, therefore, such great perversity of depraved opinions, we, well remembering our apostolic office, and very greatly solicitous for our most holy religion, for sound doctrine and the salvation of souls which is entrusted to us by God, and solicitous also, for the welfare of human society itself, have thought it right again to raise up our apostolic voice. Therefore, by our apostolic authority, we reprobate, proscribe, and condemn all the singular and evil opinions and doctrines severally mentioned in this letter, and will and command that they be thoroughly held by all children of the Catholic Church as reprobated, proscribed, and condemned. 7. And besides these things, you know very well, venerable brethren, that in these times the haters of truth and justice and most bitter enemies of our religion, deceiving the people and maliciously lying, disseminate sundry and other impious doctrines by means of pestilential books, pamphlets, and newspapers dispersed over the whole world. Nor are you ignorant also, that in this our age some men are found who, moved and excited by the spirit of Satan, have reached to that degree of impiety as not to shrink from denying our ruler and Lord Jesus Christ, and from impugning his divinity with wicked pertinacity. Here, however, we cannot but extol you, venerable brethren, with great and deserved praise, for not having failed to raise with all zeal your episcopal voice against impiety so great. 8. Therefore, in this our letter, we again most lovingly address you, who, having been called unto a part of our solicitude, are to us, among our grievous distresses, the greatest solace, joy, and consolation, because of the admirable religion and piety wherein you excel, and because of that marvelous love, fidelity, and dutifulness, whereby bound as you are to us. And to this apostolic see and most harmonious affection, you strive strenuously and sedulously to fulfill your most weighty episcopal ministry. For from your signal pastoral zeal we expect that, taking up the sword of the Spirit which is the Word of God, and strengthened by the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, you will, with redoubled care, each day more anxiously provide that the faithful entrusted to your charge. Abstain from noxious verbiage, which Jesus Christ does not cultivate because it is not his father's plantation. Seven never cease also to inculcate on the said. Faithful that all true felicity flows abundantly upon man from our august religion and its doctrine. And practice, and that happy is the people whose God is their Lord. Point eight teach that kingdoms rest on the foundation of the Catholic faith. Nine and that nothing is so deadly, so hastening to a fall, so exposed to all danger, as that which exists, if, believing this alone to be sufficient for us that we receive free will at our birth, we seek nothing further from the Lord, that is, if forgetting our Creator we abjure His power that we may display our freedom. Ten and again do not fail to teach that the royal power was given not only for the governance of the world, but most of all for the protection of the Church. 11. And that there is nothing which can be of greater advantage and glory to princes and kings than if, as another most wise and courageous predecessor of ours, St. Felix, instructed the Emperor Zeno, they permit the Catholic Church to practice her laws and allow no one to oppose her liberty. For it is certain that this mode of conduct is beneficial to their interests, viz., that where there is question, Concerning the causes of God, they study, according to his appointment, 
to subject the royal will to Christ's priests, not to raise it above theirs. 12. 9. But if always, venerable brethren, now most of all amidst such great calamities both of the church and of civil society, amidst so great a conspiracy against Catholic interests and this apostolic see, and so great a mass of errors, it is altogether necessary to approach with confidence the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace in timely aid. Wherefore, we have thought it well to excite the piety of all the faithful in order that, together with us and you, they may unceasingly pray and beseech the most merciful Father of light and pity with most fervent and humble prayers, and in the fullness of faith flee always to our Lord Jesus Christ, who redeemed us to God in his blood, and earnestly and constantly supplicate his most sweet heart, the victim of most burning love toward us, that he would draw all things to himself by the bonds of his love, and that all men inflamed by his most holy. Love may walk worthily according to his heart, pleasing God in all things, bearing fruit in every good work. But since without doubt men's prayers are more pleasing to God if they reach him from minds free from all stain, therefore we have determined to open to Christ's faithful, with apostolic liberality, the church's heavenly treasures committed to our charge, in order that the said faithful, being more earnestly enkindled to true piety, and cleansed through the sacrament of penance from the defilement of their sins, may with greater confidence pour forth their prayers to God, and obtain His mercy and grace. 10. By these letters, therefore, in virtue of our apostolic authority, we concede to all and singular the faithful of the Catholic world, a plenary indulgence in the form of jubilee, during the space of one month only for the whole coming year 1865, and not beyond, to be fixed by you, venerable brethren, and other legitimate ordinaries of places, in the very same manner and form in which we granted it at the beginning of our supreme pontificate by our apostolic letters in the form of a brief, dated November 20, 1846, and addressed to all your episcopal order, beginning, Arcano Divini Providentia Concilio, and with all the same faculties which were given by us in those letters. We will, however, that all things be observed which were prescribed in the aforesaid letters, and those things be accepted which we there so declared. And we grant this, notwithstanding anything whatever to the contrary, even things which are worthy of individual mention and derogation, in order, however, that all doubt and difficulty be removed, we have commanded a copy of said letters be sent you. 11. Let us implore, venerable brethren, God's mercy from our inmost heart and with our whole mind, because he has himself added, I will not remove my mercy from them. Let us ask and we shall receive, and if there be delay and slowness in our receiving because we have gravely offended, let us knock, because to him that knocketh it shall be opened, if only the door be knocked by our prayers, groans and tears, in which we must persist and persevere, and if the prayer be unanimous, let each man pray to God, not for himself alone, but for all his brethren, as the Lord hath taught us to pray. 13. But in order that God may the more readily assent to the prayers and desires of ourselves, of you and of all the faithful, let us with all confidence employ as our advocate with him the Immaculate and Most Holy Virgin Mary, Mother of God, who has slain all heresies throughout the world, and who, the most loving mother of us all, is all sweet and full of mercy, shows herself to all as easily entreated, shows herself to all as most merciful, pities the necessities of all with a most large affection. 14. And standing as a queen at the right hand of her only begotten Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, in gilded clothing, surrounded with variety, can obtain from him whatever she will. Let us also seek the suffrages of the most blessed Peter, Prince of the Apostles, and of Paul, his fellow apostle, and of all the saints in heaven, who having now become gods. Friends, have arrived at the heavenly kingdom, and being crowned bare their palms, and being secure of their own immortality are anxious for our salvation. 12. Lastly, imploring from our great heart for you from God the abundance of all heavenly gifts, we most lovingly impart the apostolic benediction from our inmost heart, a pledge of our signal love towards you, to yourselves, venerable brethren, and to all the clerics and lay faithful committed to your care. 
given at Rome, from St. Peter's, the eighth day of December, in the year 1864, the tenth from the dogmatic definition of the Immaculate Conception of the Virgin Mary, Mother of God. In the nineteenth year of our pontificate. Intermultiplices. Pleading for unity of spirit Pope B.I. Pius IX, 1853. To our beloved sons cardinals of the Holy Roman Church and venerable brothers archbishops and bishops of France. Beloved sons of ours and venerable brothers, greetings and apostolic benediction. Among the many anxieties arising from our concern for all the churches given to us, though unworthy, by the hidden deliberation of divine providence, far too many are the people about whom the apostle foretold. There will come a time when they will not endure sound doctrine. Having itching ears, they will heap up to themselves teachers to suit their own likings. But the wicked and impostors will go from bad to worse, erring and leading into error. L. We are thus overjoyed when we turn to that renowned nation of France, a nation of many famous men and worthy of merit from us. In that nation we are consoled to see how with God's help the Catholic religion and its salutary doctrines flourish, flower, and prevail more every day. We are consoled by the care and zeal with which you fulfill your ministry and care for the safety and salvation of your beloved flock. And our consolation increases as we learn more and more. From the letters you write to us, more, that is, about the filial piety, love, and reverence with which you glory to follow us and this chair of Peter. This chair is the center of Catholic truth and unity, that is, the head, mother, and teacher of all the churches, too, to which all honor and obedience must be offered. 3. Every church must agree with it because of its greater preeminence, that is, those people who are in all respects faithful. 4. 2. We are also joyful because we know that you, aware of the seriousness of your episcopal duties, labor to increase the glory of God and to defend the cause of His Holy Church. You also use all your pastoral care and vigilance to see that the ecclesiastics of your diocese set forth each day more worthy of the vocation to which they are called, and that they give example of all the virtues to the Christian people, performing the offices of their ministry diligently. We rejoice in your concern that the faithful entrusted to you are daily nourished with the words of faith confirmed by the gifts of grace, grow in the knowledge of God, and walk the road that leads to life. Finally, we rejoice in your concern for those who stray from the truth, that they may return to the paths of salvation. Hence we joyfully recognize how eagerly you strive to obey our desires and admonitions to celebrate provincial synods. This means that in your diocese the inheritance of faith is maintained whole and inviolate, pure doctrine is taught, the honor of divine worship increased, the training and discipline of the clergy strengthened, and good character, virtue, religion, and piety are aroused and everywhere confirmed with auspicious and happy progress. And we rejoice very much when we see that by your special zeal the liturgy of the Roman Church has been restored according to our desires in many of your dioceses, where thus far particular circumstances least resisted. And we are so much the more pleased since we know that in many dioceses of France, because of the condition of the times, even those things were hardly observed which our predecessor St. Pius V wisely and providently ordained in his apostolic letter of July 9, 1568, quod a nobis postulate. 3. We rejoice to recall all these things with praise for your distinguished order, beloved sons and venerable brothers. Nevertheless we cannot hide the grave sadness and grief which afflicts us now, when we learn what dissensions the ancient enemy strives to excite among you in order to weaken your concord of minds. Therefore, because of our apostolic duty and the great love which we cherish for you and those faithful people, we write this letter in which we address you with the intimate affection of our heart. At the same time we admonish and beseech you that, daily bound by a covenant of love and mutually perceiving the same things with one mind, you strive in virtue to drive off and eliminate all dissensions which the ancient enemy labors to sow. Strive with all humility and mildness to preserve an all-embracing unity of spirit in the bond of peace. 
for you are wise enough to know how necessary that sacerdotal and faithful unity of mind, will, and judgment is, and how it contributes to the prosperity of the church and the procurement of eternal salvation. This concord of minds and wills must be cultivated among you with all zeal, especially now, because by the admirable will of Napoleon, Emperor of the French, and because of the work of his government, the Catholic Church there enjoys all peace, tranquility, and goodwill. And this fortunate combination of affairs and times in that empire ought to be a greater stimulant for you to strive to do all things with one and the same purpose, so that the divine religion of Christ, his doctrine, and the probity of morals and piety may take the deepest roots in France. Then the finest, uncontaminated education of youth may prevail more from day to day. By these means, hostile attacks may then be more easily restrained and overcome, attacks which arise from the efforts of those who were and are the constant enemies of the Church and Jesus Christ. 4. Thus we ask you again and again with the greatest zeal we can muster that, in matters concerning the safeguarding of the Church and its salutary teaching and liberty, and in fulfilling all the other episcopal duties of your ministry, your greatest aim should be unity among yourselves. We want you to confidently consult us and this apostolic see to remove controversy in all matters of whatever kind. First of all, since you know how much a good education, especially for the clergy, contributes to both sacred and public prosperity, do not neglect with concord of judgment to apply your thoughts and cares to this important matter. Never leave anything untried so that the clerics in your seminaries are formed early in all virtue, piety, and an ecclesiastical spirit, then they can grow in humility, without which we can never please God. At the same time, they should be diligently taught the humanities and the more austere disciplines, especially the sacred ones, free from the danger of any error. Thus, they may acquire not only elegance in speaking and writing, this eloquence being both from the wisest works of the Holy Fathers and from the most renowned pagan authors expurgated of all flaws, but also an especially full and solid knowledge of the history of theological doctrines, ecclesiastical history, and the sacred canons, acquired from a source approved by this apostolic see. 5. Then that illustrious clergy of France, which is resplendent with so much talent, piety, knowledge, ecclesiastical spirit, and singular service to this apostolic see, will abound more each day with knowledgeable and zealous workers. These workers, distinguished in virtue and armed with salutary knowledge, may be able in time to help in cultivating the vineyard of the Lord and in refuting those who contradict them. They will be able not only to confirm the faithful of France in our holy religion, but also to propagate it by sacred missions among distant and pagan nations. To the great credit of their name, the clergy up to the present have done this, for the good of religion and the salvation of souls. Along with us, you detest the great number of pestilential books, pamphlets, magazines, and posters which the virulent enemy of God and man incessantly spews forth to corrupt morals, attack the foundations of faith, and weaken the most sacred dogmas of our religion. Therefore, never cease to lead the flock entrusted to your care away from these poison pastures. Never cease to instruct, defend, and confirm them against the deluge of so many errors. Use salutary and opportune admonitions and publications to do this. 6. And here we cannot help but remind you of the admonitions and counsels with which, for years ago, we strongly summoned all the bishops of the Catholic world to exhort men outstanding for talent and sound doctrine to publish appropriate writings with which they might enlighten the minds of people and dissipate the darkness of creeping errors. Strive to remove this deadly pestilence of books and magazines from the faithful given into your care. At the same time encourage with all benevolence and favor those men who, animated by a Catholic spirit and educated in literature and learning, will endeavor to write books and publish magazines. Do this so that the Catholic doctrine is defended and spread, that the venerable rites and documents of this holy see remain sound, that opinions and doctrines opposed to the same see and its authority may be suppressed, and that the darkness of error is banished. And the minds of men illumined with the sweet light of truth. And it will be for your episcopal 
solicitude and love to arouse such inspired Catholic writers, so that they continue with ever greater zeal and knowledge to defend the cause of Catholic truth. You must also admonish them like a prudent father if their writings should offend Catholic teaching. 7. Now you know well that the most deadly foes of the Catholic religion have always waged a fierce war, but without success, against this chair. They are by no means ignorant of the fact that religion itself can never totter and fall while this chair remains intact, the chair which rests on the rock which the proud gates of hell cannot overthrow, 5, and in which there is the whole and perfect solidity of the Christian religion, 6. Therefore, because of your special faith in the Church, and special piety toward the same chair of Peter, we exhort you to direct your constant efforts so that the faithful people of France may avoid the crafty deceptions and errors of these plotters and develop a more filial affection and obedience to this apostolic see. Be vigilant in act and word, so that the faithful may grow in love for this holy see, venerate it, and accept it with complete obedience. They should execute whatever the see itself teaches, determines, and decrees. Here, however, we are hardly able to restrain ourselves from telling you of the grief we experienced when, among other things, a recently published book reached us. It was written in French with the title Sur la situation present de l'église gallicaine relativement au droit coutumier. Its author is totally opposed to all we so fervently commend, and so we have sent the book to our congregation of the index to be disapproved and condemned. 8. But before we conclude, we remind you again of what we most desire, that is, that you reject all questioning and controversy which, as you know, disturb the peace and injure love and which afford arms to the enemies of the church, arms with which to oppose and destroy her. Therefore let it be nearest to your heart to have peace among yourselves and to pursue peace with all, seriously reflecting that you are legates for him who is not a god of dissension but of peace. He never ceased to prescribe peace to his disciples, indeed Christ, as each one of you knows, promised all of his gifts and rewards in the preservation of peace. If we are the heirs of Christ, let us remain in the peace of Christ. If we are the sons of God, we must be peacemakers. It is necessary that the sons of God be peaceful, meek of heart, simple in speech, united in affection, and joined faithfully among themselves with the ties of Concord. 7. We certainly have confidence in your virtue, religion, and piety. We do not doubt that by obeying most willingly our paternal admonitions and desires, you will root out the seeds of all dissensions. By supporting each other patiently in love and collaborating in the evangelical faith, you will continue with ever more active zeal to keep watch by night over the flocks entrusted to your care and execute assiduously every part of your duties even to the consummation of the saints and the building up of the body of Christ. Be convinced of this, however, that nothing will be more pleasing to us, nothing more desirable, than that you do all those things which we know contribute to your greater profit and that of your faithful. Meanwhile, in the humility of our heart we pray and beseech God always to pour out the abundance of His heavenly grace upon you. We ask his blessing upon your pastoral concerns and labors by which the faithful entrusted to your care may continue to progress toward their heavenly goal, pleasing God in all things and bearing fruit in every good work. As an auspice of this divine help and as a proof of the burning love with which we embrace you, we eagerly bestow the apostolic blessing on you, beloved sons of ours and venerable brothers, on all the clerics of those churches, and on the faithful laity. Given at Rome at St. Peter's, March 21, 1853, in the seventh year of our pontificate. At Sinos. On conditions in Italy, Pope Leo XIII, 1882. To the archbishops and bishops and the other ordinaries of Italy. Venerable Brethren, Health and Apostolic Benediction. Although the authority and extent of our apostolic duties cause us to embrace the whole Christian Republic and each of the provinces which compose it with all the love and vigilance which is in our power, it is Italy which, at the present moment, more especially attracts our solicitude and our thoughts. These thoughts and these solicitudes extend far above mere temporal concerns, 
for it is the eternal salvation of souls which occupies us and causes us anxiety, a business which demands all our zeal, and obliges us to concentrate it entirely on that object, in proportion as we see it exposed to greater and greater perils. If ever these perils were menacing in Italy they are surely so now, at a time when the condition of the civil state itself disastrously imperils the freedom of religion. We are also still more affected by this since an intimate alliance unites us to Italy, where God has placed the residence of his vicar, the chair of truth and the center of Catholic unity. On other occasions we have urged the nations to take heed, and Christians individually to realize what duties are incumbent on them in such baleful circumstances. Nevertheless the evils continue to increase and we desire, venerable brethren, to point them out and commend them to your diligent attention, in order that, having recognized the tendency of public affairs, you may with greater vigilance strengthen the minds of your flocks, and surround them with every help, for fear lest that most precious treasure, the Catholic faith, should be torn from them. 2. A pernicious sect, of which the founders and chiefs either hide nor even mask their desires, has established itself for some time back in Italy. After having declared war against Jesus Christ it is attempting to rob the people of their Christian institutions. As to the extent to which it has carried its audacity, it is the less necessary for us to speak, venerable brethren, since the grave injuries and even ruin which morality and religion have to deplore lie patent before your eyes. In the midst of the populations of Italy, which have always been so constant and steadfast in the faith of their fathers, the liberty of the church is wounded on all sides. Everyday efforts are redoubled in order to efface from the public institutions that Christian stamp and character which has always, and with good reason, been the seal of the glories of Italy. Religious houses suppressed, the goods of the church confiscated, marriages contracted in despite of the laws and without the rights of the church, the position of the religious authorities as to the education of the young utterly ignored, in fine, a cruel and deplorable war without limit, and without measure declared against the apostolic see, a war on account of which the church is weighed down by inexpressible suffering, and the Roman pontiff finds himself reduced to extreme anguish. For, despoiled of his civil princedom, he has of necessity fallen into the hands of another power. 3. More than this, Rome, the most august of Christian cities, is now a place laid open to all the enemies of the church. Profane novelties defile it. Here and there, temples and schools devoted to heresy are to be found. It is even reported that this year it is about to receive the deputies and leaders of the sect which is most embittered against Catholicism, who have appointed this city as the place for their solemn meeting. The reasons which have determined their choice of such a meeting place are no secret. They desire by this outrageous provocation to glut the hatred which they nourish against the church, and to bring their incendiary torches within reach of the Roman pontificate by attacking it in its very seat. 4. The church, without doubt, will in the end be triumphant and will baffle the impious conspiracies of men but it is none the less admitted and certain that their designs aim at nothing less than the destruction of the whole system of the church with its head, and the abolition, if it were possible, of all religion. 5. For those who pretend to be friends of the honor of Italy to dream of such prospects would seem a thing incredible, for the ruin of the Catholic faith in Italy would dry up the source of the most precious of goods. If, in truth, the Christian religion has created for the nations the best guarantees for their prosperity, the sanctity of right and the guardianship of justice. If by her influence she has everywhere subdued headlong and hasty passions, she, the companion and protectress of all honesty, of all nobility, of all greatness. If she has everywhere summoned all classes and every member of society to meet in a lasting peace and in perfect harmony, Italy has received a richer share of these benefits than any other nation. 6. It is, in truth, the shame of too many persons that they dare to denounce the church as dangerous to public safety and prosperity, and to regard the Roman pontificate as the enemy of the greatness of the name of Italy. But the records of the past give the lie to such slanders and to absurd calumnies of a similar kind. It is to the church and the Roman pontiffs that Italy especially owes gratitude for having spread her glories in all lands 
for never having allowed her to succumb under the repeated incursions of having for generations preserved in many ways a lawful amount of just and proper liberty, and for having enriched her cities with numerous and immortal monuments of science and of art. In truth it is not the least glory of the Roman pontiffs that they have maintained united in a common faith the various provinces of Italy, so different in customs and ingenious, and have kept them from most disastrous. Disagreements Frequently, in times of trouble and calamity, the welfare of the state would have been in peril, had not the Roman pontificate saved it by exercise of its life-giving power. 7. And its influence will not be less beneficial in the future if the malice of men does not interfere and hinder its efficacy or stifle its liberty. This beneficial force, which is peculiar to Catholic institutions, because it flows from them as a natural consequence, is unchangeable and unceasing. Even as, for the salvation of souls, the Catholic religion embraces all countries without any limitations of time or space, so does it always and everywhere stand forth and present itself as the true friend of the civil power. 8. These great advantages are being lost, and are being followed by grave evils, for the enemies of Christian wisdom, be their rival pretensions what they may, are leading society to its ruin. Nothing can be more efficacious than their doctrines in the way of kindling in men's minds the flames of violence, and of stirring up the most pernicious passions. In the sphere of science they are repudiating the heavenly lights of faith, and when once this torch is put out, the mind of men is usually carried away by errors, no longer sees the truth, and begins quietly to sink into the lowest depths of a base and shameful materialism. In the sphere of morals they are disdainfully rejecting the eternal and unchangeable reasoning, and are despising God, the sovereign legislator and supreme avenger, and when once these foundations are torn away no sufficient authority remains for law, and the regulation of life merely depends upon the good pleasure and free will of man. In society, the liberty without limit which they preach and pursue engenders license and this license is very soon followed by the overthrow of order, the most fatal scourge of the public welfare. Of a truth, it is impossible to see society in a more pitiable or miserable state than in those places where such men and such doctrines as we have been describing have gained the upper hand even for a moment. Unless recent examples had furnished evidence it would have been difficult to believe that men, in a transport of furious and criminal boldness, could even have cast themselves into excesses of such a kind, and while retaining as if in mockery the name of liberty, could have given themselves over to satanalia of conflagrations and murders. If Italy has not, up to the present time, experienced a similar reign of terror, we must attribute it first to the especial protection of God, but the fact must be also recognized, to explain this preservation, that the people of Italy, the immense majority of whom are still faithful to the Catholic religion, have never been able to be subdued by the vicious and shameful doctrines we have denounced. And it must be confessed that if the ramparts erected by religion begin to give way, Italy also will fall into the same abyss, in which the greatest and most flourishing nations have in past times lain prostrate as victims. Similar doctrines involve similar consequences and since the germs are infected with the same poisons, it cannot be but that they should produce the same fruits. 9. Moreover Italy would perhaps have to pay yet more dearly for her apostasy, because in her case perfidy and impiety would be aggravated by ingratitude. It is not by chance or human caprice that Italy has from the first been a sharer in the salvation won by Jesus Christ, and has contained within her bosom the chair of Peter and enjoyed throughout a long course of ages the incomparable and divine benefits of which the Catholic religion is the natural source. She ought then greatly to fear for herself the judgment threatened by the Apostle Paul to ungrateful nations. The earth that drinketh in the rain which cometh often upon it, and bringeth forth herbs meat for them by whom it is tilled, receiveth blessing from God. But that which bringeth forth thorns and briars is reprobate, and very near unto a curse, whose end is to be burnt. 1. 10. May God avert so terrible a misfortune. May all give a serious consideration to the evils by which in part we are afflicted, and with which in part we are threatened by those who, 
devoted to the interests of political sects, not of the public, have sworn to wage a war to the death against the church. Unhappy men, if they were wise, if they had a true love for their country, far from distrusting the church, and striving, under the influence of injurious suspicions, to deprive her of her necessary liberty, they would do all in their power to defend and protect her, and would first of all make provision for the re-establishment of the Roman pontiff in the possession of his rights. In fact, the more injurious the war against the apostolic see is to the church, the more fatal it is in the cause of Italy. We have elsewhere expressed this thought. Say that the state in Italy can never prosper nor become stable and tranquil unless provision be made for the dignity of the Roman see and the liberty of the supreme pontiff, as every consideration of right requires. 11. And therefore, as we have nothing more at heart than the safety of Christian interests, and deeply moved as we are by the peril in which the people of Italy now stands, we exhort you, venerable brethren, more earnestly than ever to unite your care and loving efforts to ours, that a remedy for so many evils may be found. 12. And first endeavor to make your people understand of what value the Catholic faith is to them, and how they ought to defend it at every cost. But since the enemies and assailants of the Catholic name employ a thousand devices and a thousand feints to seduce those who are not on their guard, it is of the first importance to unmask and drag into the light of day their secret machinations, so that Catholics, having their eyes open to the real aims of these men, may feel their own courage redoubled, and may resolve openly and intrepidly to defend the Church, the Roman Pontiff, and their own salvation. 13. Up to the present time, whether through unfamiliarity with the new state of things, or through an imperfect understanding of the extent of the danger, the courage of many from whom much might have been expected, does not seem to have displayed itself with all the activity and vigor required for the defense of so great a cause. 14. But now that we have learned by experience in what times we live, nothing could be more fatal than to endure in cowardly inertness the malice of the wicked which never tires, and to leave the field open to them to persecute the church to the full satisfaction of their hate. 15. More prudent than the children of light, they have been daring in their enterprises, inferior in numbers, but superior in cunning and in riches, they have soon succeeded in lighting up amongst us a great conflagration of evils. May all the friends of Catholicity now, at least, understand that it is time to make some daring effort, and to rouse themselves at any cost from a languid carelessness, for one is never more easily overcome than in the sleep of cowardly security. Let them behold how the noble courage of their ancestors knew no fear and no repose, how by their indefatigable labors, and at the price of their blood, the Catholic faith has grown and spread in the world. 16. Do you then, venerable brethren, awaken the sleeping, stimulate the hesitating, by your example and your authority train them all to fulfill with constancy and courage the duties which are the Christian life in action. And in order to maintain and develop this revived courage, means must be taken to promote the growth, multiplication, harmony, and fruitfulness of associations the principal object of which should be to preserve and excite seal for the Christian faith and other virtues. Such are the associations of young men and of workmen, such are the committees organized by Catholics, and meeting periodically, such are the institutions destined to relieve poverty, to protect the sanctification of festival days, to instruct the children of the poor, and several others of the same kind. And since it is of supreme importance to Christian interests that the Roman pontiff should be, and should be, clearly seen to be, free from all danger, from all vexations, and from all hindrance in the government of the Church, it is necessary, to attain this end, that action should be taken, petitions, and every possible means within the limits of the law should be adopted, and that none should rest until we have restored to us in reality and not in appearance only, that liberty on which, not only the welfare of the Church, but the prosperity of Italy and the peace of Christian nations depend by a necessary connection. 17. Then it is of very great importance that writings of a healthy character should be published and circulated far and wide. Those who, with a deadly hatred, dissent from the Church, are wont to contend by means of publications, 
and to make use of these as the arms best adapted for inflicting injury. Hence a most evil deluge of books, hence the turbulent and wicked journals whose malevolent attacks either the laws avail to bridle, nor modesty to restrain. Whatsoever in these latter years has been wrought by sedition and mobs, that they maintain to have been lawfully done, they dissimulate or corrupt the truth, they pursue the church and the supreme pontiff with daily maledictions and false accusations, nor are there any opinions so absurd and pestiferous that they are not eager everywhere to disseminate them. The violence of this so great evil, which is daily spreading wider, must be diligently arrested. You must severely and gravely lead the people to be carefully on their guard, and to be willing most religiously to exercise a prudent choice in their reading. Moreover, writings must be opposed by writings, so that the same art which can effect most for the destruction may in turn be applied to the salvation and benefit of mankind, and remedies be supplied from that source whence evil poisons are now obtained. And to this end it is to be wished that, at any rate in every province, there should be established some method of publicly demonstrating what and how great are the duties of all Christians towards the church, by frequent, and, as far as possible, daily publications with this object. But in the first place, let there be kept in sight the conspicuous deserts of the Catholic religion in regard to all nations. Let it be verbally explained how its influence, both in private and public affairs, is most benign and salutary. Let it be shown of how great importance it is that the Church should promptly be established in that place of dignity in the state, which both its divine grandeur and the public advantage of the nations absolutely required. For these reasons it is necessary that those who have devoted themselves to writing should observe further that they all keep the same. End in view, that they should clearly ascertain what is most expedient and carry it out. They omit none of those things the knowledge of which seems useful and desirable, that, with gravity and moderation of speech, they reprove errors and vices, in such a way, however, that their reproof may be without bitterness, and with respect for the individuals, lastly that they use a plain and clear manner of speech, which the multitude can easily understand. But let all other persons, who truly and ex animo, desire that religion and society, defended by human intellect and literature, should flourish, let them study by their liberality to guard and protect these productions of literature and intellect, and let everyone, in proportion to his income, support them by his money and influence. For to those who devote themselves to writing we ought by all means to bring helps of this kind, without which their industry will either have no results, or uncertain and miserable ones. And in all these things if any inconvenience falls, Upon our friends, if there is any conflict to be sustained, let them still dare to be brave, since to the Christian there can be no cause for endurance, or labor more just than that of not suffering religion to be attacked by the wicked. For the church has not brought forth or educated her sons with this idea, that, when time and necessity compel, she should expect no assistance from them, but rather that they should all prefer the salvation of souls and the well-being of religion to their own ease and their own private interests. 18. But your chief cares and thoughts, venerable brethren, must have for their object the due appointment of fitting ministers of God. For if it be the office of bishops to use very much labor and zeal in properly training the whole of their youth, they ought to spend themselves far more on the clerics who are growing up as the hope of the church, and are to be some day sharers in the most sacred duties. Indeed, grave reasons, common to all times, demand in priests many and great graces but this time in which we live demands that they should be even more and greater. In truth the defense of the Catholic faith, in which the industry of priests ought specially to be employed, and which is in these days so very necessary, demands no common nor ordinary learning, but that which is recondite and varies, which embraces not only sacred, but even philosophical studies, and is rich in the treatment of physical and historical discoveries. For the error which has to be eradicated is multiform, and saps all the foundations of Christian wisdom, and very often a battle has to be waged with adversaries well prepared, pertinacious in disputing, who astutely draw confirmation from every kind of science. 
Similarly, since in these days there is great and far-extended corruption of morals, there is need in priests of singular excellence of virtue and constancy. They can by no means avoid associating with men, by the very duties of their office, indeed, they are compelled to have intimate relations with the people, and that in the midst of cities where there is hardly any lust that has not permitted an unbridled license. From which it follows that virtue in the clergy ought at this time to be strong enough peacefully to guard itself, and both conquer all the blandishments of desire and securely overcome dangerous examples. Besides a paucity of clerics has everywhere followed the laws which have been enacted to the injury of the church, so plainly, that it is necessary for those who by the grace of God are being trained to holy orders, to give double attention, and by increased diligence, zeal, and devotion to compensate for the sparse supply. And indeed, they cannot do this advantageously unless they possess a soul resolute of purpose, mortified, incorrupt, ardent with charity, ever prompt and quick in undertaking labors for the salvation of men. But for such tasks a long and diligent preparation must be made for one is not accustomed to such great things easily and quickly. And they indeed will pass their time in the priesthood holily and purely, who have exercised themselves in this way from their youth, and have so advanced in discipline that they seem not so much to have been instructed to those virtues, of which we have spoken, as to have been born to them. 19. For these reasons, venerable brethren, the seminaries of clerics demand a very great portion of your zeal, care, and vigilance. 20. As to virtue and morals, it does not escape your wisdom with what precepts and instruction the youth of clerics must be surrounded. Engraver studies are encyclical letters. Eterni patries have pointed out the best way and course. But since in such a condition of mental activity many things have been wisely and usefully discovered, which it is not fitting to ignore especially when wicked men are accustomed to turn, as new weapons, against divinely revealed truths, Every edition of this kind which the day brings, take care, venerable brethren, as far as lies in your power, that the young clerics be not only better instructed in natural sciences, but also properly educated in those arts which have connection with the interpretation or authority of the sacred scriptures. Of this surely we are not ignorant, that many things are needful for perfection in the highest studies, the means for which in the Religious seminaries of Italy hostile laws are taking away or diminishing. But in this also the time demands that by their bounty and munificence our children should strive to merit well of the Catholic religion. The pious and beneficent goodwill of our ancestors had admirably provided for necessities of this kind, and this the Church had been able by prudence and economy to accomplish, so that she had no necessity whatever to recommend to the charity of her children the care and preservation of sacred property. But her legitimate and sacred patrimony, which the attacks of former ages had spared, the tempest of our times has dissipated, so that there is again a reason why those who love the Catholic name should be induced to renew the liberality of their ancestors. Illustrious indeed are the proofs of munificence on the part of Frenchmen, Belgians, and others in a cause not very dissimilar from this munificence most worthy the admiration not only of contemporaries, but also of posterity. Nor do we doubt but that the Italian people, moved by the consideration of their common circumstances, will, in proportion to their means, act so as to show themselves worthy of their father, and will imitate the example of their brethren. 21. In these things, of which we have spoken, we have the greatest hope of consolation and security. But since in all designs, and especially in those which are undertaken for the sake of public safety, it is necessary to add always to human instruments the aid of Almighty God, in whose power are the wills of individual men no less than the course and fortunes of empires, therefore we must invoke God by instant prayers, and beseech Him to look upon Italy, which has been enriched and increased by so many of His benefits and having taken away every suspicion of peril, ever to preserve in her the Catholic faith, which is the chief good. For this selfsame reason let us devoutly implore the Immaculate Virgin Mary, the Great Mother of God, the prompter and helper of good counsels, together with her most holy spouse Joseph, the guardian and patron of Christian nations. And with like care we must beseech the great. Apostles, Peter and Paul, 
to guard safely in the Italian people the fruit of their labor, and to keep holy and inviolate amongst their latest posterity the Catholic name which they begot for our fathers with their own blood. 22. Confiding in the celestial patronage of all these, as a pledge of divine favors, and a proof of our particular goodwill, we most lovingly in the Lord bestow on you all, venerable brethren, and on the flocks committed to your care, the apostolic benediction. Given at Rome, at St. Peter's, on the 15th day of February, in the year of our Lord 1882, and of our pontificate the fourth. Humanum Genus On Freemasonry Pope Leo XIII, 1884 To the Patriarchs, Primates, Archbishops, and Bishops of the Catholic World in Grace and Communion with the Apostolic See. The race of man, after its miserable fall from God, the Creator and the Giver of heavenly gifts, through the envy of the devil, separated into two diverse and opposite parts, of which the one steadfastly contends for truth and virtue the other of those things which are contrary to virtue and to truth. The one is the kingdom of God on earth, namely, the true church of Jesus Christ, and those who desire from their heart to be united with it, so as to gain salvation, must of necessity serve God and His only begotten Son with their whole mind and with an entire will. The other is the kingdom of Satan, in whose possession and control are all whosoever follow the fatal example of their leader and of our first parents those who refuse to obey the divine and eternal law, and who have many aims of their own in contempt of God, and many aims also against God. 2. This twofold kingdom St. Augustine keenly discerned and described after the manner of two cities, contrary in their laws because striving for contrary objects, and with a subtle brevity he expressed the efficient cause of each in these words. Two loves form two cities, the love of self, reaching even to contempt of God, an earthly city, and the love of God, reaching to contempt of self, a heavenly one. 1. At every period of time each has been in conflict with the other, with a variety and multiplicity of weapons and of warfare, although not always with equal ardor and assault. At this period, however, the partisans of evil seems to be combining together, and to be struggling with united vehemence, led on or assisted by that strongly organized and widespread association called the Freemasons no longer making any secret of their purposes, they are now boldly rising up against God himself. They are planning the destruction of Holy Church publicly and openly, and this with the set purpose of utterly despoiling the nations of Christendom, if it were possible, of the blessings obtained for us through Jesus Christ our Savior. Lamenting these evils, we are constrained by the charity which urges our heart to cry out often to God, for lo, thy enemies have made a noise, and they that hate thee have lifted up the head. They have taken a malicious counsel against thy people, and they have consulted against thy saints. They have said, Come, and let us destroy them, so that they be not a nation. 2. 3. At so urgent a crisis, when so fierce and so pressing an onslaught is made upon the Christian name, it is our office to point out the danger to mark who are the adversaries, and to the best of our power to make head against their plans and devices, that those may not perish whose salvation is committed to us, and that the kingdom of Jesus Christ entrusted to our charge may not stand and remain whole, but may be enlarged by an ever-increasing growth throughout the world. 4. The Roman pontiffs our predecessors, in their incessant watchfulness over the safety of the Christian people, were prompt in detecting the presence and the purpose of this capital enemy immediately it sprang into the light instead of hiding as a dark conspiracy. And moreover, they took occasion with true foresight to give, as it were on their guard, and not allow themselves to be caught by the devices and snares laid out to deceive them. 5. The first warning of the danger was given by Clement XII in the year 1738. 3 and his constitution was confirmed and renewed by Benedict the Fourteenth. Four, Pius the Seventh followed the same path. Five, and Leo the Twelfth, by his apostolic constitution, quo gravura, six, put together the acts and decrees of former pontiffs on this subject, and ratified and confirmed them forever.
In the same sense spoke Pius VIII, 7, Gregory 16, 8, and many times over, Pius IX, 9. 6. For as soon as the Constitution and the spirit of the Masonic sect were clearly discovered by manifest signs of its actions, by the investigation of its causes, by publication of its laws, and of its rights and commentaries, with the addition often of the personal testimony of those who were in the secret, this apostolic see denounced the sect of the Freemasons, and publicly declared its constitution, as contrary to law and right, to be pernicious no less to Christendom than to the state, and it forbade any one to enter the society, under the penalties which the church is wont to inflict upon exceptionally guilty persons. The sectaries, indignant at this, thinking to elude or to weaken the force of these decrees, partly by contempt of them, and partly by calumny, accused the sovereign pontiffs who had passed them either of exceeding the bounds of moderation in their decrees or of decreeing what was not just. This was the manner in which they endeavored to elude the authority and the weight of the apostolic constitutions of Clement Twelfth and Benedict the Fourteenth, as well as of Pius the Seventh and Pius the Ninth. 10. Yet, in the very society itself, there were to be found men who unwillingly acknowledged that the Roman pontiffs had acted within their right, according to the Catholic doctrine and discipline. The pontiffs received the same assent, and in strong terms, from many princes and heads of governments, who made it their business either to delate the Masonic society to the apostolic see, or of their own accord by special enactments to brand it as pernicious, as, for example, in Holland, Austria, Switzerland, Spain, Bavaria, Savoy, and other parts of Italy. 7. But what is of highest importance, the course of events has demonstrated the prudence of our predecessors. For their provident and paternal solicitude had not always and everywhere the result desired, and this, either because of the simulation and cunning of some who were active agents in the mischief, or else of the thoughtless levity of the rest who ought, in their own interests, to have given to the matter their diligent attention. In consequence, the sect of Freemasons grew with a rapidity beyond conception in the course of a century and a half, until it came to be able, by means of fraud or of audacity, to gain such entrance into every rank of the state as to seem to be almost its ruling power. This swift and formidable advance has brought upon the church, upon the power of princes, upon the public well-being, precisely that grievous harm which our predecessors had long before foreseen. Such a condition has been reached that henceforth there will be grave reason to fear, not indeed for the church, for her foundation is much too firm to be overturned by the effort of men, but for those states in which prevails the power, either of the sect of which we are speaking or of other sects not dissimilar which lend themselves to it as disciples and subordinates. 8. For these reasons we no sooner came to the helm of the church than we clearly saw and felt it to be our duty to use our authority to the very utmost against so vast an evil. We have several times already, as occasion served, attacked certain chief points of teaching which showed in a special manner the perverse influence of Masonic opinions. Thus, in our encyclical letter, Quod Apostolici Muneris, we endeavored to refute the monstrous doctrines of the socialists and communists. Afterwards, in another beginning, Arcanum, we took pains to defend and explain the true and genuine idea of domestic life, of which marriage is the spring and origin, and again, in that which begins. Diuturnum. 11. We described the ideal of political government conformed to the principles of Christian wisdom, which is marvelously in harmony, on the one hand, with the natural order of things, and in the other, with the well. Being of both sovereign princes and of nations. It is now our intention, following the example of our predecessors, directly to treat of the Masonic society itself, of its whole teaching, of its aims, and of its manner of thinking and acting, in order to bring more and more into the light its power for evil, and to do what we can to arrest the contagion of this fatal plague. 9. There are several organized bodies which, though differing in name, in ceremonial, in form and origin, are nevertheless so bound together by community of purpose and by the similarity of their main opinions, as to make in fact one thing with the sect of the Freemasons, which is a kind of center whence they all go forth, and whither they all return. Now, 
these no longer show a desire to remain concealed, for they hold their meetings in the daylight and before the public eye, and publish their own newspaper organs, and yet, when thoroughly understood, they are found still to retain the nature and the habits of secret societies. There are many things like mysteries which it is the fixed rule to hide with extreme care, not only from strangers, but from very many members, also, such as their secret and final designs, the names of the chief leaders, and certain secret and inner meetings, as well as their decisions, and the ways and means of carrying them out. This is, no doubt, the object of the manifold. Difference among the members as to right, office, and privilege, of the received distinction of orders and grades, and of that severe discipline which is maintained. Candidates are generally commanded to promise, nay, with a special oath, to swear, that they will never, to any person, at any time or in any way, make known the members, the passes, or the subjects discussed. Thus, with a fraudulent external appearance, and with a style of simulation which is always the same, the Freemasons, like the Manichees of old, strive, as far as possible, to conceal themselves, and to admit no witnesses but their own members. As a convenient manner of concealment, they assume the character of literary men and scholars associated for purposes of learning. They speak of their zeal for a more cultured refinement, and of their love for the poor, and they declare their one wish to be the amelioration of the condition of the masses, and to share with the largest possible number all the benefits of civil life. Were these purposes aimed at in real truth, they are by no means the whole of their object. Moreover, to be enrolled, it is necessary that the candidates promise and undertake to be thenceforward strictly obedient to their leaders and masters with the utmost submission and fidelity, and to be in readiness to do their bidding upon the slightest expression of their will, or, if disobedient, to submit to the direst penalties and death itself. As a fact, if any are judged to have betrayed the doings of the sect or to have resisted commands given, punishment is inflicted on them not infrequently and with so much audacity and dexterity that the assassin very often escapes the detection and penalty of his crime. 10. But to simulate, and wish to lie hid, to bind men like slaves in the very tightest bonds, and without giving any sufficient reason, to make use of men enslaved to the will of another for any arbitrary act, to arm men's right hands for bloodshed after securing impunity for the crime, all this is an enormity from which nature recoils. Wherefore, reason and truth itself make it plain that the society of which we are speaking is in antagonism with justice and natural uprightness. And this becomes still plainer, inasmuch as other arguments, also, and those very manifest, prove that it is essentially opposed to natural virtue. For, no matter how great may be men's cleverness in concealing and their experience in eyeing, it is impossible to prevent the effects of any cause from showing, in some way, the intrinsic nature of the cause whence they come. A good tree cannot produce bad fruit, nor a bad tree produce good. Fruit. 12. Now, the Masonic sect produces fruits that are pernicious and of the bitterest savor. 4. From what we have above most clearly shown, that which is their ultimate purpose forces itself into view, namely, the utter overthrow of that whole religious and political order of the world which the Christian teaching has produced, and the substitution of a new state of things in accordance with their ideas, of which the foundations and laws shall be drawn from mere naturalism. 11. What we have said, and are about to say, must be understood of the sect of the Freemasons taken generically, and in so far as it comprises the associations kindred to it, and confederated with it, but not of the individual members of them. There may be persons amongst these, and not a few who, although not free from the guilt of having entangled themselves in such associations, yet are either themselves partners in their criminal acts nor aware of the ultimate object which they are endeavoring to attain. In the same way, some of the affiliated societies, perhaps, by no means approve of the extreme conclusions which they would, if consistent, embrace as necessarily following from their common principles, did not their very foulness strike them with horror. Some of these, again, are led by circumstances of times and places either to aim at smaller things than the others usually attempt, or than they themselves would wish to attempt. They are not, however, for this reason, to be reckoned as 
alien to the Masonic Federation, for the Masonic Federation is to be judged not so much by the things which it has done, or brought to completion, as by the sum of its pronounced opinions. 12. Now, the fundamental doctrine of the naturalists, which they sufficiently make known by their very name, is that human nature and human reason ought in all things to be mistress and guide. Laying this down, they care little for duties to God, or pervert them by erroneous and vague opinions. For they deny that anything has been taught by God, they allow no dogma of religion or truth which cannot be understood by the human intelligence, nor any teacher who ought to be believed by reason of his authority. And since it is the special and exclusive duty of the Catholic Church fully to set forth in words truths divinely received, to teach, besides other divine helps to salvation, the authority of its office, and to defend the same with perfect purity, it is against the Church that the rage and attack of the enemies are principally directed. 13. In those matters which regard religion let it be seen how the sect of the Freemasons acts, especially where it is more free to act without restraint, and then let any one judge whether in fact it does not wish to carry out the policy of the naturalists. By a long and persevering labor, they endeavor to bring about this result, namely, that the teaching office and authority of the church may become of no account in the civil state, and for this same reason they declare to the people and contend that church and state ought to be altogether disunited. By this means they reject from the laws and from the commonwealth the wholesome influence of the Catholic religion, and they consequently imagine that states ought to be constituted without any regard for the laws and precepts of the church. 14. Nor do they think it enough to disregard the church the best of guides, unless they also injure it by their hostility. Indeed, with them it is lawful to attack with impunity the very foundations of the Catholic religion, in speech, in writing, and in teaching, and even the rights of the Church are not spared, and the offices with which it is divinely invested are not safe. The least possible liberty to manage affairs is left to the Church, and this is done by laws not apparently very hostile but in reality framed and fitted to hinder freedom of action. Moreover, we see exceptional and onerous laws imposed upon the clergy, to the end that they may be continually diminished in number and in necessary means. We see also the remnants of the possessions of the church fettered by the strictest conditions and subjected to the power and arbitrary will of the administrators of the state and the religious orders rooted up and scattered. 15. But against the Apostolic See and the Roman Pontiff the contention of these enemies has been for a long time directed. The Pontiff was first, for specious reasons, thrust out from the bulwark of his liberty and of his right, the civil prince Dom. Soon, he was unjustly driven into a condition which was unbearable because of the difficulties raised on all sides. And now the time has come when the partisans of the sects openly declare what in secret among themselves they have for a long time plotted that the sacred power of the pontiffs must be abolished, and that the papacy itself, founded by divine right, must be utterly destroyed. If other proofs were wanting, this fact would be sufficiently disclosed by the testimony of men well informed, of whom some at other times, and others again recently, have declared it to be true of the Freemasons that they especially desire to assail the church with irreconcilable hostility and that they will never rest until they have destroyed whatever the supreme pontiffs have established for the sake of religion. 16. If those who are admitted as members are not commanded to abjure by any form of words the Catholic doctrines, this omission, so far from being adverse to the designs of the Freemasons, is more useful for their purposes. First, in this way they easily deceive the simple-minded and the heedless, and can induce a far greater number to become members. Again, as all who offer themselves are received whatever may be their form of religion, they thereby teach the great error of this age, that a regard for religion should be held as an indifferent matter, and that all religions are alike. This manner of reasoning is calculated to bring about the ruin of all forms of religion, and especially of the Catholic religion, which, as it is the only one that is true, cannot, without great injustice, be regarded as merely equal to other religions. 17. But the naturalists go much further, for, having, in the highest things, entered upon a wholly erroneous course, they are carried headlong to extremes, either by reason of the weakness of human nature, 
or because God inflicts upon them the just punishment of their pride. Hence it happens that they no longer consider as certain and permanent those things which are fully understood by the natural light of reason, such as certainly are, the existence of God, the immaterial nature of the human soul, and its immortality. The sect of the Freemasons, by a similar course of error, is exposed to these same dangers, for, although in a general way they may profess the existence of God, they themselves are witnesses that they do not all maintain this truth with the full assent of the mind or with a firm conviction. Neither do they conceal that this question about God is the greatest source and cause of discords among them. In fact, it is certain that a considerable contention about this same subject has existed among them very lately. But indeed, the sect allows great liberty to its votaries, so that to each side is given the right to defend its own opinion, either that there is a God or that there is none and those who obstinately contend that there is no God are as easily initiated as those who contend that God exists, though, like the pantheists, they have false notions concerning him, all which is nothing else than taking away the reality, while retaining some absurd representation of the divine nature. 18. When this greatest fundamental truth has been overturned or weakened, it follows that those truths, also, which are known by the teaching of nature must begin to fall. Namely, that all things were made by the free will of God the Creator, that the world is governed by providence, that souls do not die, that to this life of men upon the earth there will succeed another, and an everlasting life. 19. When these truths are done away with, which are as the principles of nature and important for knowledge and for practical use, it is easy to see what will become of both public and private morality. We say nothing of those more heavenly virtues which no one can exercise or even acquire without a special gift and grace of God, of which necessarily no trace can be found in those who reject as unknown the redemption of mankind, the grace of God, the sacraments, and the happiness to be obtained in heaven. We speak now of the duties which have their origin in natural probity. That God is the creator of the world and its provident ruler, that the eternal law commands the natural order to be maintained, and forbids that it be disturbed, that the last end of men is a destiny far above human things and beyond this sojourning upon the earth. These are the sources, and these the principles of all justice and morality. If these be taken away, as the naturalists and Freemasons desire, there will immediately be no knowledge as to what constitutes justice and injustice, or upon what principle morality is founded. And, in truth, the teaching of morality which alone finds favor with the sect of Freemasons, and in which they contend that youth should be instructed, is that which they call civil, and independent, and free, namely, that which does not contain any religious belief. But how insufficient such teaching is, how wanting in soundness, and how easily moved by every impulse of passion, is sufficiently proved by its sad fruits, which have already begun to appear. For, wherever, by removing Christian education, this teaching has begun more completely to rule, their goodness and integrity of morals have begun quickly to perish, monstrous and shameful opinions have grown up, and the audacity of evil deeds has risen to a high degree. All this is commonly complained of and deplored, and not a few of those who by no means wish to do so are compelled by abundant evidence to give not infrequently the same testimony. 20. Moreover, human nature was stained by original sin, and is therefore more disposed to vice than to virtue. For a virtuous life it is absolutely necessary to restrain the disorderly movements of the soul, and to make the passions obedient to reason. In this conflict human things must very often be despised, and the greatest labors and hardships must be undergone, in order that reason may always hold its sway. But the naturalists and Freemasons, having no faith in those things which we have learned by the revelation of God, deny that our first parents sinned, and consequently think that free will is not at all weakened and inclined to evil. 13. On the contrary, exaggerating rather the power and the excellence of nature, and placing therein alone the principle and rule of justice. They cannot even imagine that there is any need at all of a constant struggle, and a perfect steadfastness to overcome the violence and rule of our passions. 
wherefore we see that men are publicly tempted by the many allurements of pleasure, that there are journals and pamphlets with either moderation nor shame, that stage plays are remarkable for license, that designs for works of art are shamelessly sought in the laws of a so-called verism, that the contrivances of a soft and delicate life are most carefully devised, and that all the blandishments of pleasure are diligently sought out by which virtue may be lulled to sleep. Wickedly, also, but at the same time quite consistently, do those act who do away with the expectation of the joys of heaven, and bring down all happiness to the level of mortality, and, as it were, sink it in the earth. Of what we have said the following fact, astonishing not so much in itself as in its open expression, may serve as a confirmation. For, since generally no one is accustomed to obey crafty and clever men so submissively as those, whose soul is weakened and broken down by the domination of the passions there have. Been in the sect of the Freemasons some who have plainly determined and proposed that, artfully and of set purpose, the multitude should be satiated with a boundless license of vice, as, when this had been done, it would easily come under their power and authority for any acts of daring. 21. What refers to domestic life and the teaching of the naturalists is almost all contained in the following declarations, that marriage belongs to the genus of commercial contracts, which can rightly be revoked by the will of those who made them, and that the civil rulers of the state have power over the matrimonial bond, that in the education of youth nothing is to be taught in the matter of religion as of certain and fixed opinion, and each one must be left at liberty to follow, when he comes of age, whatever he may prefer. To these things the Freemasons fully assent, and not only assent, but have long endeavored to make them into a law and institution. For in many countries, and those nominally Catholic, it is enacted that no marriages shall be considered lawful except those contracted by the civil right. In other places the law permits divorce, and in others every effort is used to make it lawful as soon as may. B. Thus the time is quickly coming when marriages will be turned into another kind of contract, that is interchangeable and uncertain unions which fancy may join together, and which the same when changed may disunite. With the greatest unanimity the sect of the Freemasons also endeavors to take to itself the education of youth. They think that they can easily mold to their opinions that soft and pliant age, and bend it whither they will, and that nothing can be more fitted than this to enable them to bring up the youth of the state after their own plan. Therefore, in the education and instruction of children they allow no share, either of teaching or of discipline, to the ministers of the church, and in many places they have procured that the education of youth shall be exclusively in the hands of laymen, and that nothing which treats of the most important and most holy duties of men to God shall be introduced into the instructions on morals. 22. Then come their doctrines of politics, in which the naturalists lay down that all men have the same right and are in every respect of equal and like condition, that each one is naturally free, that no one has the right to command another, that it is an act of violence to require men to obey any authority other than that which is obtained from themselves. According to this, therefore, all things belong to the free people. Power is held by the command or permission of the people, so that, when the popular will changes, Rulers may lawfully be deposed and the source of all rights and civil duties is either in the multitude or in the governing authority when this is constituted according to the latest doctrines. It is held also that the state should be without God, that in the various forms of religion there is no reason why one should have precedence of another, and that they are all to occupy the same place. 23. That these doctrines are equally acceptable to the Freemasons and that they would wish to constitute states according to this example and model, is too well known to require proof. For some time past they have openly endeavored to bring this about with all their strength and resources, and in this they prepare the way for not a few bolder men who are hurrying on even to worse things, in their endeavor to obtain equality and community of all goods by the destruction of every distinction of rank and property. 24. What, therefore, sect of the Freemasons is, and what course it pursues, appears sufficiently from the summary we have briefly given. Their chief dogmas are so greatly and manifestly at variance with reason that nothing can be more perverse. To wish to destroy the religion and the church which God himself has established, 
and whose perpetuity he ensures by his protection, and to bring back after a lapse of eighteen centuries the manners and customs of the pagans, is signal folly and audacious impiety. Neither is it less horrible nor more tolerable that they should repudiate the benefits which Jesus Christ so mercifully obtained, not only for individuals, but also for the family and for civil society, benefits which, even according to the judgment and testimony of enemies of Christianity, are very great. In this insane and wicked endeavor we may almost see the implacable hatred and spirit of revenge with which Satan himself is inflamed against Jesus Christ. So also the studious endeavor of the Freemasons to destroy the chief foundations of justice and honesty, and to cooperate with those who would wish, as if they were mere animals, to do what they please, tends only to the ignominious and disgraceful ruin of the human race. The evil, too, is increased by the dangers which threaten both domestic and civil society. As we have elsewhere shown, in marriage, according to the belief of almost every nation, there is something sacred and religious, and the law of God has determined that marriages shall not be dissolved. If they are deprived of their sacred character, and made dissoluble, trouble and confusion in the family will be the result, the wife being deprived of her dignity, and the children left without protection as to their interests and well-being. To have in public matters no care for religion, and in the arrangement and administration of civil affairs to have no more regard for God than if he did not exist, is a rashness unknown to the very pagans. For in their heart and soul the notion of a divinity and the need of public religion were so firmly fixed that they would have thought it easier to have city without foundation than a city without God. Human society, indeed for which by nature we are formed, has been constituted by God the author of nature, and from him, as from their principle and source, flow in all their strength and permanence the countless benefits with which society abounds. As we are each of us admonished by the very voice of nature to worship God in piety and holiness, as the giver unto us of life and of all that is good therein, so also and for the same reason, nations and states are bound to worship him. And therefore it is clear that those who would absolve society from all religious duty act not only unjustly but also with ignorance and folly. 25. As men are by the will of God born for civil union and society, and as the power to rule is so necessary a bond of society that, if it be taken away, society must at once be broken up, it follows that from him who is the author of society has come also the authority to rule, so that whosoever rules, he is the minister of God. Wherefore, as the end and nature of human society so requires, it is right to obey the just commands of lawful authority, as it is right to obey God who ruleth all things, and it is most untrue that the people have it in their power to cast aside their obedience whensoever they please. 26. In like manner, no one doubts that all men are equal one to another, so far as regards their common origin and nature or the last end which each one has to attain, or the rights and duties which are thence derived. But, as the abilities of all are not equal, as one differs from another in the powers of mind or body, and as there are very many dissimilarities of manner, disposition, and character, it is most repugnant to reason to endeavor to confine all within the same measure, and to extend complete equality to the institutions of civil life. Just as a perfect condition of the body results from the conjunction and composition of its various members, which, though differing in form and purpose, make, by their union and the distribution of each one to its proper place, a combination beautiful to behold, firm in strength, and necessary for use. So, in the commonwealth, there is an almost infinite dissimilarity of men as parts of the whole. If they are to be all equal, and each is to follow his own will, the State will appear most deformed, but if, with a distinction of degrees of dignity, of pursuits and employments, all applicants aspire for the common good, they will present the image of a state both well constituted and conformable to nature. 27. Now, from the disturbing errors which we have described the greatest dangers to states are to be feared. For, the fear of God and reverence for divine laws being taken away, the authority of rulers despised, sedition permitted and approved, and the popular passions urged on to lawlessness, with no restraint save that of punishment, a change and overthrow of all things will necessarily follow. 
Yeah, this change and overthrow is deliberately planned and put forward by many associations of communists and socialists, and to their undertakings the sect of Freemasons is not hostile, but greatly favors their designs, and holds in common with them their chief opinions. And if these men do not at once and everywhere endeavor to carry out their extreme views, it is not to be attributed to their teaching and their will, but to the virtue of that divine religion which cannot be destroyed, and also because the sounder part of men, refusing to be enslaved to secret societies, vigorously resist their insane attempts. 28. Would that all men would judge of the tree by its fruit, and would acknowledge the seed and origin of the evils which press upon us, and of the dangers that are impending. We have to deal with a deceitful and crafty enemy, who, gratifying the ears of people and of princes, has ensnared them by smooth speeches and by adulation. Ingratiating themselves with rulers under a pretense of friendship, the Freemasons have endeavored to make them their allies and powerful helpers for the destruction of the Christian name, and that they might more strongly urge them on, they have, with determined calumny, accused the Church of invidiously contending with rulers in matters that affect their authority and sovereign power. Having, by these artifices, ensured their own safety and audacity, they have begun to exercise great weight in the government of states. But nevertheless they are prepared to shake the foundations of empires, to harass the rulers of the state, to accuse, and to cast them out, as often as they appear to govern otherwise than they themselves could have wished. In like manner they have by flattery deluded the people, proclaiming with a loud voice liberty and public prosperity and saying that it was owing to the church and to sovereigns that the multitude were not drawn out of their unjust servitude and poverty, they have imposed upon the people, and exciting them by a thirst for novelty, they have urged them to assail both the church and the civil power. Nevertheless, the expectation of the benefits which was hoped for is greater than the reality. Indeed, the common people, more oppressed than they were before, are deprived in their misery of that solace which, if things had been arranged in a Christian manner, they would have had with ease and in abundance. But whoever strive against the order which divine providence has constituted pay usually the penalty of their pride, and meet with affliction and misery where they rashly hope to find all things prosperous and in conformity with their desires. 29. The Church, if she directs men to render obedience chiefly and above all to God the Sovereign Lord, is wrongly and falsely believed either to be envious of the civil power or to arrogate to herself something of the rights of sovereigns. On the contrary, she teaches that what is rightly due to the civil power must be rendered to it with a conviction and consciousness of duty. In teaching that from God himself comes the right of ruling, she adds a great dignity to civil authority, and on small help towards obtaining the obedience and goodwill of the citizens. The friend of peace and sustainer of concord, she embraces all with maternal love, and intent only upon giving help to mortal man, she teaches that to justice must be joined clemency, equity to authority, and moderation to law-giving, that no one's right must be violated, that order and public tranquility are to be maintained and that the poverty of those are in need is, as far as possible, to be relieved by public and private charity. But for this reason, to use the words of St. Augustine, men think, or would have it believed, that Christian teaching is not suited to the good of the state, for they wish the state to be founded not on solid virtue, but on the impunity of vice. 14. Knowing these things, both princes and people would act with poetical wisdom. 15. And according to the needs of general safety, if, instead of joining with Freemasons to destroy the church, they joined with the church in repelling their attacks. 30. Whatever the future may be, in this grave and widespread evil it is our duty, venerable brethren, to endeavor to find a remedy. And because we know that our best and firmest hope of a remedy is in the power of that divine religion which the Freemasons hate in proportion to their fear of it, we think it to be of chief importance to call that most saving power to our aid against the common enemy. Therefore, Whatsoever the Roman pontiffs our predecessors have decreed for the purpose of opposing the undertakings and endeavors of the Masonic sect, and whatsoever they have enacted to enter or withdraw men from societies of this kind, we ratify and confirm it all by our apostolic authority, and trusting greatly to the goodwill of Christians, 
we pray and beseech each one, for the sake of his eternal salvation, to be most conscientiously careful not in the least to depart from what the apostolic see has commanded in this matter. 31. We pray and beseech you, venerable brethren, to join your efforts with ours, and earnestly to strive for the extirpation of this foul plague, which is creeping through the veins of the body politic. You have to defend the glory of God and the salvation of your neighbor, and with the object of your strife before you, either courage nor strength will be wanting. It will be for your prudence to judge by what means you can best overcome the difficulties and obstacles you meet with. But as it befits the authority of our office that we ourselves should point out some suitable way of proceeding, we wish it to be your rule first of all to tear away the mask from Freemasonry, and to let it be seen as it really is, and by sermons and pastoral letters to instruct the people as to the artifices used by societies of this kind in seducing men and enticing them into their ranks and as to the depravity of their opinions and the wickedness of their acts. As our predecessors have many times repeated, let no man think that he may for any reason whatsoever join the Masonic sect, if he values his Catholic name and his eternal salvation as he ought to value them. Let no one be deceived by a pretense of honesty. It may seem to some that Freemasons demand nothing that is openly contrary to religion and morality. But, as the whole principle and object of the sect lies in what is vicious and criminal, to join with these men or in any way to help them cannot be lawful. 32. Further, by assiduous teaching and exhortation, the multitude must be drawn to learn diligently the precepts of religion, for which purpose we earnestly advise that by opportune writings and sermons they be taught the elements of those sacred truths in which Christian philosophy is contained. The result of this will be that the minds of men will be made sound by instruction, and will be protected against many forms of error and inducements to wickedness, especially in the present unbounded freedom of writing and insatiable eagerness for learning. 33. Great, indeed, is the work, but in it the clergy will share your labors if, through your care, they are fitted for it by learning and a well-turned life. This good and great work requires to be helped also by the industry of those amongst the laity in whom a love of religion and of country is joined to learning and goodness of life. By uniting the efforts of both clergy and laity, strive, venerable brethren, to make men thoroughly know and love the church. For, the greater their knowledge and love of the church, the more will they be turned away from clandestine societies. 34. Wherefore, not without cause do we use this occasion to state again what we have stated elsewhere, namely, that the Third Order of St. Francis, whose discipline we a little while ago prudently mitigated, 16, should be studiously promoted and sustained, for the whole object of this order, as constituted by its founder, is to invite men to an imitation of Jesus Christ, to a love of the Church, and to the observance of all Christian virtues, and therefore it ought to be of great influence in suppressing the contagion of wicked societies. Let, therefore, this holy sodality be strengthened by a daily increase. Amongst the many benefits to be expected from it will be the great benefit of drawing the minds of men to liberty, fraternity, and equality of right, not such as the Freemasons absurdly imagine, but such as Jesus Christ obtained for the human race and St. Francis aspired to, the liberty, we mean, of sons of God, through which we may be free from slavery to Satan or to our passions, both of them most wicked masters. The fraternity whose origin is in God, the common creator and father of all, the equality which, founded on justice and charity, does not take away all distinctions among men, but out of the varieties of life, of duties, and of pursuits, forms that union and that harmony which naturally tend to the benefit and dignity of society. 35. In the third place, there is a matter wisely instituted by our forefathers, but in course of time laid aside, which may now be used as a pattern and form of something similar. We mean the associations of guilds of workmen, for the protection, under the guidance of religion, both of their temporal interests, and of their morality. If our ancestors, by long use and experience, felt the benefit of these guilds, our age perhaps will feel it the more by reason of the opportunity which they will give of crushing the power of the sections. Those who support themselves by the labor of their hands, besides being, 
by their very condition, most worthy above all others of charity and consolation, are also especially exposed to the allurements of men whose ways lie in fraud and deceit. Therefore, they ought to be helped with the greatest possible kindness, and to be invited to join associations that are good, lest they be drawn away to others that are evil. For this reason, we greatly wish for the salvation of the people. That, under the auspices and patronage of the bishops, and at convenient times, these guilds may be generally restored. To our great delight, sodalities of this kind and also associations of masters have in many places already been established, having, each class of them, for their object to help the honest workman, to protect and guard his children and family, and to promote in them piety, Christian knowledge, and a moral life. And in this matter we cannot omit mentioning that exemplary society, named after its founder, St. Vincent, which has deserved so well of the lower classes. Its acts and its aims are well known. Its whole object is to give relief to the poor and miserable. This it does with singular prudence and modesty, and the less it wishes to be seen, the better is it fitted for the exercise of Christian charity and for the relief of suffering. 36. In the fourth place, in order more easily to attain what we wish, to your fidelity and watchfulness we commend in a special manner the young, as being the hope of human society. Devote the greatest part of your care to their instruction, and do not think that any precaution can be great enough in keeping them from masters and schools whence the pestilent breath of the sex is to be feared. Under your guidance, let parents, religious instructors, and priests having the cure of souls use every opportunity, in their Christian teaching, of warning their children and pupils of the infamous nature of these societies, so that they may learn in good time to beware of the various and fraudulent artifices by which their promoters are accustomed to ensnare people. And those who instruct the young in religious knowledge will act wisely if they induce all of them to resolve and to undertake never. To bind themselves to any society without the knowledge of their parents, or the advice of their parish priest or director. 37. We well know, however, that our united labors will by no means suffice to pluck up these pernicious seeds from the Lord's field, unless the heavenly master of the vineyard shall mercifully help us in our endeavors. We must, therefore, with great and anxious care, implore of him the help which the greatness of the danger and of the need requires. The sect of the Freemasons shows itself insolent and proud of its success, and seems as if it would put no bounds to its pertinacity. Its followers, joined together by a wicked compact and by secret. Councils give help one to another, and excite one another to an audacity for evil things. So vehement an attack demands an equal defense, namely, that all good men should form the widest possible association of action and of prayer. We beseech them, therefore, with united hearts, to stand together and unmoved against the advancing force of the sex, and in mourning and supplication to stretch out their hands to God, praying that the Christian name may flourish and prosper, that the church may enjoy its needed liberty, that those who have gone astray may return to a right mind, that error at length may give place to truth and vice to virtue. Let us take our helper and intercessor the Virgin Mary, Mother of God, so that she, who from the moment of her conception overcame Satan may show her power over these evil sects, in which is revived the contumacious spirit of the demon, together with his unsubdued. Perfidy and Deceit Let us beseech Michael, the prince of the heavenly angels, who drove out the infernal foe, and Joseph, the spouse of the most holy virgin and heavenly patron of the Catholic Church, and the great apostles, Peter and Paul, the fathers and victorious champions of the Christian faith. By their patronage, and by perseverance in united prayer, we hope that God will mercifully and opportunely succor the human race, which is encompassed by so many dangers. 38. As a pledge of heavenly gifts and of our benevolence, we lovingly grant in the Lord to you, venerable brethren, and to the clergy and all the people committed to your watchful care, our apostolic benediction. Given at St. Peter's in Rome, the twentieth day of April, 1884, the sixth year of our pontificate. Officio Sanctissimo
on the church in Bavaria Pope Leo XIII, 1887. To our Venerable Brethren the Archbishops and Bishops of Bavaria. Venerable Brethren, Health and Apostolic Benediction. Urged on by the most sacred duty of our apostolic office, we have striven earnestly and for a long time, as you yourselves know, that the affairs of the Catholic Church in Prussia should be somewhat improved, and, having been restored to a position of dignity, they should flourish with their former, and more than their former, honor, which endeavors and labors of ours have by God's aid and assistance so far succeeded that we have appeased former strife, and are filled with hope that the liberty of the Catholic name may be enjoyed there fully and in peace. But now it is our desire to turn our thoughts and cares with great earnestness towards the Bavarians. Not indeed because we think that the state of religion is the same in Bavaria as it was in Prussia, but we will and desire that in that kingdom also, which glories in the profession of the Catholic faith received from its forefathers and ancestors, sundry. Inconveniences which militate against the liberty of the Catholic Church may be speedily abolished. That we may accomplish so salutary a desire, we wish to try every expedient which others may give, and to bring to bear upon it without delay the authority and aid we ourselves possess. And we also especially call upon you, O venerable brethren, and upon all those in Bavaria who by your operation have become our dear children, that in whatever may seem to appertain to the care and propagation of the faith and of religion in your country, we may communicate with you so far as is in our power, giving you counsel concerning them and confidently urging them on the rulers of the state. 2. In the sacred records of Bavaria are many circumstances, but we recall things unknown to you, concerning which the church and the state may unite in a common joy. For the Christian faith, from the time when its divine seed was sown in the bosom of your country by the care and great diligence of the holy abbot Severinus, who stands out as the apostle of the country between the Danube and the Alps, and of other preachers of the gospel, sent forth and fixed its roots so deeply that thenceforward it has never been utterly eradicated either by the barbarity of superstition or the revolution and change of public affairs. Wherefore it came to pass about the end of the seventh century that when Rupert, the holy bishop of Worms, at the invitation of Theodore, Duke of Bavaria, went forth to stir up and increase the Christian faith in those parts, he found indeed many, both professors of the faith and others desirous of. Embracing it, even in the midst of superstition, but that most excellent Prince Theodore himself, inflamed by zeal for the faith, undertook a journey to Rome, and prostrate at the tombs of the holy apostles and, at the feet of the august vicar of Jesus Christ, first afforded a most noble example of piety and of the union of Bavaria with this apostolic see, which other excellent princes afterwards religiously followed. At the same time Cardinal Martinianus, Bishop of Sabina, was sent as legate to Bavaria by the holy pontiff Gregory II, who brought aid and assistance in Catholic affairs, with whom were associated Georges and Dorotheus, both cardinals of the Roman Church. Not long afterwards Corbinianus, Bishop of Munich, a man renowned for his holiness of life and contempt of the world, who confirmed and increased the effect of the apostolic labors of Rupert by an equal amount of labors, set out to visit the sovereign pontiff at Rome. 3. But he to whom beyond others praise is certainly due, in that he nourished and cherished the faith in Bavaria, is St. Boniface, the Archbishop of Mayence, who also is celebrated in an undying and most trustworthy account as the father of Christian Germany its apostle and martyr. He fulfilled the office of legate to the Roman pontiffs Gregory II and III, and Zachary, in whose favor he stood high, and in their name and by their authority he divided the country of Bavaria into dioceses, and thus, having constituted a regular hierarchy, handed on the faith which had been planted there to future generations. St. Gregory II, writing to Boniface himself, says, The field of the Lord, which was lying waste, and had grown unfruitful through infidelity with the thorns of thistles, being tilled by the plowshare of thy doctrine, has received the seed of the word and brought forth an abundant harvest of faithfulness. E.P. 13. Ad Bonifacium, C.F.R. Labrum Collect. C.O.N.C. V. 8. From that time the religion of the
Bavarians remained safe and sure through all changes in civil affairs, although in course of time very sharply tried. For indeed there ensued those broils and contentions of the empire against the priesthood which were so bitter, enduring, and destructive. In these, however, there was more to rejoice than to sadden the church in Bavaria. For with the most perfect unity they stood by Gregory the Eleventh, the lawful pontiff, the unbridled violence of the contenders moving them to either side, and in vain threatening them, and what was very trying, a long time afterwards, being in no way moved either by the power or attacks of the followers of Novatus, they always religiously observed the integrity of their faith and their ancient alliance with the Roman Church. Which courage and firmness of your fathers is to be the more lauded because this new sect had brought into subjection nearly all their neighbors. Indeed to the Bavarians who lived in those unhappy times are very applicable the words of merited praise. Contained in a letter to their rulers which the above-named Gregory II had addressed long before to the Catholics of Thuringia, who had been imbued with the Christian faith by street. Boniface. Acknowledging the constancy of your firm faith in Christ, which is well known to us, since when the pagans endeavored to force you into an idolatrous worship, you replied in the fullness of your faith that you would rather die than violate that faith in Christ which you had once for all received. Filled with all joy we give thanks as is right to our God and Redeemer, the giver of all good things, by the assistance of whose grace we desire to raise you to still better and greater things, that for the strengthening of the intention of your faith you may cleave with earnest minds to the holy apostolic see, and so far as the needs of our holy religion demand you may receive consolation from this holy apostolic see so well. Remembered by you as the spiritual mother of all the faithful, as indeed it is fitting that the joint heirs of a kingdom should receive from their royal parent. EPV. Ad optimate sturing, CFE. Labia mibi. 4. But although the grace of our merciful God which in former times preserved and most graciously embraced your nation, bids us to argue well, and be of good hope for the future, nevertheless we ought to strive, so far as lies in our power, to do that which will be most efficacious in healing the wounds which our religion may have received, or in warding them off while still threatening us, so that our holy Christian doctrine and code of morals may daily spread and bear fruit more. Largely. This we do not say as though the Catholic faith were in want of greater and less timid defenders among you, for we know well, venerable brethren, that you, together with the larger and better part both of those in sacred orders and others, are by no means idly callous to the contests and dangers with which your church is surrounded, therefore, as our predecessor, Pius IX, in his most loving letters addressed to the bishops of Bavaria, lit. Nihil nobis gracious, February 20, 1851, praised in the highest manner. The great earnestness they displayed in preserving the sacred rites of the church so we also freely and openly give well-deserved praise to each one of those who have bravely undertaken and carried out the defense of their ancestral faith. But when our provident God allows his church to be vexed with grievous storms, he himself justly demands from us dispositions and powers more prepared to assist her. But you, O venerable brethren, each one equally with us, behold with grief the strange and unhappy times upon which the church has fallen. You were amongst the first to notice the conditions in which you are placed, and the difficulties with which you have to contend. Wherefore you know by experience that your office has greater duties than formerly, and that to perform them well you ought to strive very earnestly for watchfulness, diligence, strength, and Christian prudence. 5. And firstly we urge and exhort you concerning the preparation and welfare of the clergy. For the clergy are like an army, which— as they obey the laws and perform their duties so that they may be of service to the Christian multitude under the authority of the bishops, will bring honor and stability to public affairs in proportion to their number and discipline. Wherefore this has always been the first care of the church that she should choose and bring up to the priesthood those young men, whose dispositions and desires afford a hope that they will persevere in the ministry of the church, C.O.N.C. Trid, Session 23, De Reform Xvi, and again, that the young men should have been educated from their early years in piety and religion, before evil habits have gained possession of them as young men. C.O.N.C. Trid. 
Session 23, De Reform. Xvi, and for them she founded proper seats of training and seminaries, and laid down rules full of wisdom, especially in the Holy Council of Trent, Ibid, so that this college of the ministers of God might be a perpetual seminary, Ibid. In several places, indeed, certain laws are in force which, if they do not stop, yet hinder the clergy in their training and discipline. We deem that it behoves us now as at other times openly to speak our mind on this matter, which is of the greatest possible interest, and to preserve the holy law of the church inviolate by every means in our power. For indeed the church, as a body, which is by its nature perfect, has an inalienable right of ordering and instructing its own forces, hurtful to none, helpful to many in that kingdom of peace which Jesus Christ founded upon earth for the salvation of the human race. 6. The clergy, however, will fulfill the duties committed to their charge fully and as a whole when, by the care of the bishops such a disposition of mind and intention has been brought about in the sacred seminaries as the dignity of the Christian priesthood and the natural change of times and manners require. They ought, indeed, to surpass others in the excellence of their teaching, and which is the chief thing, in great reputation for virtue, so that they may attract the minds of men to it and lead them to its observance. 7. It is necessary that Christian wisdom, which abounds in a wonderful light, should shine before the eyes of all, so that the darkness of ignorance, which is the greatest enemy to religion, having been dispelled, the truth may shine forth far and wide, and happily reign. Nay more, it behoves that those manifold errors be refuted and dispelled which, taking their rise either in ignorance, or wickedness or prejudiced opinions, perversely call away the minds of men from Catholic truth, and engender a certain hatred of it in their dispositions. This great duty, which is, to exhort in sound doctrine and to convince the gainsayers, E.P. Title I, 9, belongs to the order of priests, who hold it legitimately, imposed by Christ our Lord when he sent them forth to teach all nations, by his divine power. Going into the whole world preach the gospel to every creature. March 16, 15, equally plainly as the bishops, chosen in place of. The apostles are set over the church of God, the priests are their assistants. If ever these duties have been fully and perfectly carried out it was in the first ages of our religion and in the following centuries during that great struggle with heathen tyranny which raged for so long a time, whence the priestly band and the most holy order of fathers and doctors whose Wisdom and eloquence will be ever held in memory and admiration, obtained their great glory. For indeed Christian doctrine deeply treated of by them, fully explained, and most valiantly maintained, by that means spread forth the more its truth and divine excellence. On the other hand appeared the doctrine of the heathens, confuted and despised even by the unlearned, as having no consistency, full of absurdities useless. But in vain did the adversaries try to arrest and stop that course of Catholic wisdom. In vain did they seek objections from the schools of Greek philosophy, especially from those of Plato and Aristotle, with high-sounding words indeed. For our champions, declining not even that kind of contest, applied themselves to the learning and study of the heathen philosophers. Having examined with the greatest diligence what each one of them had professed, they took these things into consideration one. By one, they examined them, they compared them, many things were rejected or corrected by them. Not a few were justly approved of and accepted. They also discovered and established by them that those things which are proved to be false by human reason and intelligence are in the same manner opposed to Christian doctrine, so that he who withstands and opposes this doctrine of necessity equally withstands and opposes reason. Contests of this kind were entered into by our fathers and splendid victories obtained, and these were achieved, not only by the virtue and arms of faith, but also by the aid of human reason, which indeed, guided by the light of divine wisdom, entered boldly upon the path of truth, from ignorance of many things, and as it were out of a forest of errors. This admirable agreement, and consent of the faith with reason, although it has been honored by the learned works of many, yet as it were built up in one edifice and shown at one view, shines forth especially in that work of S.T.
Indeed, are contained whatever things were deeply thought out and considered by wise men, and in them we may seek for the beginnings and fount of that eminent school of learning called Christian theology. The memory of such illustrious examples should be remembered and cherished by the clergy, since in many ways ancient weapons are being sharpened by our adversaries, and nearly the same old battles are to be refought. Thus only the heathen formerly objected to the Christian religion, that they should not be led away from the ancient and accustomed rites of their divinities, but now the most iniquitous endeavor of wicked men contend that they should eradicate from Christian people all divine and most necessary teaching connected with our holy faith and that they may use them worse than the heathen, and may involve them in the greatest misery, namely, the subversion and contempt of all faith and religion, of which impure plague, than which none is more detestable, those were the founders who attributed to man that by the light of nature each one could know and judge concerning doctrine divinely revealed by virtue of his own reason and judgment and that there was no necessity to submit to the authority of the church and the Roman pontiff, whose sole right it is, by divine command and appointment to be the guardian of that doctrine, to hand it on, and to judge truly concerning it. Thence the way easily opened, though to them it lay open most miserably, for denying and discarding all things and the powers of man, then insolently denying that there was any authority which emanated from God or even that there was a God, they at length lapsed into absurd theories of idealism and materialism. Younger members of the church ought to be instructed in higher doctrines that they perform their duties with ease and utility at the present time. That these may be thoroughly grounded and accomplished in the study of humanities they should not enter upon the study of sacred theology before having undergone a preparation in philosophy. We mean that deep and real philosophy, the investigator of the loftiest problems, the best patron of truth, by virtue of which they themselves will not be tossed about nor carried away. By every wind of doctrine, by the wickedness of men, by the craftiness by which they lie in wait to deceive. F's 4. 14, and will enable them to give to other doctrines the aid of truth, by the discussion and refutation of captious and deceptive theories. With this object we have already advised that the works of the great Aquinas should be in their hands, and should be constantly and carefully explained, and we have often laid stress upon the same thing with solemn words, and we believe that the best fruits are thence received by the clergy, and we shall confidently look for fruits still more excellent and abundant. Indeed, the method of the angelic doctor is admirably adapted for training minds wonderfully fitted for use in making comments, in philosophizing, in discoursing forcibly and incontrovertibly, for it shows clearly each subject connected one with another in a continuous series, all however joined together and fitting into each other, all leading to the highest principles. Then it raises one to the contemplation of God who is the efficient cause and strength and highest type of all things, to whom finally all philosophy and man himself, such as he is, ought to be referred. Thus truly the knowledge of things are held together, as they are admirably shown, so also are they most firmly established by S.T. Thomas, by conflict with which knowledge, as the ancient sects of errors have entirely disappeared, so the new, unlike them rather in name and kind than in fact, as soon as they have put forth their heads fall, laid low by the same blows, as indeed many of our writers have shown. Truly human reason desires to penetrate freely into the hidden and secret. Knowledge of things, nor can it do otherwise, but with Aquinas for our author and master it. Does this more quickly and freely because it does it safely without any danger of passing over the boundaries of truth. For neither can you rightly call that liberty which gathers and scatters opinions according to its own will and pleasure, nay rather it is to be reputed the vilest license, lying, and false science, a disgrace and slavery of the mind. He indeed is the true doctor who walks within the confines of truth, who not only never differs from God, the head and fount of all truth, but is always strictly in accordance with him and always follows him when disclosing his secrets in any manner who no less piously listens to the Roman pontiff when speaking, reverses in him the divine authority and fully holds that. Submission to the Roman pontiff is necessary to salvation. 
Opusk. Contra errors Grocaram. In his school, therefore, let the cleric be brought up and exercise both in philosophy and theology, for he will then be learned and strong as the mightiest to fight the sacred combats. 9. But it is scarcely possible to express how great is the utility of the light of doctrine which shines from the clergy, and is poured among the different orders of Christian people, if indeed it shines as it were from a beacon of virtue. For in the precepts which tend to the correction of men's morals, the acts of their masters are of more avail than their precepts, nor will any easily feel confidence when dealing with one whose deeds do not accord with his words and precepts. We turn our eyes and minds to Jesus Christ, who, as he is the truth, has taught us what we ought to believe, as he is the life and way, has offered himself to us a perfect example, how we should lead a good life and eagerly seek after our final good. He himself desired his disciples to be ordered and perfected after his own pattern. So let your light shine. That is in doctrine. Before men that they may see your good works. Not differing from the principles of your doctrine. And glorify your Father who is in heaven. Matt. V. 16. Having. Combined together the doctrine and excellence of the gospel which he committed to them to preach. It is right that those precepts should be divine by which the life of priests is ordered and directed. Above all it is necessary that they persuade themselves and have it almost written in their minds, that they are now no longer in the companionship of God, and though, passing their time in the communion of the world, still live the life of Christ our Lord, who if they really live by Him and in Him, will in no way seek those things which are their own, but will be entirely taken up with, those things which belong to Jesus Christ. Philip 2, 21 Nor will they receive the empty favor of men, but will seek after the solid favor of God. They will, moreover, abstain from and abhor these lower and contemptible things, and industriously trying to become rich in heavenly blessings, will generously and gladly pour them forth, as is the part of holy charity. Further, they will never permit themselves to oppose or prefer their own to the judgment and will of the bishops, but by obeying and giving way to them as bearing the person of Christ, they will obtain most happily in the Lord's vineyard abundance of most choice fruit which will remain with them forever. But whosoever severs himself in thought, or will from his shepherd and from the chief of shepherds, the Roman pontiff, is in no way joined to Christ. He that heareth you heareth me, and he that despiseth you despiseth me. Luke X. 16. But whosoever is separated from Christ scatters rather than gathers together. Whence, moreover, is evident the kind and measure of consideration due to men who are placed in positions of public authority. For it is by no means intended that any one should desire to deny or derogate from their rights. Rather those are to be diligently observed by other citizens, and especially carefully by priests. Render to Caesar the things which are Caesar's. Matt. 22. 21. For those functions are most noble and honorable which God the highest Lord and ruler has imposed upon men who are princes, that, by counsel, reason, and all care of justice they should govern, preserve, and increase the state. Wherefore let the clergy carefully attend to and perform every duty as citizens, not after the manner of one who is servile, but of one who holds them in reverence, on account of religion, not on account of fear, at the same time with due observance, maintaining their own dignity, being both citizens and priests of God. But if it should happen that the civil power should invade the rights of God and of his church, then let a marked example be set by priests, as every Christian man ought to persevere in the path of duty during times of religious trouble. Let him bear many things in silence, with unstained virtue. Let him be cautious in bearing evil deeds, nor let him ever assent or consent to the wicked in any matter. But if it be a question of choice which he should do, whether the laws of God were to be broken or men pleased, let him freely use that memorable and most dignified answer of the apostles. We ought to obey God rather than men. Acts v. 29. 10. To this, as it were foreshadowed type of educating young men destined to sacred ends, it is our desire and right that we should add what appertains to youth in general for we are exceedingly anxious as to its education, that it should be rightly and very fully carried out, 
both as regards mental culture and training the disposition. The Church has always cherished the age of youth in her maternal embrace, for its guardianship she has most lovingly undertaken many labors and prepared many aids for it, among which is the foundation of many orders of religious men which might train young people in science and learning, and might especially inculcate Christian wisdom and virtue. Under such auspices it would come to pass that piety towards God would easily imbue their tender minds, after which the duty of man towards himself, his neighbor, and his country having been duly set before them, there is every hope that they would bring forth fruit in due season. There is therefore a just cause of grief to the church when she sees her little ones torn away from her at the tenderest age and forced into schools where either the knowledge of God is passed over in silence or but a maimed and perverted idea of it taught, where there is nothing to stem the torrent of error, no faith in divine revelation, no place where the truth may defend itself. But truly, to forbid the Catholic Church to use her influence in the abodes of science and literature, is most injurious, since the duty of teaching religion, that subject indeed, which no man careful of his eternal. Salvation can neglect, has been given by God to his Church, but to no other society of men has it been given, nor can any other association take it for itself. She therefore claims it as her undoubted right, and complains when it is neglected. 11. Further we must beware, and the greatest care should be taken, that in schools which have either wholly or partially cast aside the authority of the church, the young should incur no danger, nor receive any injury to their Catholic faith or good morals in which indeed the skill of the clergy and other good men will be of great avail, both if they exert themselves that the knowledge of religion should not only not be driven out of those schools where it exists, but should occupy its due place, and be taught by competent teachers of known ability, and if also they could find and put into operation any other safeguards, by which that knowledge may be imparted to their scholars in corrupt and satisfactorily. The counsel and cooperation of the heads of families will also be of use. Wherefore there is need of warning and exhorting them as far as lies in our power most earnestly, that they should consider what great and holy duties God has imposed upon them with respect to the education of their children, that they may know their religion and be of good behavior, serving God religiously, but that they themselves act wrongly if they commit their children at a docile and guileless age to the care of questionable teachers. In these duties, which devolve upon them with the procreation of their children, let the heads of families know that there are the same rights inherent both by nature and justice, and that they aid of such a kind that no one can free himself from them, since it is impossible by any human power to be dispensed from those duties which man owes to God. Let, then, parents consider well that they have a great responsibility to bear in the education of their children, and a still greater one in bringing them up to look for a better and more perfect life, that of the soul which when they are themselves unable to superintend, it is their part to procure the aid of others, so that their children may hear and receive that. Knowledge of religion which is necessary for every man from approved teachers. Now, indeed, there is not infrequently a most excellent example of piety and munificence, in that where there are no public schools open except those which are called neutral. Catholics have opened certain establishments of their own at great labor, and expense, and maintain them with an equal zeal. It is greatly to be wished that these excellent and safe refuges of youth should be established more and more where the necessities of circumstances or places require. Nor must we pass over in silence the fact that the Christian education of youth redounds greatly to the advantage of the state itself. Indeed, numberless and very great losses are to be feared for that state in which the method and discipline of education is devoid of religion or what is worse, is opposed to it. For immediately that supreme and divine rule is laid aside and despised, by whose admonition we are commanded to reverence the authority of God and in reliance upon the same God, to hold all his teachings with the most. Assured faith, there is a tendency of human science to fall into most grievous errors, especially those of materialism and rationalism. Hence it follows that each man is allowed to follow his own judgment and inclination as to what he understands, and still more as to what he does, and forthwith the public authority of those in power is weakened and destroyed, 
for it would be wonderful indeed if those obeyed and endured the rule of man, who entertain the baneful opinion that they are in no way bound by the governance and rule of God. For once destroy the foundations on which all authority rests, and the bond of human society is loosened and destroyed, there will be no state. A tyranny full of violence and cunning will take possession of all things. But surely can any state by reliance upon its own powers ward off so great a calamity? Can any state do so while refusing the aid of the church? Can any state do so? When absolutely opposing the church, the matter stands open and clear to every prudent person. Prudence in affairs of state itself demands that their part in teaching and educating. The young should be left to the bishops and clergy, and great care should be taken that the most noble duty of instructing others should not be left in the hands of those who are either careless and lax in their religion, or openly averse to the church. What, however, would be still more intolerable would be that men of this character should be selected as professors of religious knowledge, which is the most important of all. 12. It is likewise a matter of extreme importance, venerable brethren, that you should warn and guard your flocks against the dangers arising from the contagion of Freemasonry. We have in a special encyclical letter shown how full of evil and danger to the state is this sect of darkness, and we have pointed out means to contract and destroy its influence. The faithful can never be sufficiently warned against this wicked faction, for although from the very beginning it conceived a deep hatred against the Catholic Church, and has ever since increased and inflamed it, its enmity is not always openly displayed, but more often exercises itself in an underhand and hypocritical way, especially among the young, who inexperienced and wanting in wisdom, are sadly ensnared by its deceits often concealed by appearances of piety and charity. As to being cautious in regard to those outside the Catholic faith, keep to what the Church prescribes so that intercourse with them or the depravity of their doctrines may not become a source of danger to a Christian people. We know and regret, as you do, that our power to ward off such dangers does not equal our zeal and our desire to do so. Nevertheless, we do not think it useless to excite your pastoral solicitude and to stimulate at the same time the activity of Catholics, so that our united efforts may turn aside, or at least lessen obstacles set in the way of our common desires. And we exhort you in the words of our predecessor Leo the Great, be full of pious zeal for religion, and let the anxiety of all the faithful be aroused against the most cruel enemies of souls. Serm. 15. C. 6. Therefore throwing off their torpid neglect let all good persons embrace the cause of religion and of the church as their own, and let them fight faithfully and constantly on her behalf. Too often the wicked are confirmed in their wickedness and their power for evil, and win the day by the sluggishness and timidity of good persons. The efforts and zeal of Catholics have not indeed always the effect intended and to be expected, but at heart they serve to restrain the enemy and at the same time to encourage the feeble and timid, even without counting the advantages gained from the satisfaction of having fulfilled a duty. Moreover, we are not ready to admit that the zeal and activity of Catholics cannot attain their end if properly guided and with perseverance. For it ever has chanced and will happen that enterprises most surrounded with difficulties and happily, provided, as we have said they are carried out with courageous energy, guided and aided by Christian prudence. And indeed truth, naturally desired by all men, will sooner or later win men's minds. Truth may be tried and oppressed by intellectual troubles and diseases, but it can never be destroyed. All that has gone before seems to apply in a special way to Bavaria. For by God's grace, since it ranks among Catholic kingdoms, it must keep and nourish rather than accept that divine faith which it received from its forefather. Moreover, they who in the people's name make laws to govern the kingdom are mostly Catholics, as are also many of its citizens and inhabitants, and therefore we doubt not they will aid with their utmost strength the church, their mother, in her many trials. If all unite their efforts as energetically and actively as they ought, there will, by God's grace, be reason to rejoice at the happy results of their zeal. We recommend to all such union, for as there is nothing so baneful as discord, there is concord of spirit, when in united force they are brought to bear for some common purpose. 
Effectively the laws give Catholics an easy way of seeking to amend the condition and order of the state and to desire and will a constitution which, if not favorable and well-intentioned towards the church, shall at least, as justice requires, be not harshly hostile. It would be unjust to accuse or blame any one amongst us who has recourse. To such means, for those means, used by the enemies of Catholicity to obtain and to extort, as it were, from rulers' laws inimical to civil and religious freedom, may surely be used by Catholics in an honorable manner for the interests of religion and in defense of the property, privileges, and right divinely granted to the Catholic Church, and that ought to be respected with all honor by rulers and subjects alike. 13. Of the rights of the Church that it is our duty everywhere and always to maintain and defend against all injustice, the first is certainly that of enjoying the full freedom of action she may need in working for the salvation of souls. This is a divine liberty, having as its author the only Son of God, who by shedding of blood gave birth to the Church who established it until the end see, time, and chose himself to be its head. This liberty is so essential to the Church, a perfect and divine institution, that they who attack this liberty at the same time offend against God and their duty. For as we have elsewhere more than once shown, God established his church to protect and distribute what is of supreme good to souls, by their nature superior to all others, and to bring men, by means of faith and grace, to a new life in Jesus Christ, a life that ensures eternal salvation since the character and rights of any society are fixed by its reason for existing and by the end it aims at, in accordance with the terms of its existence and conformably with its object, it naturally follows that the church is a society as distinct from civil society as their reason for existence and ends are different. It follows that she is an indispensable society for all mankind, since all are called the Christian life, and so they who refuse to enter it or leave it are separated forever from life eternal, and it is a society eminently independent, and above all others, because of the excellence of the heavenly and immortal blessings towards which it tends. But an essentially free institution requires, as all may see, freedom to use the means necessary for its operations. The Church therefore needs, as proper and necessary means, the power of handing down Christian doctrine, of giving the sacraments, of exercising divine worship, of regulating and ruling all ecclesiastical discipline, with which gifts and offices God willed that His Church should be invested and strengthened, and by an admirable providence willed too that she alone should possess. 2. Her alone has he given in charge all he has revealed to men and established as sole interpreter, judge, and mistress, most wise and infallible, of the truth, whose precepts states as well as individuals must hear and accept. It is equally certain that he has given the church full freedom to judge and decide as to the things that may best suit her ends. Wherefore it is unjustly that the civil powers take offense at the freedom of the church, since the principle of civil and religious power is one and the same, namely, God. Therefore there can be no discord between them, nor mutual obstacles nor encroachments, for God cannot be at variance with himself, and there cannot be conflict between his works, rather there is between them a marvelous harmony of causes and effects. It is clear likewise that when the Catholic Church, obeying her master's will, carries far and wide her standard among nations. She does not invade the territory of the civil power, and interferes with it in no way, but on the contrary, protects and guards those nations, just as the Christian law does not cloud the light of human reason but adds to its brilliancy by turning it aside from falsities into which human nature easily falls, or in opening to it a newer and wider intellectual horizon. 14. In regard to Bavaria arrangements were made between the Holy See and that country, which were ratified and made binding by reciprocal treaties. Although the Holy See granted great concessions in making a convention touching its rights, nevertheless in its wanted manner it has religiously kept the whole of these arrangements, and has never done anything that might give rise to conflict. Wherefore it is earnestly to be hoped that they may be faithfully kept on both sides, not only according to the letter, but according to the spirit in which they were made. Once indeed this harmony was broken, but a decree of Maximilian I. restored it. 
and Maximilian II, confirmed it in a fair and just manner by sanctioning some opportune modifications. These modifications have, however, we know, been lately abrogated. We, nevertheless, on account of the religious prudence of the prince who governs the kingdom of Bavaria, are confident that he who inherits the rank and faith of the Maximilians will himself safeguard Catholic interests by removing obstacles that bar their way, and that he will favor their development. Consequently, the Catholics, who form the majority of the people, and whose love of country and respect for authority are conspicuous, if they see that in a matter of such moment their desires are taken into account and satisfied, will increase their love and respect for a prince, as sons for their father, and following his counsels for the welfare and honor of the kingdom. They will fulfill them to the uttermost limits of their power. 15. Such, venerable brothers, is what the duty of our apostolic office compels us to say to you. It only remains to implore in common and with assurance the help of God, and to this end, let us take as our intercessors the ever-glorious Virgin Mary and the heavenly patrons of Bavaria, so that he may hear our united prayers and graciously grant to the Church peace and freedom, and that, thanks to him, Bavaria may enjoy glory and prosperity daily increasing. As a promise of these heavenly favors, and in witness of our special goodwill, we earnestly bestow on you, venerable brothers, to you, the clergy and people confided to your care, the apostolic blessing. Given at Rome, at St. Peter's, the twenty-second day of December, in the year 1887, the tenth of our pontificate. Dielaleo Tio Dielal Apostolico Seggio Encyclical of Pope Leo XIII on Freemasonry in Italy. To the bishops, the clergy, and the people of Italy. Venerable brethren and beloved children, health and apostolic benediction. Italy has come to this. From the height of the apostolic throne, where divine providence has placed us to watch over the salvation of all nations, we look upon Italy in whose bosom, by an act of singular predilection, God has established the see of his vicar, and from which come to us at the present time many and most bitter sorrows. It is not any personal offense that saddens us nor the privations and sacrifices imposed upon us by the present condition of things, nor the outrages and scoffs which an insolent press has full power to hurl every day against us. If only our person were concerned, and not the ruin to which Italy threatened in its faith is hastening, we should bear these offenses without complaint, rejoicing even to repeat what one of our most illustrious predecessors said of himself. If the captivity of my country did not every moment for each day increase, as to the contempt and scorn of myself I should joyfully be silent. 1. But besides the independence and dignity of the Holy See, the religion itself and the salvation of a whole nation are concerned, of a nation which from the earliest times opened its bosom to the Catholic faith and has ever jealously preserved it. Incredible it seems, but it is true, to such a pass have we come, that we have to fear for this Italy of ours the loss even of the faith. Many times have we sounded the alarm, to give warning of the danger, but we do not therefore think that we have done enough. In face of the continued and fiercer assaults that are made, we hear the voice of duty calling upon us more powerfully than before to speak to you again, venerable brethren, to your clergy, and to the whole Italian people. As the enemy makes no truce, so either you nor we must remain silent, or inert. By the divine mercy we have been constituted guardians and defenders of the religion of the people entrusted to our care, pastors and watchful sentinels of the flock of Christ, and for this flock we must be ready, if need be, to sacrifice everything, even life itself. The Object of the Encyclical 2. We shall not say anything new, for facts have not changed from what they were and we have had at other times to speak of them when occasion was given. But we now intend to recapitulate these facts in some way, and to group them into one picture, so as to draw out for general instruction the consequences which flow from them. The facts are incontestable which have happened in the clear light of day, not separated one from another, but so connected together as in their series to reveal with fullest evidence a system of which they are the actual operation and development. 
The system is not new, but the audacity, the fury, and the rapidity with which it is now carried out are new. It is the plan of the sex that is now unfolding itself in Italy, especially in what relates to the Catholic religion and the Church, with the final and avowed purpose, if it were possible, of reducing it to nothing. It is needless now to put the Masonic sects upon their trial. They are already judged, their ends, their means, their doctrines, and their action are all known with indisputable certainty. Possessed by the spirit of Satan, whose instrument they are, they burn like him with a deadly and implacable hatred of Jesus Christ and of his work, and they endeavor by every means to overthrow and fetter it. This war is at present waged more than elsewhere in Italy, in which the Catholic religion has taken deeper root, and above all in Rome, the center of Catholic unity, and the see of the universal pastor and teacher of the Church. 3. It is well to trace from the beginning the different phases of this warfare. Facilis des census Averni. 4. The war began by the overthrow of the civil power of the popes, the downfall of which, according to the secret intentions of the real leaders, afterwards openly avowed, was, under a political pretext, to be the means of enslaving at least, if not of destroying the supreme spiritual power of the Roman pontiffs, that no doubt might remain as to the true object of this warfare. There followed quickly the suppression of the religious orders, and thereby a great reduction in the number of evangelical laborers for the propagation of the faith amongst the heathens, and for the sacred ministry and religious service of Catholic countries. Later, the obligation of military service was extended to ecclesiastics, with the necessary result that many and grave obstacles were put to the recruiting and due formation even of the secular clergy. Hands were laid upon ecclesiastical property, partly by absolute confiscation, and partly by charging it with enormous burdens, so as to impoverish the clergy and the church, and to deprive the church of what is necessary for its temporal support and for carrying on institutions and works in aid of its divine apostolate. This the sectaries themselves have openly declared. To lessen the influence of the clergy and of clerical bodies, one only efficacious means must be employed, to strip them of all their goods, and to reduce them to absolute poverty. So also the action of the state is of itself all directed to efface from the nation its religious and Christian character. From the laws, and from the whole of official life, Every religious inspiration and idea is systematically banished, when not directly assailed. Every public manifestation of faith and of Catholic piety is either forbidden or, under vain pretenses, in a thousand ways impeded. From the family are taken away its foundation and religious constitution by the proclaiming of civil marriage, as it is called, and also by the entirely lay education which is now demanded from the first elements to the higher teaching of the universities, so that the rising generations, as far as this can be affected by the state, have to grow up without any idea of religion, and without the first essential notions of their duties towards God. This is to put the axe to the root. No more universal and efficacious means could be imagined of withdrawing society, and families, and individuals, from the influence of the church and of the faith. To lay clericalism, or Catholicism, waste in its foundations and in its very sources of life, namely, in the school and in the family, such is the authentic declaration of Masonic writers. Italy among the fallen. 5. It will be said that this does not happen in Italy only, but is a system of government which states generally follow. We answer that this does not refute but confirms what we are saying as to the designs and action of Freemasonry in Italy. Yes, this system is adopted and carried out wherever Freemasonry uses its impious and wicked action, and, as its action is widespread, so is this anti-Christian system widely applied. But the application becomes more speedy in general, and is pushed more to extremes, in countries where the government is more under the control of the sect and better promotes its interests. Unfortunately, at the present time the new Italy is of the number of these countries. Not today only has it become subject to the wicked and evil influence of the sex, but for some time past they have tyrannized over it as they liked, with absolute dominion and power. Here the direction of public affairs, 
and what concerns religion, is wholly in conformity with the aspirations of the sex, and for accomplishing their aspirations, they find avowed supporters and ready instruments in those who hold the public power. Laws adverse to the church and measures hostile to it are first proposed, decided, and resolved, in the secret meetings of the sect, and if anything presents even the least appearance of hostility or harm to the church, it is at once received with favor and put forward. Amongst the most recent facts we may mention the approval of the new penal code, in which what was most obstinately demanded, in spite of all reasons. To the contrary, were the articles against the clergy, which form for them an exceptional law, and even condemn as criminal certain actions which are sacred duties of their ministry. The law as to pious works, by which all charitable property, accumulated by the piety and religion of our ancestors under the protection and guardianship of the church, was withdrawn altogether from the church's action and control, had been for some years put forward in the meetings of the sect, precisely because it would inflict a new outrage on the church, lessen its social influence, and suppress at once a great number of bequests made for divine worship. Then came that eminently sectarian work, the erection of the monument to the renowned apostate of Nola, which, with the aid and favor of the government, was promoted, determined, and carried out by means of Freemasonry, whose most authorized spokesmen were not ashamed to acknowledge its purpose and to declare its meaning. Its purpose was to insult the papacy, its meaning that, instead of the Catholic faith, must now be substituted the most absolute freedom of examination, of criticism, of thought, and of conscience. And what is meant by such language in the mouth of the sects is well known. The seal was put by the most explicit declarations made by the head of the government, which were to the following effect, that the true and real conflict, which the government has the merit of understanding, is the conflict between faith and the church on one side and free examination and reason on the other. That the church may try to act as it has done before, to enchain a new reason and free thought, and to prevail. But the government in this conflict declares itself openly in favor of reason as against faith and takes upon itself the task of making the Italian state the evident expression of this reason and liberty, a sad task, which has just now been boldly reaffirmed on a like occasion. The Masonic Ideal 6. In the light of such facts and such declarations as these, it is more than ever clear that the ruling idea which, as far as religion is concerned, controls the course of public affairs in Italy, is the realization of the Masonic program. We see how much has already been realized, we know how much still remains to be done, and we can foresee with certainty that, so long as the destinies of Italy are in the hands of sectarian rulers or of men subject to the sex, the realization of the program will be pressed on, more or less rapidly according to circumstances, unto its complete development. The action of the sex is at present directed to attain the following objects, according to the votes and resolutions passed in their most important assemblies. Votes and resolutions inspired throughout by a deadly hatred of the church, the abolition in the schools of every kind of religious instruction, and the founding of institutions in which even girls are to be withdrawn from all clerical influence, whatever it may be, because the state, which ought to be absolutely atheistic, has the inalienable right and duty to form the heart and the spirit of its citizens and no school should exist apart from its inspiration and control. The rigorous application of all laws now in force, which aim at securing the absolute independence of civil society from clerical influence, the strict observance of laws suppressing religious corporations, and the employment of means to make them effectual, the regulation of all ecclesiastical property, starting from the principle that its ownership belongs to the state and its administration to the civil power the exclusion of every Catholic or clerical element from all public administrations, from pious works, hospitals, and schools, from the councils which govern the destinies of the country, from academical and other unions, from companies, committees, and families, and exclusion from everything, everywhere, and forever. Instead, the Masonic influence is to make itself felt in all the circumstances of social life, and to become master and controller of everything. Hereby the way will be smoothed towards the abolition of the papacy, 
Italy will thus be free from its implacable and deadly enemy, and Rome, which in the past was the center of universal theocracy will in the future be the center of universal secularization, whence the Magna Carta of human liberty is to be proclaimed in the face of the whole world. Such are the authentic declarations, aspirations, and resolutions of Freemasons or of their assemblies. 7. Without exaggeration, this is the present condition and the future prospect of religion in Italy. To shrink from seeing the gravity of this would be a fatal error. To recognize it as it is, to confront it with evangelical prudence and fortitude, to infer the duties which it imposes on all Catholics, and upon us especially who as pastors have to watch over them and guide them to salvation, is to enter into the views of providence, to do a work of wisdom and pastoral zeal. As far as we are concerned, the apostolic office lays upon us the duty of protesting loudly once more against all that has been done, is doing, or is attempted in Italy to the harm of religion. Defending and guarding the sacred rights of the Church and of the pontificate, we openly repel and denounce to the whole Catholic world the outrages which the Church and the pontificate are continually receiving, especially in Rome, and which hamper us in the government of the Catholic Church and add difficulty and indignity to our condition. We are determined not to omit anything on our part which can serve to maintain the faith lively and vigorous amidst the Italian people, and to protect it against the assaults of its enemies. We, therefore, make appeal, venerable brethren, to your zeal and your great love for souls, in order that, possessed with a sense of the gravity of the danger which they incur, you may apply the proper remedies and do all you can to dispel this danger. Thus shall you fight. 8. No means must be neglected that are in your power. All the resources of speech, every expedient in action, all the immense treasures of help and grace which the Church places in your hands, must be made use of, for the formation of a clergy learned and full of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, for the Christian education of youth, for the extirpation of evil doctrines, for the defense of Catholic truths, and for the maintenance of the Christian character and spirit of family life. 9. As to the Catholic people, before everything else it is necessary that they should be instructed as to the true state of things in Italy with regard to religion, the essentially religious character of the conflict in Italy against the pontiff, and the real object constantly aimed at, so that they may see by the evidence of facts the many ways in which their religion is conspired against and may be convinced of the risk they run of being robbed and spoiled. Of the inestimable treasure of the faith. With this conviction in their minds, and having at the same time a certainty that without faith it is impossible to please God and to be saved, they will understand that what is now at stake is the greatest, not to say the only interest, which every one on earth is bound before all things, at the cost of any sacrifice, to put out of danger, under penalty of everlasting misery. They will, moreover, easily understand that, in this time of open and raging conflict, it would be disgraceful for them to desert the field and hide themselves. Their duty is to remain at their post, and openly to show themselves to be true Catholics by their belief and by actions in conformity with their faith. This they must do for the honor of their faith, and the glory of the sovereign leader whose banner they follow, and that they may escape that great misfortune of being disowned at the last day, and of not being recognized as his by the supreme judge who has declared that whosoever is not with him is against him. Without ostentation or timidity, let them give proof of that true courage which arises from the consciousness of fulfilling a sacred duty before God and men. To this frank profession of faith Catholics must unite a perfect docility and filial love towards the Church, a sincere respect for their bishops, and an absolute devotion and obedience to the Roman pontiff. In a word, they will recognize how necessary it is to cease from everything that is the work of the sex, or that receives impulse or favor from them, as being undoubtedly infected by the anti-Christian spirit, and they will, on the contrary, devote themselves with activity, courage and constancy, to Catholic works, and to the associations and institutions which the Church has blessed, and which the bishops and the Roman pontiff encourage and sustain. Moreover, seeing that the chief instrument employed by our enemies is the press, which in great part receives from them its inspiration and support, it is important that Catholics should oppose the evil press by a press that is good, 
for the defense of truth, out of love for religion, and to uphold the rights of the Church. While the Catholic press is occupied in laying bare the perfidious designs of the sects, in helping and seconding the action of the sacred pastors, and in defending and promoting Catholic works, it is the duty of the faithful efficaciously to support this press, both by refusing or ceasing to favor in any way the evil press, and also directly, by concurring, as far as each one can, in helping it to live and thrive. And in this matter we think that hitherto enough has not been done in Italy. Lastly, the teaching addressed by us to all Catholics, especially in the encyclicals, Humanum Genus, and Sapienti Christiani, should be particularly applied to the Catholics of Italy, and be impressed upon them, if they have anything to suffer or to sacrifice. Through remaining faithful to these duties, let them take courage in the thought that the kingdom of heaven suffereth violence, and is gained only by doing violence to ourselves, and that he who loves himself, and what is his own more than Jesus Christ, is not worthy of him. The example of the many invincible champions who, throughout all time, have generously sacrificed everything for the faith, and the special helps of grace which make the yoke of Jesus Christ sweet and his burden light, ought to animate powerfully their courage and to sustain them in the glorious contest. From another point of view. 10. So far we have considered only the religious side of the present state of things in Italy, inasmuch as this is for us the most essential and the subject which eminently concerns us by reason of the apostolic office which we hold. But it is worthwhile to consider also the social and political side, so that Italians may see that not only the love of religion, but also the noblest and sincerest love of country should stir them to resist the impious attempts of the sections. As a convincing proof of this, it suffices to take note of the kind of future, in the social and political order, which is being prepared for Italy by men whose object is and they make no secret of it to wage an unrelenting war against Catholicism and the papacy. 11. Already the test of the past speaks eloquently for itself. What Italy has become in this first period of its new life, as to public and private morality, internal safety, order and peace, national wealth and prosperity, all this is known to you by facts, venerable brethren, better than we could describe it in words. The very men whose interest it would be to hide all this are constrained by truth to admit it. We will only say that, under present conditions, though a sad but real necessity, things could not be otherwise. The Masonic sect, with all its boast of a spirit of beneficence and philanthropy, can only exercise an evil influence and influence which is evil because it attacks and endeavors to destroy the religion of Christ, the true benefactress of mankind. Without religion ye are not. 12. All know with what salutary effect and in how many ways the influence of religion penetrates society. It is beyond dispute that sound public and private morality gives honor and strength to states. But it is equally certain that, without religion there is no true morality, either public or private. From the family, solidly based on its natural foundations, comes the life, the growth, and the energy of society. But without religion, and without morality, the domestic partnership has no stability, and the family bonds grow weak and waste away. The prosperity of peoples and of nations comes from God and from His blessings. If a people does not attribute its prosperity to Him, but rises up against Him, and in the pride of its heart tacitly tells Him that it has no need of Him, its prosperity is but a semblance, certain to disappear so soon as it shall please the Lord to confound the proud insolence of His enemies. It is religion which, penetrating to the depth of each one's conscience, makes him feel the force of duty and urges him to fulfill it. It is religion which gives to rulers feelings of justice and love towards their subjects, which makes subjects faithful and sincerely devoted to their rulers, which makes upright and good legislators, just and incorruptible magistrates, brave and heroic soldiers, conscientious and diligent administrators. It is religion which produces concord and affection between husband and wife, love and reverence between parents and their children, which makes the poor respect the property of others, and causes the rich to make a right use of their wealth. From this fidelity to duty, and this respect for the rights of others come the order, the tranquility, and the peace, 
which forms so large a part of the prosperity of a people and of a state. Take away religion, and with it all these immensely precious benefits would disappear from society. Italy without religion. 13. For Italy, moreover, the loss would be sensible. All its glories and greatness, which for a long time gave to it the first place among the most cultured nations, are inseparable from religion, which has either produced or inspired them, or certainly has given to them favor, help, and increase. Its communes tell us of its public liberties, of its military glories we read in its many memorable enterprises against the enemies of the Christian name. Its sciences are seen in its universities which, founded, fostered, and privileged by the church, have been their home and theater. Its arts are shown in the numberless monuments of every kind with which Italy is profusely covered. Of its institutions for the relief of suffering, for the destitute, and the working classes we have evidence in its many foundations of Christian charity, in the many asylums established for every kind of need and misfortune, and in the associations and corporations which have grown up under the protection of religion. The virtue and the strength of religion are immortal because religion is from God. It has treasures of help and most efficacious remedies, which can be wonderfully adapted to the needs of every time and epoch. What religion has known how to do and has done in former times, it can do also now with a virtue ever fresh and vigorous. To take away religion from Italy is to dry up at once the most abundant source of inestimable help and benefits. The Dangers of Socialism 14. Moreover, one of the greatest and most formidable dangers of society at the present day is the agitation of the socialists, who threaten to uplift it from its foundations. From this great danger Italy is not free, and although other nations may be more infested than Italy by this spirit of subversion and disorder, it is not therefore less true that even here this spirit is widely spreading and increasing every day in strength. So criminal is its nature, so great the power of its organization and the audacity of its designs, that there is need of uniting all conservative forces, if we are to arrest its progress and successfully to prevent its triumph. Of these forces the first, and above all the chief one, is that which can be supplied by religion and the church. Without this, the strictest laws, the severest tribunals, and even the force of arms, will prove useless or insufficient. As, in old times, material force was of no avail against the hordes of barbarians, but only the power of the Christian religion, which entering into their souls quenched their ferocity, civilized their manners, and made them docile to the voice of truth and to the law of the gospel. So against the fury of lawless multitudes there will be no effectual defense without the salutary power of religion. It is only this power which, casting into their minds the light of truth, and instilling into their hearts the holy moral precepts of Jesus Christ, can make them listen to the voice of conscience and of duty, and before restraining their hand, restrain their minds and allay the violence of passion. To assail religion is therefore to deprive Italy of its most powerful ally against an enemy that becomes every day more formidable. 15. But this is not all. As, in the social order, the war against religion is becoming most disastrous and destructive to Italy, so, in the political order, the enmity against the Holy See and the Roman Pontiff is for Italy a source of the greatest evils. Even as to this, demonstration is not needed, it is enough, for the full expression of our thought, to state in few words its conclusions. The war against the Pope is for Italy, internally, a cause of profound division between official Italy and the great part of Italians who are truly Catholic and every division is a weakness. This war deprives our country of the support and co-operation of the party which is the most frankly conservative. It keeps up in the bosom of the nation a religious conflict which has never yet brought any public good, but ever bears within itself the fatal germs of evil and of most heavy chastisement. Externally, the conflict with the Holy See, besides depriving Italy of the prestige and splendor which it would most certainly have by living in peace with the pontificate, draws upon it the hostility of the Catholics of the whole world, is a cause of immense sacrifices, and may on any occasion furnish its enemies with a weapon to be used against it. 16. Such is the so-called welfare and I greatness prepared for Italy by those who, 
having its destinies in their hands, do all they can, in accordance with the impious aspiration of the sex, to overthrow the Catholic religion and the papacy. If only. 17. Suppose, instead of this, that all connection and connivance with the sex were given up, that religion and the church, as the greatest social power, were allowed real liberty and full exercise of their rights. What a happy change would come over the destinies of Italy! The evils and the dangers which we have lamented, as the result of the war against religion and the church, would cease with the termination of the conflict. And further, we should see once more flourish on the chosen soil of Catholic Italy the greatness and glory which religion and the church have ever abundantly produced. From their divine power would spring up spontaneously a reformation of public and private morality. Family ties would be strengthened, and under religious influences, the feeling of duty and of fidelity in its fulfillment would be awakened in all ranks of the people to a new life. The Social Questions which now so greatly occupy men's minds would find their way to the best and most. Complete solution by the practical application of the gospel precepts of charity and justice. Popular liberty, not allowed to degenerate into license, would be directed only to good ends, and would become truly worthy of man. The sciences, through that truth of which the church is mistress, would rise speedily to a higher excellence and so also would the arts, through the powerful inspiration which religion derives from above, and which it knows how to transfuse into the minds of men. Peace being made with the church, religious unity and civil concord would be greatly strengthened, the separation between Italy and Catholics faithful to the church would cease, and Italy would thus acquire a powerful element of order and stability. The just demands of the Roman pontiff being satisfied, and his sovereign rights acknowledged, he would be restored to a condition of true and effective independence. And Catholics of other parts of the world, who, not through external influence of ignorance of what they want, but through a feeling of faith and sense of duty, all raise their voice in defense of the dignity and liberty of the supreme pastor of their souls, would no longer have reason to regard Italy as the enemy of the pontiff. On the contrary, Italy would gain greater respect and esteem from other nations by living in harmony with the apostolic see, for not only has this see conferred special benefits on Italians by its presence in the midst of them, but also, by the constant diffusion of the treasures of faith from the center of benediction and salvation, it has made the Italian name great and respected among all nations. Italy reconciled with the pontiff, and faithful to its religion, would be able worthily to emulate the glory of its early times and from whatever real progress there is in the present age it would receive a new impulse to advance in its glorious path. Rome, preeminently the Catholic city. Destined by God to be the center of the religion of Christ and the see of his vicar, has had in. This the cause of its stability and greatness throughout the eventful changes of the many ages that are past. Placed again under the peaceful and paternal scepter of the Roman pontiff, it would again become what providence, and the course of ages made it not dwarfed to the condition of a capital of one kingdom, nor divided between two different and sovereign powers in a dualism contrary to its whole history, but the worthy capital of the Catholic world, great with all the majesty of religion and of the supreme priesthood, a teacher and an example to the nations of morality and of civilization. Founded on Iraq 18. These are not vain illusions, venerable brethren but hopes resting upon the most solid and true foundation. The assertion which for some time has been commonly repeated, that Catholics and the pontiff are the enemies of Italy, and in alliance, so to speak, with those who would overturn everything, is a gratuitous insult and a shameless calumny, artfully spread abroad by the sex to disguise their wicked designs, and to enable them to continue without obstacle their hateful work of stripping Italy of its Catholic character. The truth which is seen most clearly from what we have thus far said, is that Catholics are Italy's best friends. By keeping altogether aloof from the sex, by renouncing their spirit and their works, by striving in every way that Italy may not lose the faith, but preserve it in all its vigor, may not fight against the church, but be its faithful daughter, may not assail the pontificate, but be reconciled to it, Catholics give proof by all this of their strong and real love for the religion of their ancestors and for their country. 
Do all that you can, venerable brethren, to spread the light of truth among the people so that they may come at last to understand where their welfare and their true interest are to be found, and may be convinced that only from fidelity to religion and from peace with the Church and with the Roman Pontiff can they hope to obtain for Italy a future worthy of its glorious past. To this we would call the attention, not of those affiliated to the sects, whose deliberate purpose it is to establish the new settlement of the Italian peninsula upon the ruins of the Catholic religion, but of others who, without welcoming such malevolent designs, help these men in their work by supporting their policy, and especially of young men, who are so liable to go astray through inexperience and the predominance of mere sentiment. We would that everyone should become convinced that the course which is now followed cannot be otherwise than fatal to Italy. And in once more making known this danger, we are moved only by a consciousness of duty and by love of our country. Prayers and Benedictions 19. But for the enlightening of men's minds, we must above all ask for special help from heaven. Therefore, to our united action, venerable brethren, we must join prayer, and let it be a prayer that is general, constant, and fervent, a prayer that will offer gentle violence to the heart of God and render him merciful to Italy our country, so that he may avert from it every calamity, especially that which would be the most terrible the loss of faith. Let us take as our mediatrix with God the most glorious Virgin Mary, the invincible Queen of the Rosary, who has such great power over the forces of hell, and has so many times made Italy feel the effects of her maternal love. Let us also with confidence have recourse to the holy apostles Peter and Paul, who subjected this blessed land to the faith sanctified it by their labors, and bathed it in their blood. 20. As a pledge meanwhile of the help which we ask, and in token of our most special affection, receive the apostolic benediction, which from the depth of our heart we grant to you, venerable brethren, to your clergy, and to the Italian people. Given in Rome, at St. Peter's, on the 15th of October 1890, the thirteenth year of our pontificate. Leo XIII. Custodi di quella fide. On Freemasonry Pope Leo XIII, 1892. To the Italian people. Guardians of that faith to which the Christian nations owe their morality and civil redemption, we must dutifully discharge each one of our supreme tasks. Therefore we must raise our voice in loud protestations against the impious war which tries to take such a precious treasure away from you, beloved children. Already taught by long and sorrowful experience, you know well the terrible trials of this war, you who deplore it in your hearts as Catholics and as Italians. Can one be Italian in name and sentiment, and not resent these continual offenses against divine beliefs? These beliefs are the most beautiful of our glories, for they gave to Italy its primacy over the other nations and to Rome the spiritual scepter of the world. They likewise made the wonderful edifice of Christian civilization rise over the ruins of paganism and barbarism. Can we be Catholic in mind and heart, and gaze with dry eyes on that land where our wondrous Redeemer deigned to establish the seat of his kingdom? Now we see his teachings attacked and his reverence outraged, his church embattled and his vicar opposed. So many souls redeemed by his blood are now lost, the choicest portion of his flock a people faithful to him for nineteen centuries. How can we bear to look upon his chosen people exposed to a constant and ever-present danger of apostasy, pushed toward error and vice, material miseries, and moral degradation? 2. This war is directed at the same time against the heavenly and the earthly kingdoms, against the faith of our ancestors and the culture which they handed on to us. It is thus doubly evil, being guilty of a divine offense no less than a human one. Is its chief source not that very Masonic sect which we discussed at length in the encyclical, Humanum Genus, of April 20, 1884, and in the more recent one of October 15, 1890, addressed to the bishops, the clergy, and the Italian people? With these two letters we tore from the face of Masonry the mask which it used to hide itself, and we showed it in its crude deformity and dark fatal activity. 3. We shall restrict ourselves now to its deplorable effects on Italy. 
For a long time now it has bored its way under the deceitful guise of a philanthropic society and redeemer of the Italian people. By way of conspiracies, corruptions, and violences, it has finally come to dominate Italy and even Rome. To what troubles, to what calamities has it opened the way in a little more than thirty years? 4. Our country has seen and suffered great evils in such a short span of time, for the faith of our fathers has been made a sign for persecutions of every sort. The satanic intent of the persecutors has been to substitute naturalism for Christianity, the worship of reason for the worship of faith, so-called independent morality for Catholic morality, and material progress for spiritual progress. To the holy maxims and laws of the gospel, they have opposed laws and maxims which can be called the code of revolution. They have also opposed an atheistic doctrine and a vile realism to school, science, and the Christian arts. Having invaded the temple of the Lord, they have squandered the booty of the church's goods, the greatest part of the inheritance necessary for the ministers, and reduced the number of priests by the conscription of clerics beyond the limits of extreme need. If the administration of the Sacraments could not be impeded, they sought nonetheless to introduce and promote civil marriages and funerals. If they have not yet succeeded in seizing control of education and the direction of charitable institutions, they always aim with perseverance to lay aside everything, which is to remove the mark of Christianity from it. If they could not silence the voice of the Catholic press, they made every effort to discredit and revile it. 5. In this battle against the Catholic religion, what partiality and contradictions there are. They closed monasteries and convents, but they let multiply at will Masonic lodges and sectarian dens. They proclaimed the right of association, while the legal rights which all kinds of organizations use and abuse are denied to religious societies. They proclaim freedom of religion and reserve odious intolerance and vexations precisely for the religion of the Italians, which, for that reason, should be assured respect and a special protection. They made protests and great promises for the protection of the dignity and independence of the Pope, but you see their daily contempt of our person. All kinds of public shows find an open field, yet this or that Catholic demonstration is either prohibited or disturbed. They encourage schisms, apostasies, and revolts against legitimate superiors in the Church. Religious Vows and especially religious obedience are rebuked as contrary to human dignity and freedom. While impious associations which bind their followers by wicked oaths and demand blind, absolute obedience and crime are allowed to flourish with impunity. 6. We do not wish to exaggerate the Masonic power by attributing to its direct and immediate action all the evils which presently preoccupy us. However, you can clearly see its spirit in the facts which we have just recorded and in many others which we could recall. That spirit, which is the implacable enemy of Christ and of the Church, tries all ways, uses all arts, and prevails upon all means. It seizes from the Church its firstborn daughter and seizes from Christ his favored nation, the seat of his vicar on earth, and the center of Catholic unity. To see the evil and efficacious influence of this spirit on our affairs— we have more than a few fleeting indications and a series of facts which have succeeded themselves for thirty years. Proud of its successes, the sect herself has spoken out and told us all its past accomplishments and future goals. It regards the public powers as its instruments, witting or not, which is to say that the impious sect boasts as one of its principal works the religious. Persecution which has troubled and is troubling our Italy. Though often executed by other hands, this persecution is inspired and promoted by masonry, in an immediate or mediate, direct or indirect manner, by flattery or threats, seduction or revolution. 7. The road is very short from religious to social ruin. The heart of man is no longer raised to heavenly hopes and loves. Capable and needing the infinite, it throws itself insatiably on the goods of this earth. Inevitably there is a perpetual struggle of avid passions to enjoy, become rich, and rise. Then we encounter a large and inexhaustible source of grudges, discords, corruptions, and crimes. In our Italy there was no lack of moral and social disorders before the present events, but what a sorrowful spectacle we see in our days. 
that loving respect which forms domestic harmony is substantially diminished. Paternal authority is too often unrecognized by children and parents alike. Disagreements are frequent, divorce common. Civil discords and resentful anger between the various orders increase every day in the cities. New generations which grew up in a spirit of misunderstood freedom are unleashed in the cities, generations which do not respect anything from above or below. The cities team with incitements to vice, precocious crimes, and public scandals. The state should be content with the high and noble office of recognizing, protecting, and helping divine and human rights in their harmonious universality. Now, however, the state believes itself almost a judge and disowns these rights or restricts them at will. Finally, the general social order is undermined at its foundations. Books and journals, schools and universities, clubs and theaters, monuments, and political discourse, photographs and the fine arts, everything conspires to pervert minds and corrupt hearts. Meanwhile the oppressed and suffering people tremble and the anarchic sects arouse themselves. The working classes raise their heads and go to swell the ranks of socialism, communism, and anarchy. Characters exhaust themselves and many souls, no longer knowing how to suffer nobly nor how to redeem themselves manfully, take their lives with cowardly suicide. 8. Such are the fruits which the Masonic sect has borne to us Italians. And after that it yearns to come before you, extolling its merits towards Italy. It likewise yearns to give us and all those who, heeding our words, remain faithful to Jesus Christ, the calumnious title of enemies of the state. The facts reveal the merits of this guilty sect toward our peninsula, merits, which bear repeating. The facts say that Masonic patriotism is no less than sectarian egotism which yearns to dominate everything, particularly the modern states which unite and concentrate everything in their hands. The facts say that in the plans of masonry, the names of political independence, equality, civilization, and progress aim to facilitate the independence of man from God in our country. From them, license of error and vice and union of faction at the expense of other citizens have grown. The easy and delicious. Enjoyment of life by the world's fortunate is nurtured in the same source. A people redeemed. By divine blood have thus returned to divisions, corruptions, and the shames of paganism. 9. That does not surprise us. After nineteen centuries of Christian civilization, this sect tries to overthrow the Catholic Church and to cut off its divine sources. It absolutely denies the supernatural, repudiating every revelation and all the means of salvation which revelation shows us. Through its plans and works, it bases itself solely and entirely on such a weak and corrupt nature as ours. Such a sect cannot be anything other than the height of pride, greed, and sensuality. Now pride oppresses, greed plunders, and sensuality corrupts. When these three concupiscences are brought to the extreme, the oppressions, greed, and seductive corruption spread slowly. They take on boundless dimensions and become the oppression, plundering and source of corruption of an entire people. 10. Let us then show you masonry as an enemy of God, church, and country. Recognize it as such once and for all, and with all the weapons which reason, conscience, and faith put in your hands, defend yourselves from such a proud foe. Let no one be taken in by its attractive appearance, or allured by its promises. Do not be seduced by its enticements or frightened by its threats. Remember that Christianity and masonry are essentially irreconcilable such that to join one is to divorce the other. You can no longer ignore such incompatibility between Catholic and Mason, beloved children. You have been warned openly by our predecessors, and we have loudly repeated the warning. 11. Those who, by some supreme misfortune, have given their name to one of these societies of perdition should know that they are strictly bound to separate themselves from it. Otherwise they must remain separated from Christian communion and lose their soul now and for eternity. Parents, teachers, godparents, and whoever has care of others should also know that a rigorous duty binds them to keep their wards from this guilty sect or to draw them from it if they have already entered. 12. In a matter of such importance, and where the seduction is so easy in these times, it is urgent that the Christian watch himself from the beginning. He should fear the least danger. Avoid every occasion, 
and take the greatest precautions. Use all the prudence of the serpent, while keeping in your heart the simplicity of the dove, according to the evangelical counsel. Fathers and mothers should be wary of inviting strangers into their homes or admitting them to domestic intimacy, at least in so far as their faith is not sufficiently known. They should try to. First ascertain that an astute recruiter of the sect does not hide himself in the guise of a friend, teacher, doctor or other benefactor. Oh, in how many families has the wolf penetrated in sheep's clothing? 13. It is beautiful to see the varied groups which arise everywhere today in every order of social life, worker groups, groups of mutual aid and social security, organizations to promote science, arts, letters, and other similar things. When they are inspired by a good moral and religious spirit, these groups certainly prove to be useful and proper. But because the Masonic poison has penetrated and continues to penetrate here also, especially here, any groups that remove themselves from religious influence should be generally suspect. They can easily be directed and more or less dominated by Masons, becoming the sowing ground and the apprenticeship of the sect in addition to providing assistance to it. 14. Women should not join philanthropic societies whose nature and purpose are not well known without first seeking advice from wise and experienced people. That talkative philanthropy which is opposed to Christian charity with such pomp is often the passport for Masonic business. 15. Everyone should avoid familiarity or friendship with anyone suspected of belonging to Masonry or to affiliated groups. Know them by their fruits and avoid them. Every familiarity should be avoided, not only with those impious libertines who openly promote the character of the sect, but also with those who hide under the mask of universal tolerance respect for all religions, and the craving to reconcile the maxims of the gospel with those of the revolution. These men seek to reconcile Christ and Belial, the church of God and the state without God. 16. Every Christian should shun books and journals which distill the poison of impiety and which stir up the fire of unrestrained desires or sensual passions. Groups and reading clubs where the Masonic spirit stalks its prey should be likewise shunned. 17. In addition, since we are dealing with a sect which has pervaded everything, it is not enough to remain on the defensive. We must courageously go out into the battlefield and confront it. That is what you will do, beloved children, opposing press to press, school to school, organization to organization, congress to congress, action to action. 18. Masonry has taken control of the public schools, leaving private schools, paternal schools, and those directed by zealous ecclesiastics and religious of both sexes to compete in the education of Christian youth. Christian parents especially should not entrust the education of their children to uncertain schools. Masonry has confiscated the inheritance of public charity, filled the void, then, with the treasure of private relief. It has placed pious works in the hands of its followers, so you should entrust those that depend on you to Catholic institutions. It opens and maintains houses of vice, leaving you to do what is possible to open and maintain shelters for honesty and danger. An anti-Christian press in religious and secular matters militates at its expense, so that your effort and money are required by the Catholic press. Masonry establishes societies of mutual help and credit unions for its partisans. You should do the same not only for your brothers but for all the indigent. This will show that true and Sincere charity is the daughter of the one who makes the sun to rise and the rain to fall on the just man and sinner alike. 19. May this struggle between good and evil extend to everything, and may good prevail. Masonry holds frequent meetings to plan new ways to combat the church, and you should hold them frequently to better agree on the means and order of defense. It multiplies its lodges, so that you should multiply Catholic clubs and parochial groups promote charitable associations and prayer organizations, and maintain and increase the splendor of the temple. Of God. The sect, having nothing to fear, today shows its face to the light of day. You Italian Catholics should also make open profession of your faith and follow the example of your glorious ancestors who confessed their faith bravely before tyrants, torture, and death. What more? Does the sect try to enslave the church and to put it at the feet of the state as a humble servant? 
you must then demand and claim for it the freedom and independence do it before the law. Does masonry seek to tear apart Catholic unity, sowing discord even in the clergy itself, arousing quarrels, fomenting strife, and inciting insubordination, revolt, and schism? By tightening the sacred bond of charity and obedience, you can thwart its plans, bring to naught its efforts, and disappoint its hopes. Be all of one heart and one mind, like the first Christians. Gathered around the sea of Peter and united to your pastors, protect the supreme interests of church and papacy, which are just as much the supreme interests of Italy and of all the Christian world. The Apostolic See has always been the inspirer and jealous guardian of Italian glory. Therefore, be Italians and Catholics, free and non-sectarian, faithful to the nation as well as to Christ and his visible vicar. An anti-Christian and anti-papal Italy would truly be opposed to the divine plan, and thus condemned to perish. 20. Beloved children, faith and state speak to you at this time through us. Listen to their cry, arise together and fight manfully the battles of the Lord. May the number, boldness, and strength of the enemy not frighten you, because God is stronger than they. If God is for you, who can be against you? 21. Redouble your prayers so that God might be with you in a greater abundance of grace, fighting and triumphing with you. Accompany your prayers with the practice of the Christian virtues, especially charity toward the needy. Seek God's mercies with humility and perseverance, renewing every day the promises of your baptism. 22. As a pledge of these things and as a sign of our paternal love, we bestow on you our apostolic blessing, beloved children. Given in Rome at St. Peter's, the 8th day of December, 1892, in the 15th year of our pontificate. Aini Micah Vis On Freemasonry Pope Leo XIII, 1892 To the Bishops of Italy The enemy forces, inspired by the evil spirit, ever wage war on the Christian name. They join forces in this endeavor with certain groups of men whose purpose is to subvert divinely revealed truths and to rend the very fabric of Christian society with disastrous dissent. Indeed, how much damage these cohorts, as it were, have inflicted on the Church is well known. And yet, the spirit of all previous groups hostile to Catholic institutions has come to life again in that group called the Masonic Sect which, strong in manpower and resources, is the leader in a war against anything sacred. 2. Our predecessors in the Roman pontificate have in the course of a century and a half outlawed this group not once, but repeatedly. We too, in accordance with our duty, have condemned it strongly to Christian people, so that they might beware of its wiles and bravely repel its impious assaults. Moreover, lest cowardice and sloth overtake us imperceptibly, we have deliberately endeavored to reveal the secrets of this pernicious sect and the means by which it labors for the destruction of the Catholic enterprise. 3. Now, though, a certain thoughtless indifference on the part of many Italians has resulted in their not recognizing the magnitude and extent of the peril. And so the faith of our ancestors, the salvation won for mankind by Jesus Christ, and consequently the great benefits of Christian civilization are endangered. Indeed, Fearing nothing and yielding to no one, the Masonic sect proceeds with greater boldness day by day. With its poisonous infection it pervades entire communities and strives to entangle itself and all the institutions of our country in its conspiracy to forcefully deprive the Italian people of their Catholic faith, the origin and source of their greatest blessings. 4. This is the reason for the endless artifices they employ in their assault on the divinely inspired faith. This is the reason why the legitimate liberty of the church is treated with contempt and beset with legal oppression. They believe that the church does not possess the nature and essence of a true society, that the state has priority over it, and that civil authority takes precedence over sacred authority. This false and destructive doctrine has been frequently condemned by the Holy See. Among many other ills, it has been responsible for the usurpation on the part of civil authorities of that to which they have no right and for their unscrupulous appropriation of what they have alienated from the church. This is clear in the case of ecclesiastical benefices, 
they usurp the right to give or withhold the revenues of these according to their good pleasure. 5. Likewise, in a manner no less insidious, they plan to soften the opposition of the lower clergy with their promises. Their purpose in this endeavor can easily be detected, especially since the very authors of this undertaking do not take sufficient pains to conceal what they intend. They wish to win over the clergy by cajoli. Once the novelties have confused them, they will withdraw their obedience to legitimate authority. And yet in this matter they seem to have underestimated the virtue of our clergy, who for so many years have given manifest examples of their moderation and loyalty. We have every reason to be confident that, with God's help, they will continue their devotion to duty no matter what circumstances may arise. 6. This summary indicates both the extent of the activity of the Masonic sect and the goal of its endeavors. What compounds this harmful situation, however, and causes us deep anxiety is that far too many of our compatriots, driven by hope of their personal advantage or by perverse ambition, have given their names or support to the sect. This being so, we commend first and foremost to your efforts the eternal salvation of those whom we have just mentioned. May your zeal never waver in constantly and insistently recalling them from their error and certain destruction. To be sure, the task of extricating those who have fallen into the snares of the Masons is laborious, and its outcome is doubtful. If we consider the cleverness of the sect, still the recovery of no one should ever be despaired of since the force of apostolic charity is truly marvelous. 7. Next, we must heal those who have erred in this respect out of faint-heartedness, that is, those who, not because of a debased nature but because of weakness of spirit and lack of discretion, have allowed themselves to be drawn into supporting the Masonic enterprises. Sufficiently weighty are the words of our predecessor Felix III in this regard. An error which is not resisted is approved, a truth which is not defended is suppressed. He who does not oppose an evident crime is open to the suspicion of secret complicity. By reminding them of the examples of their forefathers, the broken spirits of these men must be reanimated with that courage which is the guardian of duty and dignity alike, so that they may be ashamed and regret their cowardly actions. For surely our whole life is involved in a constant battle in which our salvation itself is at stake. Nothing is more disgraceful for a Christian than cowardice. 8. It is likewise necessary to strengthen those who fall because of ignorance. By this we mean those, not few in number, who, deceived by appearances and allured by various enticements, allow themselves without understanding it to be enrolled in the Masonic order. In these cases we hope that with divine inspiration they will be able some day to repudiate their error and perceive the truth, especially if you try to remove the false outward appearance of the sect and reveal its hidden designs. Indeed these can no longer be considered hidden since their very accomplices have themselves disclosed them in many ways. Why, within the last few months, the designs of the Masons have been publicly proclaimed throughout Italy, even to the point of ostentation. They wish to see the religion founded by God repudiated in all affairs, private as well as public, regulated by the principles of naturalism alone. This is what, in their impiety and stupidity, they call the restoration of civil society. And yet the state will plunge headlong into ruin if Christians are not willing to be vigilant and not willing to labor to support its well-being. 9. But in the presence of such audacious evils, it is not sufficient merely to be aware of the wiles of this vile sect. We must also war against it, using those very arms furnished by the divine faith which once prevailed against paganism. Therefore, it is your task to inflame souls by persuasion, exhortation and example, nourish in the clergy and our people a zeal for religion and salvation which is active, resolute, and intrepid. These qualities frequently distinguish Catholic peoples of other nations in similar situations. It is commonly claimed that the ancient ardor of spirit in protecting their ancestral faith has grown cold among the Italian people. Nor is this perhaps false, especially since if the dispositions of both sides be inspected, those who wage war on religion seem to show more energy than those who repel it. But for those who seek salvation there can be no middle ground between laborious struggle and destruction. Therefore, in the case of the weak and sluggish, courage must be stirred up. Through your efforts, in the case of the strong, 
it must be kept active, with all trace of dissent. Wiped out, under your leadership and command, the result will be that all alike, with united minds and common discipline, may undertake the battle in a spirited manner. 10. Because of the gravity of the matter and the necessity of repelling the danger, we have decided to address the Italian people in a letter which we are including along with this one, propagated as widely as possible and, where needed, interpret it to your people. In this manner, with the blessing of God, we can hope that spirits may be aroused through the contemplation of the threatening evils and betake themselves without delay to the remedies which we have pointed out. 11. As a presage of divine gifts and testimony of our benevolence we affectionately accord to you, venerable brethren, and the people entrusted to your care, the apostolic blessing. Given in Rome at St. Peter's, December 8, 1892, in the fifteenth year of our pontificate. Preclara Gradulationis Publici the Reunion of Christendom Pope Leo XIII, 1894 To our venerable brethren, all patriarchs, primates, archbishops and bishops of the Catholic world in grace and communion with the Apostolic See. Venerable brethren, health and apostolic benediction. The splendid tokens of public rejoicing which have come to us from all sides in the whole course of last year, to commemorate our Episcopal Jubilee and which were lately crowned by the remarkable devotion of the Spanish nation, have afforded us special joy, inasmuch as the unity of the Church and the admirable adhesion of her members to the Sovereign Pontiff have shown forth in this perfect agreement of concurring sentiments. During those days it seemed as if the Catholic world, forgetful of everything else, had centered its gaze and all its thoughts upon the Vatican. The special missions sent by kings and princes, the many pilgrimages, the letters we received so full of affectionate feeling, the sacred services, everything clearly brought out the fact that all Catholics are of one mind and of one heart in their veneration for the apostolic see. And this was all the more pleasing and agreeable to us, that it is entirely in conformity with our intent and with our endeavors. For, indeed, well acquainted with our times, and mindful of the duties of our ministry, we have constantly sought during the whole course of our pontificate and striven, as far as it was possible, by teaching and action, to bind every nation and people more closely to us, and make manifest everywhere the salutary influence of the See of Rome. Therefore, do we most earnestly offer thanks in the first place to the goodness of God, by whose help and bounty we have been preserved to attain our great age, and then, next, to all the princes and rulers, to the bishops and clergy, and to as many as have cooperated by such repeated tokens of piety and reverence to honor our character and office, while affording us personally such seasonable consolation. A great deal, however, has been wanting to the entire fullness of that consolation. Amidst these very manifestations of public joy and reverence our thoughts went out towards the immense multitude of those who are strangers to the gladness that filled all Catholic hearts, some because they lie in absolute ignorance of the gospel others because they dissent from the Catholic belief, though they bear the name of Christians. This thought has been, and is, a source of deep concern to us, for it is impossible to think of such a large portion of mankind deviating, as it were, from the right path, as they move away from us, and not experience a sentiment of innermost grief. But since we hold upon this earth the place of God Almighty, who will have all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth, and now that our advanced age and the bitterness of anxious cares urge us on towards the end common to every mortal, we feel drawn to follow the example of our Redeemer and Master, Jesus Christ, who, when about to return to heaven, implored of God, his Father, in earnest prayer, that his disciples and followers should be of one mind and of one heart. I pray that they all may be one, as thou Father in me, and I in thee, that they also may be one in us. And as this divine prayer and supplication does not include only the souls who then believed in Jesus Christ, but also every one of those who were henceforth to believe in him, this prayer holds out to us no indifferent. Reason for confidently expressing our hopes, 
and for making all possible endeavors in order that the men of every race and clime should be called and moved to embrace the unity of divine faith. Pressed on to our intent by charity, that hastens fastest there where the need is greatest, we direct our first thoughts to those most unfortunate of all nations who have never received the light of the gospel, or who, after having possessed it, have lost it through neglect or the vicissitudes of time. Hence do they ignore God, and live in the depths of error. Now, as all salvation comes from Jesus Christ, for there is no other name under heaven given to men whereby we must be saved, our ardent desire is that the most holy name of Jesus should rapidly pervade and fill every land. And here, indeed, is a duty which the Church, faithful to the divine mission entrusted to her, has never neglected. What has been the object of her labors for more than nineteen centuries? Is there any other work she has undertaken with greater zeal and constancy than that of bringing the nations of the earth to the truth and principles of Christianity? Today, as ever, by our authority, the heralds of the gospel constantly cross the seas to reach the farthest corners of the earth, and we pray God daily that in his goodness he may deign to increase the number of his ministers who are really worthy of this apostolate, and who are ready to sacrifice their convenience, their health, and their very life, if need be in order to extend the frontiers of the kingdom of Christ. Do thou, above all, O Savior and Father of mankind, Christ Jesus, hasten and do not delay to bring about what thou didst once promise to do, that when lifted up from the earth thou wouldst draw all things to thyself. Come, then, at last, and manifest thyself to the immense multitude of souls who have not felt, as yet, the ineffable blessings which thou hast earned for men with thy blood. Rouse those who are sitting in darkness and in the shadow of death, that, enlightened by the rays of thy wisdom and virtue, in thee and by thee, they may be made perfect in one. As we consider the mystery of this unity we see before us all the countries which have long since passed, by the mercy of God, from time-worn error to the wisdom of the gospel. Nor could we, indeed, Recall anything more pleasing or better calculated to extol the work of divine providence that the memory of the days of yore, when the faith that had come down from heaven was looked upon as the common inheritance of one and all, when civilized nations, separated by distance, character and habits, in spite of frequent disagreements and warfare on other points, were united by Christian faith in all that concerned religion. The recollection of that time causes us to regret all the more deeply that as the ages rolled by the waves of suspicion and hatred arose, and great and flourishing nations were dragged away, in an evil hour, from the bosom of the Roman Church. In spite of that, however, we trust in the mercy of God's almighty power, in Him who alone can fix the hour of His benefits, and who has power to incline man's will as he pleases and we turn to those same nations, exhorting and beseeching them with fatherly love to put an end to their dissensions and return again to unity. First of all, then, we cast an affectionate look upon the East, from whence in the beginning came forth the salvation of the world. Yes, and the yearning desire of our heart bids us conceive and hope that the day is not far distant when the Eastern churches, so illustrious in their ancient faith and glorious past, will return to the fold they have abandoned. We hope it all the more that the distance separating them from us is not so great, nay, with some few exceptions, we agree so entirely on other heads that, in defense of the Catholic faith, we often have recourse to reasons and testimony borrowed from the teaching, the rites, and customs of the East. The principal subject of contention is the primacy of the Roman pontiff. But let them look back to the early years of their existence. Let them consider the sentiments entertained by their forefathers, and examine what the oldest traditions testify, and it will, indeed, become evident to them that Christ's divine utterance, Thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, has undoubtedly been realized in the Roman pontiffs. Many of these latter in the first gates of the church were chosen from the east, and foremost among them Anacletus, Everestus, Anicetus, Eleutherius, Zosimus, and Agatho, and of these a great number after governing the church in wisdom and sanctity, consecrated their ministry with the shedding of their blood. The time, the reasons, the promoters of the unfortunate division, are well known. Before the day when man separated what God had joined together, the name of the 
apostolic see was held in reverence by all the nations of the Christian world, and the East, like the West, agreed without hesitation in its obedience to the pontiff of Rome, as the legitimate successor of St. Peter, and therefore, the vicar of Christ here on earth. And accordingly, if we refer to the beginning of the dissension, we shall see that Photius himself was careful to send his advocates to Rome on the matters that concerned him, and Pope Nicholas I sent his legates to Constantinople from the Eternal City, without the slightest opposition, in order to examine the case of Ignatius the Patriarch with all diligence, and to bring back to the Apostolic See a full and accurate report, so that the history of the whole negotiation is a manifest confirmation of the primacy of the Roman See with which the dissension then began. Finally, in two great councils, the second of Lyons and that of Florence, Latins and Greeks, as is notorious, easily agreed, and all unanimously proclaimed as dogma the supreme power of the Roman pontiffs. We have recalled those things intentionally, for they constitute an invitation to peace and reconciliation, and with all the more reason that in our own days it would seem as if there were a more conciliatory spirit towards Catholics on the part of the Eastern churches and even some degree of kindly feeling. To mention an instance, those sentiments were lately made manifest when some of our faithful traveled to the East on a holy enterprise, and received so many proofs of courtesy and goodwill. Therefore, our mouth is open to you, to you all of Greek or other Oriental rites who are separated from the Catholic Church. We earnestly desire that each and every one of you should meditate upon the words, so full of gravity and love, addressed by Bessarion to your forefathers. What answer shall we give to God when he comes to ask why we have separated from our brethren, to him who, to unite us and bring us into one fold, came down from heaven, was incarnate, and was crucified? What will our defense be in the eyes of posterity? O oh, my venerable fathers, we must not suffer this to be, we must not entertain this thought, we must not thus so ill provide for ourselves and for our brethren. Weigh carefully in your minds and before God the nature of our request. It is not for any human motive, but impelled by divine charity and a desire for the salvation of all, that we advise the reconciliation and union with the Church of Rome, and we mean a perfect and complete union, such as could not subsist in any way if nothing else was brought about but a certain kind of agreement in the tenets of belief and an intercourse of fraternal love. The true union between Christians is that which Jesus Christ, the author of the church, instituted and desired, and which consists in a unity of faith and unity of government. Nor is there any reason for you to fear on that account that we or any of our successors will ever diminish your rights, the privileges of your patriarchs, or the established ritual of any one of your churches. It has been and always will be the intent and tradition of the apostolic see to make a large allowance, in all that is right and good, for the primitive traditions and special customs of every nation. On the contrary, if you re-establish union with us, you will see how, by God's bounty, the glory and dignity of your churches will be remarkably increased. May God, then, in his goodness, hear the prayer that you yourselves address to him. Make the schisms of the churches cease, and assemble those who are dispersed, bring back those who err, and unite them to thy holy Catholic and apostolic church. May you thus return to that one holy faith which has been handed down both to us and to you. From time immemorial, which your forefathers preserved untainted, and which was enhanced. By the rival splendor of the virtues, the great genius, and the sublime learning of S.T. Athanasius and St. Basil, St. Gregory of Nazianzum and St. John Chrysostom, the two saints who bore the name of Cyril and so many other great men whose glory belongs as a common inheritance to the East and to the West. Suffer that we should address you more particularly, nations of the Slavonic race, you whose glorious name and deeds are attested by many an ancient record. You know full well how much the Slavs are indebted to the merits of St. Cyril and St. Methodius, to whose memory we ourselves have rendered due honor only a few years ago. Their virtues and their labors were to great numbers of your race the source of civilization and salvation. And hence the admirable interchange, which existed for so long between the Slavonic nations and the pontiffs of Rome, of favors on the one side and of filial devotion on the other. 
If in unhappy times many of your forefathers were separated from the faith of Rome, consider now what priceless benefits a return of unity would bring to you. The Church is anxious to welcome you also to her arms, that she may give you manifold aids to salvation, prosperity, and grandeur. With no less affection do we now look upon the nations who, at a more recent date, were separated from the Roman Church by an extraordinary revolution of things and circumstances. Let them forget the various events of times gone by, let them raise their thoughts far above all that is human, and seeking only truth and salvation, reflect within their hearts upon the Church as it was constituted by Christ. If they will but compare that Church with their own communions, and consider what the actual state of religion is in these, they will easily acknowledge that, forgetful of their early history, they have drifted away, on many and important points, into the novelty of various errors. Nor will they deny that of what may be called the patrimony of truth, which the authors of those innovations carried away with them in their desertion. There now scarcely remains to them any article of belief that is really certain and supported by authority. Nay, more, things have already come to such a pass that many do not even hesitate to root up the very foundation upon which alone rests all religion, and the hope of men, to wit, the divine nature of Jesus Christ, our Savior. And again, whereas formerly they used to assert that the books of the Old and the New Testament were written under the inspiration of God, they now deny them that authority. This, indeed, was an inevitable consequence when they granted to all the right of private interpretation. Hence, too, the acceptance of individual conscience as the sole guide and rule of conduct to the exclusion of any other. Hence those conflicting opinions and numerous sects that fall away so often into the doctrines of naturalism and rationalism. Therefore it is, that having lost all hope of an agreement in their persuasions, they now proclaim and recommend a union of brotherly love. And rightly, too, no doubt, for we should all be united by the bond of mutual charity. Our Lord Jesus Christ enjoined it most emphatically, and wished that this love of one another should be the mark of his disciples. But how can hearts be united in perfect charity where minds do not agree in faith? It is on this account that many of those we allude to men of sound judgment and seeking after truth have looked to the Catholic Church for the sure way of salvation for they clearly understand that they could never be united to Jesus Christ, as their head if they were not members of his body, which is the church, nor really acquire the true Christian faith if they rejected the legitimate teaching confided to Peter and his successors. Such men as these have recognized in the church of Rome the form and image of the true church, which is clearly made manifest by the marks that God, her author, placed upon her, and not a few who were possessed with penetrating judgment, and a special talent for historical research, have shown forth in their remarkable writings the uninterrupted succession of the Church, of Rome from the Apostles, the integrity of her doctrine, and the consistency of her rule and discipline. With the example of such men before you, our heart appeals to you even more than our words, to you, our brethren, who for three centuries and more differ from us on Christian faith, and to you all likewise, who in later times, for any reason whatsoever, have turned away from us, let us all meet in the unity of faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God. Suffer that we should invite you to the unity which has ever existed in the Catholic Church and can never fail. Suffer that we should lovingly hold out our hand to you. The Church, as the common mother of all, has long been calling you back to her. The Catholics of the world await you with brotherly love, that you may render holy worship to God together with us, united in perfect charity worship to God together with us, united in perfect charity by the profession of one gospel, one faith and one hope. To complete the harmony of this most desired unity, it remains for us to address all those throughout the world whose salvation has long been the object of our thoughts and watchful cares, we mean Catholics, whom the profession of the Roman faith, while it renders them obedient to the apostolic see, preserves in union with Jesus Christ. There is no need to exhort them to true and holy unity, since through the divine goodness they already possess it. Nevertheless, they must be admonished, lest under pressure of the growing perils on all sides around them, through negligence or indolence they should lose this great blessing of God. For this purpose, let them take this rule of thought and action, as the occasion may require, 
from those instructions which at other times we have addressed to Catholic people, either collectively or individually, and above all, let them lay down for themselves as a supreme law, to yield obedience in all things to the teaching and authority of the Church, in no narrow or mistrustful spirit, but with their whole soul and promptitude of will. On this account let them consider how injurious to Christian unity is that error, which in various forms of opinion has oft times obscured, nay, even destroyed the true character and idea of the Church. For by the will and ordinance of God, its founder, it is a society perfect in its kind, whose office and mission it is to school mankind in the precepts and teachings of the gospel, and by safeguarding the integrity of morals and the exercise of Christian virtue, to lead men to that happiness which is held out to every one in heaven. And since it is, as we have said, a perfect society, therefore it is endowed with a living power and efficacy which is not derived from any external source, but in virtue of the ordinance of God and its own constitution, inherent in its very nature. For the same reason it has an inborn power of making laws, and justice requires that in its exercise it should be dependent on no one. It must. Likewise have freedom and other matters appertaining to its rights. But this freedom is not of a kind to occasion rivalry or envy, for the church does not covet power, nor is she urged on by any selfish desire. But this one thing she does wish, this only does she seek, to preserve amongst men the duties which virtue imposes, and by this means and in this way to provide for their everlasting welfare. Therefore is she want to be yielding and indulgent as a mother. Yes, it not infrequently happens that in making large concessions to the exigencies of states, she refrains from the exercise of her own rights, as the compacts often concluded with civil governments abundantly testify. Nothing is more foreign to her disposition than to encroach on the rights of civil power, but the civil power in its turn must respect the rights of the church, and beware of arrogating them in any degree to itself. Now, what is the ruling spirit of the times when actual events and circumstances are taken into account? No other than this, it has been the fashion to regard the church with suspicion, to despise and hate and spitefully calumniate her, and more intolerable still, men strive with might and main to bring her under the sway of civil governments. Hence it is that her property has been plundered and her liberty curtailed, hence again, that the training of her priesthood has been beset with difficulties that laws of exceptional rigor have been passed against her clergy, that religious orders, those excellent safeguards of Christianity, have been suppressed and placed under a ban. In a word, the principles and practice of the regalists have been renewed with increased virulence. Such a policy is a violation of the most sacred rights of the Church, and it breeds enormous evils to states, for the very reason that it is in open conflict with the purposes of God. When God, in his most wise providence, placed over human society both temporal and spiritual authority, he intended them to remain distinct indeed, but by no means disconnected and at war with each other. On the contrary, both the will of God and the common will of human society imperatively require that the civil power should be in accord with the ecclesiastical in its rule and administration. Hence the state has its own peculiar rights and duties the church likewise has hers, but it is necessary that each should be united with the other in the bonds of concord. Thus will it come about that the close mutual relations of church and state will be freed from the present turmoil, which for manifold reasons is ill-advised and most distressing to all well-disposed persons. Furthermore, it will be brought to pass that, without confusion or separation of the peculiar interests of each, the people will render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. There is likewise a great danger threatening unity on the part of that association which goes by the name of Freemasons, whose fatal influence for a long time past oppresses Catholic nations in particular. Favored by the agitations of the times, and waxing insolent in its power and resources and success, it strains every nerve to consolidate its sway and enlarge its sphere. It has already sallied forth from its hiding places, where it hatched its plots, into the throng of cities, and as if to defy the Almighty, has set up its throne in this very city of Rome, the capital of the Catholic world. But what is most disastrous is, 
that wherever it has set its foot it penetrates into all ranks and departments of the commonwealth, in the hope of obtaining at last supreme control. This is, indeed, a great calamity, for its depraved principles and iniquitous designs are well known, under the pretense of vindicating the rights of man, and of reconstituting society, it attacks Christianity, it rejects revealed doctrine, denounces practices of piety, the divine sacraments, and every sacred thing as superstition, it strives to eliminate the Christian character from marriage and the family and the education of youth, and from every form of instruction, whether public or private, and to root out from the minds of men all respect for authority, whether human or divine. On its own part, it preaches the worship of nature, and maintains that by the principles of nature are truth and probity and justice to be measured and regulated. In this way, as is quite evident, man is being driven to adopt customs and habits of life akin to those of the heathen, only more corrupt in proportion as the incentives to sin are more numerous. Although we have spoken on this subject in the strongest terms before, yet we are led by our apostolic watchfulness to urge it once more, and we repeat our warning again and again, that in face of such an eminent peril, no precaution, howsoever great, can be looked upon as sufficient. May God in his mercy bring to naught their impious designs. Nevertheless, let all Christians know and understand that the shameful yoke of Freemasonry must be shaken off once and for all and let them be the first to shake it off who are most galled by its oppression, the men of Italy and of France. With what weapons and by what method this may best be done we ourselves have already pointed out, the victory cannot be doubtful to those who trust in that leader whose divine words still remain in all their force. I have overcome the world. Were this twofold danger averted, and government and states restored to the unity of faith, it is wonderful what efficacious remedies for evils an abundant store of benefits would ensue. We will touch upon the principal ones. The first regards the dignity and office of the church. She would receive that honor which is her due and she would go on her way, free from envy and strong in her liberty, as the minister of gospel truth and grace to the notable welfare of states. For as she has been given by God as a teacher and guide to the human race, she can contribute assistance which is peculiarly adapted to direct even the most radical transformations of time to the common good, to solve the most complicated questions, and to promote uprightness and justice, which are the most solid foundations of the commonwealth. Moreover, there would be a marked increase of union among the nations, a thing most desirable to ward off the horrors of war. We behold the condition of Europe. For many years past peace has been rather an appearance than a realty. Possessed with mutual suspicions, almost all the nations are vying with one another in equipping themselves with military armaments. Inexperienced youths are removed from paternal direction and control, to be thrown amid the dangers of the soldier's life. Robust young men are taken from agriculture or ennobling studies or trade of the arts to be put under arms. Hence the treasures of states are exhausted by the enormous expenditure, the national resources are frittered away, and private fortunes impaired, and this, as it were, armed peace, which now prevails, cannot last much longer. Can this be the normal condition of human society? Yet we cannot escape from this situation, and obtain true peace, except by the aid of Jesus Christ. For to repress ambition and covetousness and envy, the Chief instigators of war, nothing is more fitted than the Christian virtues and, in particular, the virtue of justice, for, by its exercise, both the law of nations and the faith of treaties may be maintained inviolate, and the bonds of brotherhood continue unbroken, if men are but convinced that justice exalteth a nation. As in its external relations, so in the internal life of the state itself, the Christian virtues will provide a guarantee of the commonweal much more sure and stronger far than any which laws or armies can afford. For there is no one who does not see that the dangers to public security and order are daily on the increase, since seditious societies continue to conspire for the overthrow and ruin of states, as the frequency of their atrocious outrages testifies. There are two questions, forsooth, the one called the social, and the other the political question which are discussed with the greatest vehemence. Both of them, without doubt, are of the last importance, 
and though praiseworthy efforts have been put forth in studies and measures and experiments for their wise and just solution, yet nothing could contribute more to this purpose than that the minds of men in general should be imbued with right sentiments of duty from the internal principle of Christian faith. We treated expressly of the social question in this sense a short time ago, from the standpoint of principles drawn from the gospel and natural reason. As regards the political question, which aims at reconciling liberty with authority, two things which many confound in theory, and separate too widely in practice, most efficient aid may be derived from the Christian philosophy. For, when this point has been settled and recognized by common agreement, that, whatsoever the form of government, the authority is from God, reason at once perceives that in some there is a legitimate right to command, in others the corresponding duty to obey, and that without prejudice to their dignity, since obedience is rendered to God rather than to man. And God has denounced the most rigorous judgment against those in authority, if they fail to represent him with uprightness and justice. Then the liberty of the individual can afford ground of suspicion or envy to no one, since, without injury to any, his conduct will be guided by truth and rectitude, and whatever is allied to public order. Lastly, if it be considered what influence is possessed by the church, the mother of and peacemaker between rulers and peoples, whose mission it is to help them both with her authority and counsel, then it will be most manifest how much it concerns the commonweal that all nations should resolve to unite in the same belief and the same profession of the Christian faith. With these thoughts in our mind and ancient yearnings in our heart, we see from afar what would be the new order of things that would arise upon the earth, and nothing could be sweeter to us than the contemplation of the benefits that would flow from it. It can hardly be imagined what immediate and rapid progress would be made all over the earth, in all manner of greatness and prosperity, with the establishment of tranquility and peace, the promotion of studies, the founding and the multiplying on Christian lines according to our directions, of associations for the cultivators of soil, for workmen and tradesmen, through whose agency rapacious usury would be put down, and a large field opened up for useful labors. And these abundant benefits would not be confined within the limits of civilized nations, but, like an overcharged river, would flow far and wide. It must be remembered, as we observed at the outset, that an immense number of races have been waiting, all through the long ages to receive the light of truth and civilization. Most certainly, the counsels of God with regard to the eternal salvation of peoples are far removed above the understanding of man. Yet if miserable superstition still prevails in so many parts of the world, the blame must be attributed in no small measure to religious dissensions. For, as far as it is given to human reason to judge from the nature of events, this seems without doubt to be the mission assigned by God to Europe to go on by degrees carrying Christian civilization to every portion of the earth. The beginnings and first growth of this great work, which sprang from the labors of former centuries, were rapidly receiving large development, when all of a sudden the discord of the 16th century broke out. Christendom was torn with quarrels and dissensions, Europe exhausted with contests and wars, and the sacred mission felt the baneful influence of the times. While the causes of dissension still remain, what wonder is it that so large a portion of mankind is held enthralled with barbarous customs and insane rites? Let us one and all, then, for the sake of the common welfare, labor with equal assiduity to restore the ancient concord. In order to bring about this concord, and spread abroad the benefits of the Christian revelation, the present is the most seasonable time. For never before have the sentiments of human brotherhood penetrated so deeply into the souls of men, and never in any age has man been seen to seek out his fellow men more eagerly in order to know them better and to help them. Immense tracts of land and sea are traversed with incredible rapidity, and thus extraordinary advantages are afforded not only for commerce and scientific investigations but also for the propagation of the word of God from the rising of the sun to the going down of the same. We are well aware of the long labors involved in the restoration of that order of things which we desire, and it may be that there are those who consider that we are far too sanguine and look for things that are rather to be wished for than expected. But we unhesitatingly place all our hope and confidence in the Savior of mankind, Jesus Christ, 
while remembering what great things have been achieved in times past by the folly of the cross and its preaching, to the astonishment and confusion of the wisdom of the world. We beg of princes and rulers of states, appealing to their statesmanship and earnest solicitude for the people, to weigh our counsels in the balance of truth and second them with their authority and favor. If only a portion of the look for results should come about, it will cause no inconsiderable boon in the general decadence, when the intolerable evils of the present day bring with them the dread of further evils in days to come. The last years of the past century left Europe worn out with disasters and panic-stricken with the turmoils of revolution. And why should not our present century, which is now hastening to its close, by a reversion of circumstances bequeathed to mankind the pledges of concord? with the prospects of the great benefits which are bound up in the unity of the Christian faith. May God, who is rich in mercy, and in whose power are the times and moments, grant our wishes and desires, and in his great goodness, hasten the fulfillment of that divine promise of Jesus Christ. There will be one fold and one shepherd. As a pledge of these heavenly gifts, and in witness of our good will to you, venerable brothers, and to the clergy and people committed to each of you, we most lovingly grant in the Lord the apostolic benediction. Anna Mingressi Apostolical Letter of His Holiness Pope Leo XIII to all the patriarchs, primates, archbishops and bishops of the Catholic world. Leo XIII, Pope Venerable Brothers, Health and Apostolic Benediction Having come to the twenty-fifth year of our apostolic ministry, and being astonished ourselves at the length of the way which we have traveled amidst painful and continual cares, we are naturally inspired to lift our thoughts to the ever-blessed God, who, with so many other favors, has deigned to accord us a pontificate the length of which has scarcely been surpassed in history. To the Father of all mankind, therefore, to him who holds in his hands the mysterious secret of life, ascends, as an imperious need of the heart, the canticle of our thanksgiving. Assuredly the eye of man cannot pierce all the depths of the designs of God in thus prolonging our old age beyond the limits of hope. Here we can only be silent and adore. But there is one thing which we do well understand, namely, that as it has pleased him, and still pleases him. To preserve our existence, a great duty is incumbent on us, to live for the good end. The development of his immaculate spouse, the Holy Church and far from losing courage in the midst of cares and pains, to consecrate to him the remainder of our strength unto our last sigh. After paying a just tribute of gratitude to our Heavenly Father, to whom be honor and glory for all eternity, it is most agreeable to us to turn our thoughts and address our words to you, venerable brothers, who, called by the Holy Ghost to govern the appointed portions of the flock of Jesus Christ, share thereby with us in the struggle and triumph, the sorrows and joys, of the ministry of pastors. No, they shall never fade from our memory, those frequent and striking testimonials of religious veneration which you have lavished upon us during the course of our pontificate, and which you still multiply with emulation full of tenderness in the present circumstances. Intimately united with you already by our duty and our paternal love, we are more closely drawn. By those proofs of your devotedness, so dear to our heart, less for what was personal in them in our regard than for the inviolable attachment which they denote to this apostolic see, center, and mainstay of all the seas of Catholicity. If it has always been necessary, that, according to the different grades of the ecclesiastical hierarchy, all the children of the Church should be sedulously united by the bonds of mutual charity and by the pursuit of the same objects, so as to form but one heart and one soul, this union is become in our day more indispensable than ever. For who can ignore the vast conspiracy of hostile forces which aims today at destroying and making disappear the great work of Jesus Christ, by endeavoring, with a fury which knows no limits, to rob man, in the intellectual order of the treasure of heavenly truth, and in the social order, to obliterate the most holy, the most salutary Christian institutions?
but by all this you yourselves are impressed every day. You who, more than once, have poured out to us your anxieties and anguish, deploring the multitude of prejudices, the false systems and errors which are disseminated with impunity amongst the masses of the people. What snares are set on every side for the souls of those who believe? What obstacles are multiplied to weaken, and if possible to destroy the beneficent action of the church? And, meanwhile, as if to add derision to injustice, the church herself is charged with having lost her pristine vigor, and with being powerless to stem the tide of overflowing passions which threaten to carry everything away. We would wish, venerable brothers, to entertain you with subjects less sad, and more in harmony with the great and auspicious occasion which induces us to address you. But nothing suggests such tenor of discourse, either the grievous trials of the church which call with insistence for prompt remedies, nor the conditions of contemporary society which, already undermined from a moral and material point of view, tend toward a yet more gloomy future by the abandonment of the great Christian traditions, a law of providence, confirmed by history, proving that the great religious principles cannot be renounced without shaking at the same time the foundations of order and social prosperity. In those circumstances, in order to allow souls to recover, to furnish them with a new provision of faith and courage, it appears to us opportune and useful to weigh attentively, in its origin, causes and various forms, the implacable. War that is waged against the church, and in denouncing its pernicious consequences. To indicate a remedy. May our words, therefore, resound loudly, though they but recall truths already asserted. May they be hearkened to, not only by the children of Catholic unity, but also by those who differ from us, and even by the unhappy souls who have no longer any faith, for they are all children of one Father, all destined for the same supreme good, may our words, finally, be received as the testament which, at the short distance that separates us from eternity, we would wish to leave to thee, people as a presage of the salvation which we desire for all. During the whole course of her history the Church of Christ has had to combat and suffer for truth and justice. Instituted by the divine Redeemer himself to establish throughout the world the kingdom of God, she must, by the light of the gospel law, lead fallen humanity to its immortal destinies, that is, to make it enter upon the possession of the blessings without end which God has promised us, and to which our unaided natural power could never rise, a heavenly mission, in the pursuit of which the church could not fail to be opposed by the countless passions begotten of man's primal fall and consequent corruption, pride, cupidity, unbridled desire of material pleasures, against all the vices and disorders springing from those poisonous roots the church has ever been the most potent means of restraint. Nor should we be astonished at the persecutions which have arisen, in consequence, since the divine master foretold them, and they must continue as long as this world endures. What words did he address to his disciples when sending them to carry the treasure of his doctrines to all nations? They are familiar to us all. You will be persecuted from city to city. You will be hated and despised for my name's sake. You will be dragged before the tribunals and condemned to extreme punishment. And wishing to encourage them for the hour of trial, he proposed himself as their example. If the world hate you, know ye that it hath hated me before you. St. John 15, 18 Certainly, no one, who takes a just and unbiased view of things, can explain the motive of this hatred. What offense was ever committed, what hostility deserved by the divine Redeemer? Having come down amongst men through an impulse of divine charity, he had taught a doctrine that was blameless, consoling, most efficacious to unite mankind. In a brotherhood of peace and love, he had coveted neither earthly greatness nor honor. He had usurped no one's right. On the contrary, he was full of pity for the weak, the sick, the poor, the sinner and the oppressed. Hence his life was but a passage to distribute with munificent hand his benefits amongst men. We must acknowledge, in consequence, that it was simply by an excess of human malice, so much the more deplorable because unjust, that, nevertheless, he became, in truth, according to the prophecy of Simeon, a sign to be contradicted. What wonder, then, if the Catholic Church, which continues his divine mission, 
and is the incorruptible depositary of his truths, has inherited the same lot? The world is always consistent in its way. Near the sons of God are constantly present the satellites of that great adversary of the human race, who a rebel from the beginning against the Most High, is named in the gospel the prince of this world. It is on this account that the spirit of the world, in the presence of the law and of him who announces it in the name of God, swells with the measureless pride of an independence that ill befits it. Alas, how often, in more stormy epochs, with unheard of cruelty and shameless injustice, and to the evident undoing of the whole social body, have the adversaries banded themselves together for the foolhardy enterprise of dissolving the work of God, and not succeeding with one manner of persecution, they adopted others. For three long centuries the Roman Empire, abusing its brute force, scattered the bodies of martyrs through all its provinces, and bathed with their blood every foot of ground in the sacred city of Rome, while heresy, acting in concert, whether hidden beneath a mask or with open effrontery, with sophistry and snare, endeavored to destroy at least the harmony and unity of faith. Then were set loose, like a devastating tempest, the hordes of barbarians from the north, and the Moslems from the south, leaving in there. Wake only ruins in a desert. So has been transmitted from age to age the melancholy heritage of hatred by which the spouse of Christ has been overwhelmed. There followed a Caesarism as suspicious as powerful, jealous of all other power, no matter what development it might itself have thence acquired, which incessantly attacked the church, to usurp her rights and tread her liberties underfoot. The heart bleeds to see. This mother so often oppressed with anguish and woes unutterable. However, triumphing over every obstacle, over all violence and all tyrannies, she pitched her peaceful tents more and more widely. She saved from disaster the glorious patrimony of arts, history, science and letters, and imbuing deeply the whole body of society with the spirit of the gospel, she created Christian civilization, that civilization to which the nations, subjected to its beneficent influence. O oh, the equity of their laws, the mildness of their manners, the protection of the weak, pity for the afflicted and the poor, respect for the rights and dignity of all men, and thereby, as far as it is possible amidst the fluctuations of human affairs, that calm of social life which springs from the just and prudent alliance between justice and liberty. Those proofs of the intrinsic excellence of the church are as striking and sublime as they have been enduring. Nevertheless, as in the Middle Ages and during the first centuries, so in those near our own, we see the church assailed more harshly, in a certain sense at least, and more distressingly than ever. Through a series of well-known historical causes, the pretended reformation of the sixteenth century raised the standard of revolt, and determining to strike straight into the heart of the church, audaciously attacked the papacy. It broke the precious link of the ancient unity of faith and authority, which, multiplying a hundredfold, power, prestige and glory, thanks to the harmonious pursuit of the same objects, united all nations under one staff and one shepherd. This unity being broken, a pernicious principle of disintegration was introduced amongst all ranks of Christians. We do not, indeed, hereby pretend to affirm that from the beginning there was a set purpose of destroying the principle of Christianity in the heart of society, but by Refusing, on the one hand, to acknowledge the supremacy of the Holy See, the effective cause and bond of unity, and by proclaiming, on the other, the principle of private judgment, the divine structure of faith was shaken to its deepest foundations and the way was open to infinite variations, to doubts and denials of the most important things, to an extent which the innovators themselves had not foreseen. The way was opened. Then came the contemptuous and mocking philosophism of the eighteenth century, which advanced farther. It turned to ridicule the sacred canon of the scriptures and rejected the entire system of revealed truths, with the purpose of being able ultimately to root out from the conscience of the people all religious belief and stifling within it the last breath of the spirit of Christianity. It is from this source that have flowed rationalism, pantheism, naturalism and materialism, poisonous and destructive systems which, under different appearances, renew the ancient errors. Triumphantly refuted by the fathers and doctors of the church, so that the pride of 
modern times, by excessive confidence in its own lights, was stricken with blindness, and like paganism, subsisted thenceforth on fancies, even concerning the attributes of the human soul and the immortal destinies which constitute our glorious heritage. The struggle against the church thus took on a more serious character than in the past, no less because of the vehemence of the assault than because of its universality. Contemporary unbelief does not confine itself to denying or doubting articles of faith. What it combats is the whole body of principles which sacred revelation and sound philosophy maintain, those fundamental and holy principles which teach man the supreme object of his earthly life, which keep him in the performance of his duty, which inspire his heart with courage and resignation, and which in promising him incorruptible justice and perfect happiness beyond the tomb, enable him to subject time to eternity earth to heaven. But what takes the place of these principles which form the incomparable strength bestowed by faith? A frightful skepticism, which chills the heart and stifles in the conscience every magnanimous aspiration. This system of practical atheism must necessarily cause, as in point of fact it does, a profound disorder in the domain of morals, for, as the greatest philosophers of antiquity have declared, Religion is the chief foundation of justice and virtue. When the bonds are broken which unite man to God, who is the sovereign legislator and universal judge, a mere phantom of morality remains, a morality which is purely civic and, as it is termed, independent, which, abstracting from the eternal mind and the laws of God, descends inevitably till it reaches the ultimate conclusion of making man a law unto himself. Incapable in consequence, of rising on the wings of Christian hope to the goods of the world beyond, man will seek a material satisfaction in the comforts and enjoyments of life. There will be excited in him a thirst for pleasure, a desire of riches and an eager quest of rapid and unlimited wealth, even at the cost of justice. There will be enkindled in him every ambition and a feverish and frenzied desire to gratify them even in defiance of law, and he will be swayed by a contempt for right and for public authority as well as by licentiousness of life which, when the condition becomes general, will mark the real decay of society. Perhaps we may be accused of exaggerating the sad consequences of the disorders of which we speak. No, for the reality is before our eyes and warrants but too truly our forebodings. It is manifest that if there is not some betterment soon, the bases of society will crumble and drag down with them the great, and eternal principles of law and morality. It is in consequence of this condition of things that the social body, beginning with the family, is suffering such serious evils. For the lay state, forgetting its limitations and the essential object of the authority which it wields, has laid its hands on the marriage bond to profane it, and has stripped it of its religious character. It has dared as much as it could in the matter of that natural right which parents possess to educate their children and in many countries it has destroyed the stability of marriage by giving a legal sanction to the licentious institution of divorce. All know the result of these. Attacks. More than words can tell they have multiplied marriages which are prompted. Only by shameful passions, which are speedily dissolved and which, at times, bring about bloody tragedies, at others the most shocking infidelities. We say nothing of the innocent offspring of these unions, the children who are abandoned or whose morals are corrupted on one side by the bad example of the parents, on the other by the poison which the officially lay state constantly pours into their hearts. Along with the family, the political and social order is also endangered by doctrines which ascribe a false origin to authority, and which have corrupted the genuine conception of government. For if sovereign authority is derived formally from the consent of the people and not from God, who is the supreme and eternal principle of all power, it loses in the eyes of the governed its most august characteristic and degenerates into an artificial sovereignty which rests on unstable and shifting bases, namely, the will of those from whom it is said to be derived. Do we not see the consequences of this error in the carrying out of our laws? Too often these laws instead of being sound reason formulated in writing are but the expression of the power of the greater number and the will of the predominant political party. It is thus that the mob is cajoled in seeking to satisfy its desires, that a loose rein is given to popular passion, 
even when it disturbs the laboriously acquired tranquility of the state, when the disorder in the last extremity can only be quelled by violent measures and the shedding of blood. Consequent upon the repudiation of those Christian principles which had contributed so efficaciously to unite the nations in the bonds of brotherhood, and to bring all humanity into one great family, there has arisen little by little in the international order, a system of jealous egoism, in consequence of which the nations now watch each other, if not with hate, at least with the suspicion of rivals. Hence, in their great undertakings they lose sight of the lofty principles of morality and justice and forget the protection which the feeble and the oppressed have a right to demand. In the desire by which they are actuated to increase their national riches, they regard only the opportunity which circumstances afford, the advantages of successful enterprises and the tempting bait of an accomplished fact, sure that no one will trouble them in the name of right or the respect which right can claim. Such are the fatal principles which have consecrated material power as the supreme law of the world and to them is to be imputed the limitless increase of military establishments, and that armed peace, which in many respects is equivalent to a disastrous war. This lamentable confusion in the realm of ideas has produced restlessness among the people, outbreaks, and the general spirit of rebellion. From these have sprung the frequent popular agitations and disorders of our times which are only the preludes of much more terrible disorders in the future. The miserable condition, also, of a large part of the poorer classes, who assuredly merit our assistance, furnishes an admirable opportunity for the designs of scheming agitators, and especially of socialist factions, which hold out to the humbler classes the most extravagant promises and use them to carry out the most dreadful projects. Those who start on a dangerous descent are soon hurled down in spite of themselves into the abyss. Prompted by an inexorable logic, a society of veritable criminals has been organized, which, at its very first appearance, has, by its savage character, startled the world. Thanks to the solidarity of its construction and its international ramifications, it has already attempted its wicked work, for it stands in fear of nothing and recalls before no danger. Repudiating all union with society, and cynically scoffing at law, religion and morality, its adepts have adopted the name of anarchists, and proposed to utterly subvert the actual conditions of society by making use of every means that a blind and savage passion can suggest. And as society draws its unity and its life from the authority which governs it, so it is against authority that anarchy directs its efforts. Who does not feel a thrill of horror, indignation and pity at the remembrance of the many victims that of late have fallen beneath its blows, emperors, empresses, kings, presidents of powerful republics, whose only crime was the sovereign power with which they were invested? In presence of the immensity of the evils which overwhelm society and the perils which menace it, our duty compels us to again warn all men of goodwill, especially those who occupy exalted positions, and to conjure them as we now do, to devise what remedies the situation calls for and with prudent energy to apply them without delay. First of all, it behooves them to inquire what remedies are needed, and to examine well their potency in the present needs. We have extolled liberty and its advantages to the skies and have proclaimed it as a sovereign remedy and an incomparable instrument of peace and prosperity which will be most fruitful in good results. But facts have clearly shown us that it does not possess the power which is attributed to it. Economic conflicts, struggles of the classes are surging around us like a conflagration on all sides, and there is no promise of the dawn of the day of public tranquility. In point of fact, and there is no one who does not see it, liberty as it is now understood, that is to say, a liberty granted indiscriminately to truth and to error, to good and to evil, ends. Only in destroying all that is noble, generous and holy, and in opening the gates still. Wider to crime, to suicide and to a multitude of the most degrading passions. The doctrine is also taught that the development of public instruction, by making the people more polished and more enlightened, would suffice as a check to unhealthy tendencies and to keep man in the ways of uprightness and probity. But a hard reality has made us feel every day more and more of how little avail is instruction without religion and morality. As a necessary consequence of inexperience, 
and of the promptings of bad passion, the mind of youth is enthralled by the perverse teachings of the day. It absorbs all the errors which an unbridled press does not hesitate to so broadcast, and which depraves the mind and the will of youth and foments in them that spirit of pride and insubordination which so often troubles the peace of families and cities. So also was confidence reposed in the progress of science. Indeed the century which has just closed has witnessed progress that was great, unexpected, stupendous. But is it true that it has given us all the fullness and healthfulness of fruitage that so many expected from it? Doubtless the discoveries of science have opened new horizons to the mind. It has widened the empire of man over the forces of matter and human life. Has been ameliorated in many ways through its instrumentality. Nevertheless, every one feels and many admit that the results have not corresponded to the hopes that were cherished. It cannot be denied, especially when we cast our eyes on the intellectual and moral status of the world as well as on the records of criminality when we hear the dull murmurs which arise from the depths, or when we witness the predominance which might has won over right. Not to speak of the throngs who are a prey to every misery, a superficial glance at the condition of the world will suffice to convince us of the indefinable sorrow which weighs upon souls and the immense void which is in human hearts. Men may subject nature to his sway, but matter cannot give him what it has not, and to the questions which most deeply affect our gravest interests human science gives no reply. The thirst for truth, for good, for the infinite, which devours us, has not been slaked, nor have the joys and riches of earth, nor the increase of the comforts of life ever soothed the anguish which tortures the heart. Are we then to despise and fling aside the advantages which accrue from the study of science? from civilization and the wise and sweet use of our liberty? Assuredly not. On the contrary, we must hold them in the highest esteem, guard them and make them grow as a treasure of great price, for they are means which of their nature are good, designed by God himself, and ordained by the infinite goodness and wisdom for the use and advantage of the human race. But we must subordinate the use of them to the intentions of the Creator and so employ them as never to eliminate the religious element in which their real advantage resides, for it is that which bestows on them a special value and renders them really fruitful. Such is the secret of the problem. When an organism perishes and corrupts, it is because it had ceased to be under the action of the causes which had given it its form and constitution, to make it healthy and Flourishing again it is necessary to restore it to the vivifying action of those same causes. So society in its foolhardy effort to escape from God has rejected the divine order and revelation, and it is thus withdrawn from the salutary efficacy of Christianity which is manifestly the most solid guarantee of order, the strongest bond of fraternity, and the inexhaustible source of public and private virtue. This sacrilegious divorce has resulted in bringing about the trouble which now disturbs the world. Hence it is the pale of the church which this lost society must re-enter, if it wishes to recover its well-being, its repose and its salvation. Just as Christianity cannot penetrate in the soul without making it better, so it cannot enter into public life without establishing order. With the idea of a God who governs all, who is infinitely wise, good and just, the idea of duty seizes upon the consciences of men. It assuages sorrow, it calms hatred, it engenders heroes. If it has transformed pagan society, and that transformation was a veritable resurrection, for barbarism disappeared in proportion as Christianity extended its sway, so, after the terrible shocks which unbelief has given to the world in our days, it will be able to put that world again on the true road, and bring back to order the states and peoples of modern times. But the return to Christianity will not be efficacious and complete if it does not restore the world to a sincere love of the one holy Catholic and Apostolic Church. In the Catholic Church Christianity is incarnate. It identifies itself with that perfect, spiritual, and in its own order, sovereign society, which is the mystical body of Jesus Christ and which has for its visible head the Roman Pontiff, successor of the Prince of the Apostles. It is the continuation of the mission of the Savior, the daughter, and the heiress of his redemption. It has preached the gospel, and has defended it at the price of its blood, and strong in the divine assistance, 
and of that immortality which have been promised it, it makes no terms with error, but remains faithful to the commands which it has received to carry the doctrine of Jesus Christ to the uttermost limits of the world and to the end of time and to protect it in its inviolable integrity. Legitimate dispensatrix of the teachings of the gospel it does not reveal itself only as the consoler and redeemer of souls, but it is still more the internal source of justice and charity, and the propagator as well as the guardian of true liberty, and of that equality which alone is possible here below. In applying the doctrine of its divine founder, it maintains a wise equilibrium and marks the true limits between the rights and privileges of society. The equality which it proclaims does not destroy the distinction between the different social classes. It keeps them intact, as nature itself demands, in order to oppose the anarchy of reason emancipated from faith, and abandoned to its own devices. The liberty which it gives in no wise conflicts with the rights of truth, because those rights are superior to the demands of liberty. Nor does it infringe upon the rights of justice, because those rights are superior to the claims of mere numbers or power. Nor does it assail the rights of God because they are superior to the rights of humanity. Learn all about the prophecies of Our Lady of Good Success about our times. In the domestic circle, the Church is no less fruitful in good results. For not only does it oppose the nefarious machinations which incredulity resorts to in order to attack the life of the family, but it prepares and protects the union and stability of marriage, whose honor, fidelity and holiness it guards and develops. At the same time it sustains and cements the civil and political order by giving on one side most efficacious aid to authority, and on the other by showing itself favorable to the wise reforms and the just aspirations of the classes that are governed, by imposing respect for rulers and enjoining whatever obedience is due to them, and by defending unwaveringly the imprescriptible rights of the human conscience. And thus it is that the people who are subject to her influence have no fear of oppression because she checks in their efforts the rulers who seek to govern as tyrants. Fully aware of this divine power, we, from the very beginning of our pontificate, have endeavored to place in the clearest light the benevolent designs of the Church and to increase as far as possible, along with the treasures of her doctrine the field of her salutary action. Such has been the object of the principal acts of our pontificate notably in the encyclicals on Christian philosophy, on human liberty, on Christian marriage, on Freemasonry, on the powers of government, on the Christian constitution of states, on socialism, on the labor question, and the duties of Christian citizens and other analogous subjects. But the ardent desire of our soul has not been merely to illumine the mind. We have endeavored to move and to purify hearts by making use of all our powers to cause Christian virtue to flourish among the peoples. For that reason we have never ceased to bestow encouragement and counsel in order to elevate the minds of men to the goods of the world beyond, to enable them to subject the body to the soul, their earthly life to the heavenly one, man to God. Blessed by the Lord, our word has been able to increase and to strengthen the convictions of a great number of men, to throw light on their minds in the difficult questions of the day to stimulate their zeal and to advance the various works which have been undertaken. It is especially for the disinherited classes that these works have been inaugurated, and have continued to grow in every country, as is evident from the increase of Christian charity which has always found in the midst of the people its favorite field of action. If the harvest has not been more abundant, venerable brothers, let us adore God who is mysteriously just and beg Him, at the same time, to have pity on the blindness of so many souls, to whom unhappily the terrifying word of the apostle may be addressed. The God of this world has blinded the minds of unbelievers that the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should not shine to them. 2. Corinthians 4. 4. The more the Catholic Church devotes itself to extend its zeal for the moral and material advancement of the peoples, the more the children of darkness arise in hatred against it and have recourse to every means in their power to tarnish its divine beauty and paralyze its action of life-giving reparation. How many false reasonings have they not made and how many calumnies have they not spread against it? Among their most perfidious devices is that which consists in repeating to the ignorant masses and to suspicious governments that the Church is opposed to the progress of science, that it is hostile to liberty, 
that the rights of the state are usurped by it, and that politics is a field which it is constantly invading. Such are the mad accusations that have been a thousand times repudiated and a thousand times refuted by sound reason and by history and, in fact, by every man who has a heart for honesty and a mind for truth. The Church the Enemy of Knowledge and Instruction Without doubt she is the vigilant guardian of revealed dogma, but it is this very vigilance which prompts her to protect science and to favor the wise cultivation of the mind. No. In submitting his mind to the revelation of the word, who is the supreme truth from whom all truths must flow, man will in no wise contradict what reason discovers. On the contrary, the light which will come to him from the divine word will give more power and more clearness to the human intellect, because it will preserve it from a thousand uncertainties and errors. Besides, nineteen centuries of a glory achieved by Catholicism and all the branches of learning amply suffice to refute this calumny. It is to the Catholic Church that we must ascribe the merit of having propagated and defended Christian philosophy, without which the world would still be buried in the darkness of pagan superstitions and in the most abject barbarism. It has preserved and transmitted to all generations the precious treasure of literature and of the ancient sciences. It has opened the first schools for the people and crowded the universities which still exist, or whose glory is perpetuated even to our own days. It has inspired the loftiest, the purest, and the most glorious literature, while it has gathered under its protection men whose genius in the arts has never been eclipsed. The Church the Enemy of Liberty Ah, how they travesty the idea of liberty which has. For its object one of the most precious of God's gifts, when they make use of its name to justify its abuse and excess. What do we mean by liberty? Does it mean the exemption from all laws, the deliverance from all restraint, and as a corollary, the right to take man's caprice as a guide in all our actions? Such liberty the church certainly reproves, and good and honest men reprove it likewise. But do they mean by liberty the rational faculty to do good, magnanimously, without check or hindrance and according to the rules which eternal justice has established? That liberty which is the only liberty worthy of man, the only one useful to society, none favors or encourages or protects more than the church. By the force of its doctrine and the efficaciousness of its action the church has freed humanity from the yoke of slavery in preaching to the world the great law of equality and human fraternity. In every age it has defended the feeble and the oppressed against the arrogant domination of the strong. It has demanded liberty of Christian conscience while pouring out in torrents the blood of its martyrs. It has restored to the child and to the woman the dignity and the noble prerogatives of their nature in making them share by virtue the same right that reverence and justice which is their due, and it has largely contributed both to introduce and maintain civil and political liberty in the heart of the nations. The Church the Usurper of the Rights of the State The Church Invading the Political Domain Why? The Church knows and teaches that her divine Founder has commanded us to give to Caesar what is Caesar's and to God what is God's, and that he has thus sanctioned the immutable principle of an enduring distinction between those two powers which are both sovereign in their respective spheres, a distinction which is most pregnant in its consequences and eminently conducive to the development of Christian Civilization in its spirit of charity it is a stranger to every hostile design against the state. It aims only at making these two powers go side by side for the advancement of the same object, namely, for man and for human society, but by different ways and in conformity with the noble plan which has been assigned for its divine mission. Would to God that its action was received without mistrust and without suspicion. It could not fail to multiply the numberless benefits of which we have already spoken. To accuse the Church of ambitious views is only to repeat the ancient calumny, a calumny which its powerful enemies have more than once employed as a pretext to conceal their own purposes of oppression. Far from oppressing the state, history clearly shows when it is read without prejudice, that the Church like its divine founder has been, on the contrary, most commonly the victim of oppression and injustice. The reason is that its power rests not on the force of arms, but on the strength of thought and of truth. It is therefore assuredly with malignant purpose that they hurl against the church accusations like these. 
It is a pernicious and disloyal work, in the pursuit of which above all others a certain sect of darkness is engaged, a sect which human society these many years carries within itself, and which like a deadly poison destroys its happiness. Its fecundity and its life. Abiding personification of the revolution, it constitutes a sort of retrogressive society whose object is to exercise an occult suzerainty over the established order, and whose whole purpose is to make war against God and against his church. There is no need of naming it, for all will recognize in these traits the society of Freemasons, of which we have already spoken, expressly in our encyclical, Humanum Genus of the 20th of April 1884. While denouncing its destructive tendency, its erroneous teachings and its wicked purpose of embracing in its far-reaching grasp almost all nations, and uniting itself to other sects which its secret influences puts in motion, directing first and afterwards retaining its members by the advantages which it procures for them, bending governments to its will, sometimes by promises and sometimes by threats. It has succeeded in entering all classes of society, and forms an invisible and irresponsible state existing within the legitimate state, full of the spirit of Satan who, according to the words of the apostle, knows how to transform himself at need into an angel of light. It gives prominence to its humanitarian object, but it sacrifices everything to its sectarian purpose and protests that it has no political aim, while in reality it exercises the most profound action on the legislative and administrative life of the nations, and while loudly professing its respect for authority, and even for religion, has for its ultimate purpose, as its own statutes declare, the destruction of all authority as well, as of the priesthood, both of which it holds up as the enemies of liberty. It becomes more evident day by day that it is to the inspiration and the assistance of this sect that we must attribute in great measure the continual troubles with which the church is harassed, as well as the recrudescence of the attacks to which it has recently been subjected for the simultaneousness of the assaults and the persecutions which have so suddenly burst upon us in these later times, like a storm from a clear sky, that is to say without any cause proportionate to the effect, the uniformity of means employed to inaugurate this persecution, namely, the press, public assemblies, theatrical productions, the employment in every country of the same arms, to wit, calumny and public uprisings, all this betrays clearly the identity of purpose and a program drawn up by one and the same central direction. All this is only a simple episode of a prearranged plan carried out on a constantly widening field to multiply the ruins of which we speak. Thus they are endeavoring by every means in their power first to restrict and then to completely exclude religious instruction from the schools so as to make the rising generation unbelievers or indifferent to all religion, as they are endeavoring by the daily press to combat the morality of the church, to ridicule its practices and its solemnities. It is only natural, consequently, that the Catholic priesthood, whose mission is to preach religion and to administer the sacraments, should be assailed with a special fierceness. In taking it as the object of their attacks the sect aims at diminishing in the eyes of the people its prestige and its authority. Already their audacity grows hour by hour in proportion as it flatters itself that it can do so with impunity. It puts a malignant interpretation on all the acts of the clergy, bases suspicion upon the slenderest proofs and overwhelms it with the vilest accusations. Thus new prejudices are added to those with which the clergy are already overwhelmed, such for example as their subjection to military service, which is such a great obstacle for the preparation for the priesthood, and the confiscation of the ecclesiastical patrimony which the pious generosity of the faithful had founded. As regards the religious orders and religious congregations, the practice of the evangelical councils made them the glory of society and the glory of religion. These very things rendered them more culpable in the eyes of the enemies of the church and were the reasons why they were fiercely denounced and held up to contempt and hatred. It is a great grief for us to recall here the odious measures which were so undeserved and so strongly condemned by all honest men by which the members of religious orders were lately overwhelmed. Nothing was of avail to save them, either. The integrity of their life which their enemies were unable to assail, 
know the right which authorizes all natural associations entered into for an honorable purpose, nor the right of the constitutions which loudly proclaim their freedom to enter into those organizations, nor the favor of the people who were so grateful for the precious services rendered in the arts, in the sciences, and in agriculture, and for the charity which poured itself out upon the most numerous and poorest classes of society. And hence it is that these men and women who themselves had sprung from the people and who had spontaneously renounced all the joys of family to consecrate to the good of their fellow men, and those peaceful associations, their youth, their talent, their strength and their lives, were treated as malefactors as if they had formed criminal associations, and have been excluded from the common and prescriptive rights at the very time. When men are speaking loudest of liberty, we must not be astonished at the most. Beloved children are struck when the father himself, that is to say, the head of Catholicity, the Roman pontiff, is no better treated. The facts are known to all. Stripped of the temporal sovereignty and consequently of that independence which is necessary to accomplish his universal and divine mission, forced in Rome itself to shut himself up in his own dwelling because the enemy has laid siege to him on every side, he has been compelled in spite of the derisive assurances of respect and of the precarious promises of liberty to an abnormal condition of existence which is unjust and unworthy of his exalted ministry. We know only too well the difficulties that are each instant created to thwart his intentions and to outrage his dignity. It only goes to prove what is every day more and more evident that it is the spiritual power of the head of the church which little by little they aim at destroying when they attack the temporal power of the papacy. Those who are the real authors of this spoliation have not hesitated to confess it. Judging by the consequences which have followed, this action was not only impolitic, but was an attack on society itself. For the assaults that are made upon religion are so many blows struck at the very heart of society. In making man a being destined to live in society, God in his providence has also founded the church, which as the holy text expresses it, he has established on Mount. Zion in order that it might be a light which, with its life-giving rays, would cause the principle of life to penetrate into the various degrees of human society by giving it divinely inspired laws, by means of which society might establish itself in that order which would be most conducive to its welfare. Hence in proportion as society separates itself from the church, which is an important element in its strength, by so much does it decline or its woes are multiplied for the reason that they are separated whom God wished to bind together. As for us, we never weary as often as the occasion presents itself to inculcate these great truths, and we desire to do so once again, and in a very explicit manner on this extraordinary occasion. May God grant that the faithful will take courage from what we say and be guided to unite their efforts more efficaciously for the common good, that they may be more enlightened and that our adversaries may understand the injustice which they commit in persecuting the most loving mother and the most faithful benefactress of humanity. We would not wish that the remembrance of these afflictions should diminish in the souls of the faithful that full and entire confidence which they ought to have in the divine assistance. For God, in his own hour and in his mysterious ways, will bring about a certain victory. As for us, no matter how great the sadness which fills our heart, we do not fear for the immortal destiny of the church. As we have said in the beginning, persecution is its heritage, because in trying and in purifying its children, God thereby obtains for them greater and more precious advantages. And in permitting the church to undergo these trials he manifests the divine assistance which he bestows upon it, for he provides new and unlooked for means of assuring the support and the development of his work, while revealing the futility of the powers which are leagued against it. Nineteen centuries of a life passed in the midst of the ebb and flow. Of all human vicissitudes teach us that the storms pass by without ever affecting the foundations of the church. We are able all the more to remain unshaken in this confidence, as the present time affords indications which forbid depression. We cannot deny that the difficulties that confront us are extraordinary and formidable but there are also facts before our eyes which give evidence, at the same time, that God is fulfilling his promises with admirable wisdom and goodness. 
while so many powers conspire against the church and while she is progressing on her way deprived of all human help and assistance, is she not in effect carrying on her gigantic work in the world and is she not extending her action in every clime and every nation? Expelled by Jesus Christ, the prince of this world can no longer exercise his proud dominion as heretofore. And although doubtless the efforts of Satan may cause us many a woe, they will not achieve the object at which they aim. Already a supernatural tranquility due to the Holy Ghost who provides for the church and who abides in it reigns not only in the souls of the faithful but also throughout Christianity. A tranquility whose serene development we witness everywhere, thanks to the Union. Ever more and more close and affectionate with the Apostolic See, a union which is in marvelous contrast with the agitation, the dissension, and the continual unrest of the various sects which disturb the peace of society. There exists also between bishops and clergy a union which is fruitful in numberless works of zeal and charity. It exists likewise between the clergy and laity who more closely knit together, and more completely freed from human respect than ever before are awakening to a new life and organizing with a generous emulation in defense of the sacred cause of religion. It is this union which we have so often recommended, and which we recommend again, which we bless that it may develop still more and may rise like an impregnable wall against the fierce violence of the enemies of God. There is nothing more natural than that like the branches which spring from the roots. Of the tree, these numberless associations which we see with joy flourish in our days in the bosom of the church should arise, grow strong and multiply. There is no form of Christian piety which has been omitted whether there is question of Jesus Christ himself, or his adorable mysteries, or his divine mother, or the saints whose wonderful virtues have illumined the world. Nor has any kind of charitable work been forgotten. On all sides there is a zealous endeavor to procure Christian instruction for youth, help for the sick, moral teaching for the people and assistance for the classes least favored in the goods of this world. With what remarkable rapidity this movement would propagate itself, and what precious fruits it would bear if it were not opposed by the unjust and unfriendly efforts with which it finds itself so often in conflict. God, who gives to the church such great vitality in civilized countries where it has been established for so many centuries, consoles us besides with other hopes. These Hopes we owe to the zeal of Catholic missionaries, not permitting themselves to be discouraged by the perils which they face, by the privations which they endure, by the sacrifices of every kind which they accept, their numbers are increasing and they are gaining whole countries to the gospel and to civilization. Nothing can diminish their courage, although after the manner of their divine master they receive only accusations and calumnies as the reward of their untiring labors. Thus our sorrows are tempered by the sweetest consolations, and in the midst of the struggles and the difficulties which are our portion we have wherewith to refresh our souls and to inspire us with hope. This ought to suggest useful and wise reflections to those who view the world with intelligence, and who do not permit passions to blind them, for it proves that God has not made man independent in what regards the last end of life. And just as he has spoken to him in the past so he speaks again in our day by his church which is visibly sustained by the divine assistance, and which shows clearly where salvation and truth can be found. Come what may, this eternal assistance will inspire our hearts with an incredible hope and persuade us that at the hour marked by providence, and in a future which is not remote, truth will scatter the mists in which men endeavor to shroud it, and will shine forth more brilliantly than ever. The Spirit of the gospel will spread life anew in the heart of our corrupted society and in its perishing members. In what concerns us, venerable brethren, in order to hasten the day of divine mercy we shall not fail in our duty to do everything to defend and develop the kingdom of God upon earth. As for you, your pastoral solicitude is too well known to us to exhort you to do the same. May the ardent flame which burns in your hearts be transmitted more and more to the hearts of all your priests. They are in immediate contact with the people. If full of the Spirit of Jesus Christ and keeping themselves above political passion, they unite their action with yours they will succeed with the blessing of God in accomplishing marvels. By their word they will enlighten the multitude. By their sweetness of manners they will gain all hearts. And in succoring with charity their suffering brethren, 
they will help them little by little to better the condition in which they are placed. The clergy will be firmly sustained by the active and intelligent cooperation of all men. Of goodwill. Thus the children who have tasted the sweetness of the church will thank her for it in a worthy way, viz., by gathering around her to defend her honor and her glory. All can contribute to this work which will be so splendidly meritorious for them, literary and learned men, by defending her in books or in the daily press, which is such a powerful instrument now made use of by her enemies, fathers of families and teachers, by giving a Christian education to children, magistrates and representatives of the people by showing themselves firm in the principles which they defend as well as by the integrity of their lives and in the profession of their faith without any vestige of human respect. Our age exacts lofty ideals, generous designs, and the exact observance of the laws. It is by a perfect submission to the directions of the Holy See that this discipline will be strengthened, for it is the best means of causing to disappear or at least of diminishing the evil which party opinions produce in fomenting divisions, and it will assist us in uniting all our efforts for attaining that higher end, namely, the triumph of Jesus Christ and his church. Such is the duty of Catholics. As for her final triumph, she depends upon him who watches with wisdom and love over his immaculate spouse, and of whom it is written, Jesus Christ, yesterday, today, and forever. Heb 13 8. It is therefore to him, that at this moment we should lift our hearts in humble and ardent prayer, to him who loving with an infinite love our erring humanity has wished to make himself an expiatory victim by the sublimity of his martyrdom, to him who seated although unseen in the mystical bark of his church can alone still the tempest and command the waves to be calm and the furious winds to cease. Without doubt, venerable brethren, you with us will ask this divine master for the cessation of the evils which are overwhelming society, for the repeal of all hostile law, for the illumination of those who more perhaps through ignorance than through malice, hate and persecute the religion of Jesus Christ, and also for the drawing together of all men of goodwill in close and holy union. May the triumph of truth and of justice be thus hastened in the world, and for the great. Family of men may better days dawn, days of tranquility and of peace. Meanwhile, as a pledge of the most precious and divine favor, may the benediction which we give you with all our heart descend upon you and all the faithful committed to your care. Given at Rome, at St. Peter's, March 19, 1902, in the twenty-fifth year of our pontificate. Leo XIII.